Billionaire on Crutches A Love on Palmer Island Romance Written by Suzanne Ash Please like and subscribe to my channel. Chapter 1 I said, Get out. Sam turned to look at Jason as they walked up to her brother Brad's beach house. What do you think that's about? Jason asked. Sam shrugged. No idea, but maybe it wasn't such a bad call to stop by and check on Rob. She strode up to the half-open door and knocked. Hello? Anybody home? Yeah, come on in. Rob Marshall sat on the couch in the living room, his leg propped up on an ottoman. A cast went from his foot all the way up as past his knee, the top of it covered by his board shorts. Everything okay? Sam asked, walking up to Rob to give him an awkward sideways hug. It will be. His voice went up a notch in volume. As soon as the sad excuse for a nurse leaves. No need to raise your voice. I am leaving right now, Mr. Marshall. It was no pleasure working for you. A middle-aged woman in a nurse's uniform walked down the hallway, a small suitcase in one hand, a purse slung over the other arm. Don't bother calling the agency for a replacement. I will make sure they don't send anyone else over here. She looked at Sam and Jason. Good luck. And she was gone. I take it that was the person taking care of you? Jason asked. Rob nodded. What are you guys doing back here? Don't you have a resort to run or something? We do. Brad called from Arizona. He wanted me to check on you. He said something about being worried about you. Rob shook his head. The dude is such a worrywart. I'm fine. Or at least I would be if I could get some competent help around here. So, Betty didn't work out? Sam asked. Betty was the nurse who had traveled down here with Rob when Brad offered him the beach house to recover from his leg injury. Sam and Jason had met them at the house to help Rob get settled in. She had to head back after we got here. The next one didn't. Neither did Elizabeth or Mrs. Miller. She was the worst of the bunch. No sense of humor. You went through four nurses? In a week and a half? Sam couldn't believe it. Five. I forgot about what's her name. She didn't last a full day. Said my disposition was unbearable. What did she expect? I'm stuck in this shack and I'm in a lot of pain. Rob stared at her defiantly. Sam tried to let the shack comment go. This house had been in her family for three generations. Her grandparents had built it and Sam and her brothers had spent many happy summers here on Palmer Island. And who knew South Carolina would be so darn hot and humid in October? Jason looked at Rob and shrugged. It's the South. At least you've got the ocean breeze. Good thinking. This place could use some airing out. Sam opened windows and doors leading to the sunroom and back deck. Within moments, the salty breeze off the ocean flowed through the house, bringing with it the sound of crashing waves and seagulls fighting over food the few remaining tourists left on the beach. That's better. We need to come up with a plan. I'll hire someone to take me back out to Arizona, Rob said, reaching for his phone. Hold up for a minute. You came out here to get away from Phoenix. The change of scenery was supposed to help you get out of your funk and speed up the healing process. Last I heard it was the doctor's orders. Sam plopped down on the love seat across from the couch. Your brother talks too much. Rob reached over and dug his finger in the top of his cast. I can't believe I'm stuck in this thing for another six weeks. It itches like crazy. He slammed his fist into the cushion of the couch. I'm not going to make it cooped up in this place. I need to get out and do something. Like get in another car and crash it? Sam raised her eyebrows. Brad had filled her in on all the gruesome details of the race car Rob crashed that resulted in a complicated fracture in his leg that would take months to heal. At least the cuts and bruises had started to fade. Something like that, he mumbled. Jason looked at him interested. 
What else do you do? Besides racing electric supercars? Oh, the usual. Base jumping, rock climbing, day trading. Rob shrugged. Day trading? Jason sat down next to Sam, looking incredulous. Yeah, you can guess, but you never quite know what's going to happen. It's why I like a good day at the track too. Nothing like that rush, when your horse is working, it's way up into the lead. Jason nodded. I get it. It's the adrenaline rush. We should go climbing when you're better. Or white water rafting up in the mountains. There's a couple of good routes up around Nantahala. There's nothing like it. I can't wait to get back out there. Not until your leg is fully healed, Sam said sternly. Speaking of which, we need to figure out what to do until we can find you a new nurse. I guess calling the agency you used before is out of the question, Jason added. Hmm, Rob slumped back into the couch. I hate this. Being dependent on someone to get my food, take a shower, get out of bed in the morning. It's degrading. It's temporary. Don't be such a baby. You got in that car and crashed it. Now, you've got to deal with the consequences. Sam was starting to lose patience with her big brother's friend. You know. Jason walked over to the window, looking thoughtful. I wonder. Wonder what? Stop being cryptic. Sam stepped up next to her husband, wrapping her arm around his waist. Therese is a nurse, and I'm pretty sure she has rehab experience. And she's got to be tired of working at that bar by now. Therese? But she's so nice. Sam shook her head. She is, but she's also tough, and she won't let him push her around. I'm right here. Rob sounded irritated. Sam decided to ignore him for now. Maybe you're right. And the money's got to be better. She turned around and gave Rob a meaningful glance. I'll make it worth her, well as long as she's not a major pain in the... Rob. I'll give her a call, Jason said quickly. He pulled his phone out of his back pocket, walking into the kitchen. I'll stick around tonight. I have to head out early in the morning though. Sam thought for a moment. We need someone to help you around the house during the day. At least until Therese can start. I'll manage. Rob reached for the TV remote. It fell on the floor, out of his reach. Sam didn't say anything. Rob was still trying to get to it without moving his leg by the time Jason walked back in. She'll meet with us tomorrow for lunch. She's working at the bar tonight. Jason reached down and picked up the remote. Here you go, buddy. We need someone to watch him during the day. Sam looked thoughtfully out the window to the house next door. That's it. What is? Rob asked absent-mindedly. He flipped through TV channels at record speed. Sam suppressed the urge to slap the remote out of his hand. Miss Doris. Who's Miss Doris? Are you sure about this? Jason asked. He looked doubtful. It would only be for a few hours while I'm at work. I think Rob can behave that long. If not, she raised two sons. I think she can handle it. Sam tried to look confident. They had also thought the nurse that traveled with him would work out. Betty had been a sassy little thing who wouldn't take any grief from Rob. Too bad she hadn't been able to stick around. I'll go talk to her and see if she's available today. Therese, honey. Wake up. You're having another nightmare. Therese Bowman slowly drifted out of sleep and into consciousness. What was her mother doing here? It took a moment to realize that she was no longer in Africa. The bed she was lying in wasn't the small cot in the hut in Gambia where she'd spent the past three years. She was in her childhood home, in the same white four-poster bed she'd slept all her teenage years in. I'm okay, Mom. I'm awake. Therese pulled an arm out from under the warm covers and grabbed her mother's hand. Did I scream again? Her mother nodded, concern written plainly on her face. 
I'm going to make you some fresh coffee. Do you want toast or eggs with that? I'm not hungry. Coffee sounds great though. What time is it? Almost 10. Therese did the math. She'd come home from work around 4 this morning and had fallen asleep around 5. That gave her a solid 5 hours. Not bad. Her mother got up, and by the time Therese crawled out of bed, she heard her bustling around in the kitchen. Therese ran a brush through her unruly hair and washed her face. The warm water felt good. It washed the last horrible images of the nightmare down the drain. The facial cleanser took the last of her smudged makeup off, leaving her face a little brighter. She looked less sleep-deprived. Therese made a mental note to do a better job removing it before bed. She didn't like to wear a lot of makeup, but the owner of the sinking goat insisted on it. After working until close the past two weeks, she should be used to it. Therese shook her head. Her blonde curls bounced all over the place. She grabbed a hair elastic off the counter, pulling it back, before heading to the kitchen. That smells great, she said while taking a seat at the breakfast bar. I'm making you cinnamon toast. You look like you could use it. It was always your favorite when you were little. Cinnamon toast could make anything better. Her mother smiled up at her. Therese grinned back. I still like it. Great. Eat up. Pam put the toast in front of her. I'll grab a cup of coffee, then you can tell me about those nightmares. They are just bad dreams, Mom. Nonsense. You didn't have them before. Not like this. You won't go see anyone about them, and I did some research. Talking about it is supposed to help you process. Therese groaned and took a bite of her toast. It was crispy and sweet, the cinnamon sugar melting in her mouth. She polished it off in record time. Now. Pam took the seat next to her. What had you screaming earlier? It was nothing. Really. It didn't sound like nothing. Tell me, honey. Maybe it will help. Her mother smiled at her encouragingly. It can't hurt. Therese took another sip of coffee. Maybe her mother was right. She squared her shoulders and thought about how much she should share. It was about some of the things you experienced in Africa, wasn't it? Her mother's tone was gentle and encouraging. Yes. I was dreaming about the kids. She paused, images from the nightmare and the horrible reality those dreams were based on flashed back into her mind. You know how we were spending most of our time building wells? To get clean water to those villages? Her mother nodded. Therese had written and sent back pictures whenever she'd had a chance during her three years with the Peace Corps. Before we could get the wells up and running, the villagers would continue to draw their water from the river. And that was quite a hike each day, right? Yes, a two-mile round trip. Her mother had been paying attention. I can't imagine. Every cup of water you need for cooking or washing. Pam shook her head. How often would they go down there? We walked to get water every morning, bringing it back in 10-gallon buckets. Did something happen on those walks? I saw a report while you were gone about people being attacked, her mother stopped and looked down into her coffee cup. And assaulted. Is that what the nightmares are about? Therese swallowed hard. No, mom. Nothing like that. She regretted not sharing the source of her nightmares sooner. Never in a million years had she thought her mother would come up with something worse than the reality of what woke her in terror night after night. She took a steadying breath and kept going. The villagers tried hard to be careful and only get water that flowed freely. They usually were pretty good at getting water that was safe and we encouraged them to boil it before consumption. But every once in a while, Salmonella or E. coli bacteria ended up in the water supply, and the whole village would get sick. I'm talking severe diarrhea. The young and the old always got it the worst. They would end up severely dehydrated. And mom, these kids are so skinny to begin with. They can't afford to lose pound after pound of body weight. 
They would waste away in my arms, and there was nothing I could do but watch and try to comfort them. Tears rolled down Teresa's face at the memory. Oh, honey. I had no idea. Her mother hopped off the barstool and grabbed her in a tight hug. They stayed there for a long time while Therese sobbed. She cried for every child they'd lost and for the ones that only barely made it. She cried for all the kids in other villages who still suffered because they didn't have a freshwater well. It's what had haunted her ever since she came back. What was she doing here, serving drinks at a bar, drinking hot coffee, and eating cinnamon toast when there was so much suffering in the world? Chapter 2 Thank you for meeting us, Jason said when Therese walked into Mary's diner on Palmer Island an hour later. Her eyes were still red from all the crying, but she felt better than she had in a long time. Maybe her mother was on to something. Therese hoped Pam didn't expect her to open up like this on a regular basis. What she really needed was some time alone. Time to process what had happened in Gambia and time to pay off her credit cards and student loans. The small stipend she'd gotten from the Peace Corp hadn't been enough to make a serious dent, and she needed to pay it off before she'd have any hope of opening a foundation to help the kids in Gambia on a more permanent basis. Happy to. Wanna tell me a little more about this difficult patient of yours? She took a seat opposite Sam and Jason in the large booth. They were a bit early for lunch, and the place wasn't completely crowded yet. Hi there, I'm Cindy. Are you guys ready to order? A friendly waitress stepped up to their table and took their order. Can I still order breakfast? Therese asked. She looked over at Jason and Sam. I'm working late at the bar and have been sleeping in. Of course. We serve breakfast all day. What are you in the mood for? How about some bacon, eggs, and toast? Jason and Sam each picked a soup and sandwich combo from the lunch menu, and Cindy walked off to put in their order. She returned a moment later with iced tea and coffee. The guy that needs your help is a good friend of my brother Brad, Sam said. He's a bit of a daredevil and crashed a race car. He broke his leg and it will be in a cast for at least the next six to eight weeks. He's staying at the family beach house here on the island. Brad and his doctors thought the change of scenery would do him good, Jason added. You mentioned he's gone through a few different in-home nurses, Therese said. Both Sam and Jason nodded. I guess that means he's not too happy being cooped up in the house? That's an understatement, Jason said, smiling wryly. Who's with him now? Therese asked. Miss Doris, our neighbor. She's offered to keep an eye on him so we could go back to work and meet you for lunch. She's one of the kindest people I know. I hope Rob behaves himself. Therese detected concern in Sam's voice. I have to be honest with you. Rob is a handful. He's headstrong and impatient on the best of days, but with this, he's downright ornery and unpleasant. Are you sure you're up for that? Therese thought for a moment. It sounded like a challenge, but how hard could it be to help out a grown man with a broken leg? We would like you to move into the beach house, Jason said. There's plenty of room and you'd be there if he needed help at night. So, we're talking a 24-hour-a-day kind of job, Sam added. Therese nodded. She could deal with that. Much of her Peace Corps work had been the same way. That shouldn't be a problem. Getting out of her parents' house for a while didn't sound like a bad idea. She'd contemplated getting a place of her own, but discarded it because it would mean taking that much longer to pay down her debt. As much as she appreciated her parents opening their home to her again, it also made her feel trapped. Maybe this was the solution she'd been looking for. If the pay was right. You'd be well compensated, of course. Jason explained that there'd be free room and board and a daily salary that was above and beyond what she made on a good weekend at the bar. That's a very generous offer, Therese said trying not to look too eager to take the job. For that kind of money, there had to be a catch. Don't worry, you'll have to earn it. Did I mention that Rob is, let's say a difficult patient? Sam looked at her hopefully. Do you think you're up for it? I am. When would you like me to start, she asked. 
today? Sam and Jason both looked like they were holding their breath. When she didn't respond right away, Sam added, why don't we drive over? The house is down the road on the beach. You can meet Rob before you make your final decision. Therese nodded and they left after their meal. The house was close and right on the ocean. It was older, but well kept and there was plenty of room for a large family. Therese liked the place from the moment she laid eyes on it. And then there was Robert Marshall. 28, bachelor, and from what she could tell, the guy had more money than he knew what to do with. No wonder the salary was so generous. He was also breathtakingly gorgeous with his wide shoulders, soft brown hair, and eyes that smoldered hot when he'd stared at her as Sam introduced them. I'm Therese, nice to meet you. She walked up to the man sitting in a recliner, a pair of crutches, leaned up against the wall, next to him. A half-eaten sandwich and chip sat on the small side table next to him, along with a glass of soda. His handshake for firm, his large hand warm as it engulfed hers. He looked her up and down, sending shivers down her spine. Sam. Jason. You're back. The older woman looked relieved to see them as she carried a stack of napkins and a few rolls of toilet paper. Let me help you with that, Miss Doris. Jason took the paper goods from her. Where do you want these? You can take those rolls to the hall bathroom. Miss Doris took the pack of plain white paper napkins from him and started to rip it open. I ran back to the house. This poor man is out of all of the essentials. Had to go make his lunch at my place too. Who in the world was caring for him? Some incompetent hacks, Rob called from the living room, who thought it was beneath them to run to the store. What did they expect me to do? Hire a housekeeper? He looked at Therese, the challenge clearly written on his face. I don't mind grocery shopping or cooking as long as we can order takeout some nights, she said. I draw the line at cleaning toilets though. Been there, done that. Not going back. She'd worked one summer during college as a hotel made up in Myrtle Beach, and it hadn't been the most pleasant experience. Fair enough, Rob grumbled. I'm sure I can hire some sort of maid service to come in once or twice a week. If you don't need me, I'm going to head back to the house, Miss Dora said. I have a couple of pies to bake for the harvest festival at church. Oh, save me one of the peanut butter ones, Sam said. If you're making those again this year. Of course, dear. We would have a riot on our hands if I didn't. I'll put one aside. She turned to look at Rob. I'll bring you an apple pie later this afternoon. If you promise to be good for this young woman here. She looked at Therese expectantly. Therese. Therese Bowman, she introduced herself. I'm Miss Doris. I live right next door. If there's anything you need, or you just want to break for a bit, don't be shy. My door is always open. She gave Therese a warm hug. Thank you, Rob said gruffly. I appreciate the help. And the toilet paper. Miss Doris nodded. You're welcome. Call me if there's anything else you need. And don't forget what we talked about. With that, she left. What was that about? Sam asked. Nothing. Rob waved her off and turned back to look at Therese. So, you want the job? I'm going to be stuck here for at least another six to eight weeks. If you stick around until this cast comes off, I'll throw in a $200,000 bonus. What? Therese had to sit down and then made him repeat the offer. Are you serious? That was enough money to pay off the remainder of her debt and pay her living expenses for a couple of years in Africa. It would cut years off her plan to bring clean water to more Gambian communities. Are you sure you want to do this? Sam asked when Therese walked them to the door. I'll be fine. I can handle myself. Therese smiled at her new friend encouragingly. She liked Jason's wife. And you're not getting in trouble with the bar owner for quitting on such short notice? Jason asked. Therese shrugged. What's he gonna do? 
it's not like I was building a career over there. If I get tired of Rob, I can always find a job at a different bar. Hey. I'm not that big of a pain, Rob called from his chair. We'll see about that, she said over her shoulder. You two get out of here. I promise to call if there are any issues. She shooed them out of the house before returning to the living room and taking a seat across from her new employer. If you're hungry, there's another sandwich in the fridge. I think Miss Doris mentioned a pot of soup too. Rob pointed toward the kitchen. I'm good. I ate before I got here. Therese watched Rob take a bite of his sandwich. Tell me about your accident. There isn't much to tell. I was going too fast, lost control, and crashed. Doc says the leg is broken in two different places. I have some plates and stuff in there and can't put any pressure on it for about four weeks. After that, I get to hobble around for another month or so in a boot. He shoved the rest of his sandwich in his mouth. How's the pain? What do they have you on? It took him a moment to respond. I've been rotating through Tylenol and Ibuprofen. And that's not really doing much for you, is it? Any reason why you're not on any stronger pain meds? Therese had noticed the almost imperceptible lines around Rob's mouth that told her he was in a fair amount of pain. The fact that he was only taking over-the-counter meds told her there was something he was holding back. I can't help you if you keep stuff from me. I promise what you tell me stays between us. He nodded. I'm a recovering addict. I can't take anything with opioids in it. She'd been right. That must have made for a rough recovery. Is the pain getting any better? Some. It's not as sharp as it was the first few days, but it's enough to keep me up at night. That explained the dark circles under his eyes and his temper. How long have you been clean, she asked. Ten years. That's impressive. Can I ask? Percocet. I popped them like candy in high school. A friend's mother had some left over after surgery. We tried them one night for laughs and giggles. I couldn't stop buying them after that. Went on for over a year. And you didn't want to risk it after the accident? No. I'm starting to second-guess that decision. It may be worth a withdrawal if it would buy me a good night's sleep. He smiled wryly. Therese felt for him. There had been long stretches with little to no sleep during her time in Gambia, and she knew what it did to you. At least she hadn't been in constant pain. You know there are a lot of other options out there aside from Tylenol. Other over-the-counter stuff, he asked, a glimmer of hope lighting up his eyes. Not just painkillers. Alternative treatment options, supplements, teas, that type of thing. Don't tell me you're one of those alternative, holistic, don't believe in antibiotics people. Rob looked exasperated. Not at all. I believe in modern medicine. That's why I became a nurse. All I'm saying is that there are alternatives out there and if Vicodin or Percocet are out of the picture. There may be some other therapies that can bring you relief and sleep. Therese thought she saw a little curiosity in Rob's face and decided to push her luck. Do you trust me? she asked. What do I have to lose? Would you be okay by yourself for about an hour? I have some things that may help at my parents' house. And I should probably pack a bag if I'm staying here for the foreseeable future. Rob nodded. Great. I won't be long. Rob grabbed his crutches and carefully got out of the chair. It had been over an hour since Therese left. How long could it take to pack a few clothes and grab whatever voodoo medicine stuff she wanted to try on him? Careful not to put any weight on his leg, he made his way to the bathroom. How had something as simple as taking a pee turned into a major undertaking that took careful, deliberate action and pre-planning? At least he'd figured out how to take care of business without help. Giving him a few pointers to make the job easier had been the best part of having Betty as a nurse. Too bad she hadn't been able to stay here with him. But if she had, he wouldn't have met Therese. Instead of going back to the living room, 
he went to the small sitting room across the hall. It had a window out to the front of the house and the street. With a groan, he lowered himself onto the small wicker chair that gave him the best view of the driveway. That's when he realized he'd left his phone on the bathroom counter. He briefly contemplated going back, but it was too much work. He didn't want to risk a fall. Having Therese find him lying on the floor like some helpless beetle was the last thing he wanted. That would be more than a little embarrassing. He was as helpless as a toddler as it was. With matching tantrums, he admitted to himself wryly. With nothing to distract him, Rob stared down the road and watched the traffic go by. With each new car that passed, he hoped it was Therese. It bothered him that he didn't know much about her. He didn't even know what car she drove. All he knew was that she was a friend of Brad's little sister, a kind person, and as far as first impressions went, a competent nurse. None of the others had questioned his use of pain medication or cared about his comfort the way she had. And she was pretty. If he had to be stuck in this place for the next few weeks, he'd at least have something pretty to look at. Rob's mood lifted at the thought, and he couldn't suppress a smile when he saw an older model Prius pull into the driveway. It was a crappy car, but who was he to judge? And she got bonus points for driving a hybrid in his book. I'm back, Therese said when she walked through the door carrying three bags. Rob hated the fact that he couldn't jump up and help her with them. Rob? In here, he called and grabbed his crutches. She dropped her bags in the living room and stood in the door of the small sitting room by the time he'd managed to stand up. Needed a change of scenery, he said. She nodded and stepped aside as he made his way back to the living room. I'll put this stuff away and get settled in. Is there anything you need? How's the pain? It's fine. Liar. I'll bring you some water and a couple of ibuprofen. She dug around in one of her bags. I also want you to start taking this omega-3 blend. It helps with inflammation and may speed up your recovery time. She shook a huge capsule into her hand and put it on the small side table next to the recliner before bringing him a glass of water and pain pills from the kitchen. He took them without complaint and sent her off to unpack. Hey, would you mind grabbing my phone from the bathroom? He called after her. Sure. She was back with it in a flash. So, no issues using the facilities by yourself? That's good. She looked relieved, and he didn't blame her. He spent a surprisingly pleasant hour playing around on his phone and listening to her bustle around in the back half of the house. She took her time getting settled in, and he didn't mind. It was nice to have the company. Between that and the temporary relief from the double dose of OTC pain meds, he felt happier than he had in a while. Ready for dinner? Therese asked when she finally re-emerged. Rob nodded. His stomach had been growling for the past 15 minutes. I'll heat up the soup Miss Doris made. How about some grilled cheese sandwiches to go with it? I think I saw some bread and cheese in the kitchen. That'd be great. While she busied herself in the kitchen, Rob scrolled through Netflix, looking for a movie they could watch together during dinner. What type of movies do you like? he asked. Pretty much anything but horror. Sci-fi is my favorite. Rob was glad she wasn't one of those girls who only watched romantic comedies. He was more of an action movie kind of guy, but he could work with sci-fi. By the time she returned with their dinner on two TV trays, he'd queued up the movie. They spent a pleasant two hours lost in a story of space exploration. It was the most fun he'd had in weeks. There's something I'd like to try, Therese said when the end credits rolled. Rob looked at her and raised an eyebrow, giving her smirk. What did you have in mind? I'm thinking some massage therapy could give you some temporary relief and help you sleep better. His second eyebrow went up. Are you up for trying it? He cleared his throat. Sure. Therese walked onto the screened-in porch and returned with a low stool. She put it in the middle of the living room before turning the heat up. Come sit on this, she said before leaving the room. She returned a few minutes later with several large candles. She lit them and connected her phone to a small Bluetooth speaker. 
This isn't where I thought this was going, Rob said after making his way to the seat. He needed her help lowering himself down without the aid of armrests. When had he become a guy that had to rely on armrests to get in or out of a chair? Therese didn't respond to his comment. After helping him remove his shirt, she poured a small amount of fragrant massage oil into her palms. The scent blended well with the smell from the candles. Combined with the soothing music from her phone, it turned the room into an oasis of calm. The oil was fairly warm by the time she started to work on his shoulders and back. It didn't take long for him to turn into putty in her hands. You are good. It wasn't an exaggeration. She was right up there with the top massage therapists he'd come across over the years. I've had practice. I specialized in alternative pain treatments my last year of nursing school. Lucky me, he murmured before his eyes drifted closed and he focused on relaxing every muscle in his body. By the time she was done, he was almost pain-free and almost asleep. Let's get you ready for bed, Therese said as she wiped the last of the oil on a towel. She helped him up and a little while later she had him changed into his PJs and resting comfortably in bed. Thank you. You're welcome. I have a couple of other ideas to help you sleep better. Hang on. He was curious to see what else she had up her sleeve. Not that he thought he needed it. He had to fight to keep his eyes open until she returned with a stack of strange-looking pillows. She must have kept them in her car, he realized. That would explain the sound of the front door opening and closing. What are these, he asked. Stabilizing pillows. They'll help keep you put while you sleep. My guess is that you wake up when you roll over and put strain on your leg or your back. She arranged the pillows around him, creating a sort of nest, paying special attention to cradle his leg securely. Almost done, she said before leaving the room again. Rob heard the microwave hum in the kitchen. He hoped she wasn't heating milk. He had a vague memory of a nanny insisting he drink hot milk before bed. Just the thought of it made his stomach turn. Therese came in with a cup of steaming liquid. Thankfully, it was tea. Drink this, she said before helping him sit up enough to sip the herbal infusion. It will help you sleep. It's all natural, herbal stuff. The tea was bitter, but he forced himself to take sip after sip. When he was finished, she took the tea back to the kitchen and returned with several heating packs and an extra blanket. The heat will keep your muscles from tightening back up. It won't last all night, but it should help for a few hours. She tucked them around him. He guessed this was why the microwave had been running. Is there lavender in these? he asked, recognizing the scent coming off the pillows. Therese nodded. It's not bothering you, is it? No, it's nice. Very soothing. That's the idea. Is there anything else you need? she asked. He shook his head. Good night, Therese. Good night. Rob drifted off to sleep by the time the door closed. Chapter 3 Therese made herself a cup of herbal tea and carried her mug out on the back deck. She kept the door to the house propped open, in case Rob needed her. She doubted he would. When she'd left, he looked nearly asleep. It was pretty on Palmer Island. Much calmer and quieter than up in the middle of Myrtle Beach, where she'd grown up. Not that her parents' house was anywhere near the ocean. But the few times she'd been down to the beach at night, it had been crowded with tourists taking evening walks or sitting on the balconies of their hotel rooms. Here, it was quiet and surprisingly dark. From the look of it, most of the houses on the beach stood empty this time of year. Only a small light from the house next door, and the glow from the light in the living room lit up the beach in front of her. Not for the first time today. Therese wondered if she'd made the right decision taking this job. Working as a waitress in a dive bar hadn't been her favorite, but it was steady, reliable work. While this new position paid better, it was temporary. In a few weeks, Rob would be out of his cast and on his way. On top of that, she was at the mercy of Rob's mood swings. He'd fired his fair share of nurses already and didn't strike her as the most patient guy. But then again, maybe she could help him. 
He looked more relaxed tonight than he'd been when she first met him. Only time would tell. Therese took a relaxing breath and let her worries go. She imagined them being swept away by the waves rolling in and out in front of her. She'd made her decision, and now she'd have to live with it. No reason to worry about something that may or may not happen down the road. She took another sip of her tea and looked out across the ocean. The rising moon reflected in the gentle waves, creating sparks and flashes of silvery light. It was almost magical. Therese sat there, breathing, letting her mind and body calm. She hoped the nightmares wouldn't return. Her bedroom wasn't far from Rob's, in case he needed her during the night. She was sure screams like those she'd had early this morning would carry down to his room. Maybe the tea and the new environment would help. Like him, she could use a good night's sleep. Therese got up and walked inside, locking the porch door behind her. She dropped her cup in the kitchen sink and got ready for bed. Tomorrow would doubtlessly be another challenging day with this new patient of hers. A noise from down the hall woke her up. Therese sat up and grabbed her phone. It was three in the morning. She pulled on a sweatshirt and padded down the hall. A thin stream of light came out from under the bathroom door. Rob clanked around in there with his crutches, and she decided to stand back to give the man some privacy. It couldn't be easy to depend on help day and night. If he could get along by himself, good for him. She returned to her empty room, leaving the door open just a crack. She didn't have to wait long. Rob was on his way back to the bedroom. For a moment, she hesitated and considered walking down to help him get his stability pillows adjusted. When he was obviously trying to make his way back quietly, she decided against it. Instead, she climbed back into her warm bed and was sound asleep in minutes. It was light outside and the birds were chirping when Therese woke back up. The door to Rob's bedroom was closed, soft snoring noises came from behind it when she passed by on her way to the kitchen. She was in the sunroom enjoying a large cup of coffee when Rob joined her, his hair tousled from sleep. Therese jumped up and pulled one of the wicker chairs out for him as he made his way out to her. Good morning. Would you like some coffee? she asked once he was in the chair. He nodded, but didn't say a word. She guessed he wasn't much of a morning person. That was okay with her. She preferred a little peace and quiet while waking up herself. She handed him a steaming cup of coffee and returned to her own seat. They sat there, sipping the dark brew and enjoying the ocean view. How did you sleep? she asked after a while. Better than I have since the accident. I don't know if it was the tea, the massage, or those pillows, but something did the trick. I'm actually feeling like myself. He looked right into her eyes. Thank you. The sincerity and raw emotion on his face took her breath away. She averted her gaze and looked down at her coffee. You're welcome. I'm glad it helped. It did. I feel like a new person, he said, sounding chipper. What's on the agenda for today? Therese breathed a little sigh of relief. That had gotten a little intense there for a moment. Groceries, she said. Probably a good idea if we don't want to starve. They hadn't been close to starving, but a quick examination of the fridge and cupboards had made it clear that Rob was out of just about everything. Therese made a lengthy list, chatting with Rob about the kinds of food he liked. It turned out the guy lived mainly on junk food and sugar, with plenty of fast food thrown into the mix. How would you feel about a slight adjustment to your diet, she asked. They were both sitting at the kitchen table. Therese tightened up her shopping list, coming up with a rough meal planned for the week. Nothing too drastic, just some healthier food to help you heal faster. As long as it's not too granola, he said. And no kale. Can't stand the stuff. Therese nodded, hiding her disappointment. Kale was one of her favorite fall and winter vegetables. Full of nutrients, versatile, and pretty darn delicious, if you asked her. She'd have to work him up to that particular cruciferous vegetable. Got it. No kale. She grabbed her purse and keys off the counter. I'll head out now, she said. Shouldn't take long. 
I'll be back in an hour, hour and a half, tops. Call me if anything comes up. The grocery store was pretty empty mid-morning. Therese finished her shopping in record time and had finished loading everything into the trunk of her Prius when her phone beeped. She slid into the front seat and pulled it out of her purse, hoping Rob was okay. Surely, he would have called, not messaged, if there was some sort of emergency. Instead of the expected text message from Rob asking her to hurry back, the beep alerted her of a new email she had received in her Gmail account. The only emails that came to her phone were things related to her work in Gambia. Therese opened it and quickly glanced through the lengthy message with attached images. Tears rolled down her face when she saw the pictures of the young children she'd cared for. One of the images showed Thomas, the boy who would always hold a special place in her heart. For months ago, when much of the village had come down with a bacterial infection that caused severe diarrhea, the little boy had come close to dying in her arms. She'd spent an agonizing 48 hours pouring tiny amounts of clean water and Pedialyte into him. She'd barely slept, only napped for a few minutes here and there while cradling him in her lap. Thankfully Thomas had pulled through, and from the looks of it, he continued to thrive. He looked happy in the picture, smiling his big goofy grin and playing with a few of the other kids. Seeing everyone right there in the place where she'd spent her last year in the core made her realize how much she missed them. The tears continued to stream down her face, and for the first time since she'd returned, she allowed herself to wallow and grieve. When she'd cried herself out, she blew her nose into a tissue, wiped the last of the tears off her face, and cranked up the car. You have got to be kidding me. Therese could hear Rob's voice booming through the house before she opened the front door. She started to make her way to the kitchen with the first of the grocery bags. She saw him staring at his phone, looking angry. Everything okay? No, yes. He glanced up at her. A friend of mine wiped out my entire army. It'll be fine. He grabbed his wallet off the coffee table and pulled out a credit card. Nothing a few hundred denarii won't fix. Therese shook her head. From the look of it, he was busy playing some sort of mobile strategy game. She'd heard patrons at the bar talk about quite a few of these. From what she could make out, people spent perfectly good time building imaginary villages or castles or whatever and troops to defend them. Then they took turns attacking each other, hoping to win the battle and take home the spoils. She put the first of the bags on the kitchen counter, before heading back outside for the rest. I wish I could help you with those, Rob said when she pushed the front door, closed behind her. He was tapping on his phone again, presumably rebuilding his army. No worries. I'm going to put this away and get some veggies marinating for lunch. Therese was busy cutting up cucumber, tomatoes, bell peppers, and cauliflower when Rob came into the kitchen. She pulled one of the kitchen chairs out for him. Did you say marinating vegetables? He looked suspiciously at the bowl filled with the cut-up veggies. Surely, you mean chicken or shrimp? Nope. We talked about this earlier. We're changing your diet. More veggies and whole grains, less meat and sugar. Rob didn't look happy staring at his future lunch. At least there's no kale in it, he said. Not sure that'll fill me up though. Don't worry. I'm cooking up a batch of quinoa to go with it. A batch of what? Quinoa. It's an ancient South American grain. Very good for you and high in protein. You'll love it. Rob didn't look convinced. If you say so. He pulled the cutting board toward himself. Hand me the knife. I'll finish chopping those and you can start on the quinoa. I'm getting hungry. Rob hoped whatever she was fixing for lunch would be edible. Are you sure I can't just have a turkey bacon club instead? It's got vegetables in it. Along with plenty of nitrates in the bacon and more saturated fat than your body needs. The latest research suggests that the kinds of fats you ingest can have an impact on your body's natural ability to heal itself. What you need is a mostly plant-based diet high in omegas. I can show you the studies, Therese said. She busily stirred the ancient grain mixture that didn't look or smell very appealing if you asked him. 
I'll take your word for it, he said, trying not to let lunch, or his recent losses in Warfare of the Ancients, sour his mood. Lighten up. It'll be delicious. And I'm making grilled salmon for dinner. She turned from the stove and smiled at him. That bright smile of hers did something to him. He couldn't help but grin back. Hiring her to stay and care for him had been one of his better ideas. It was almost worth going through the less than stellar caregivers, before her. Tell me about this game you've been playing. It sounds intense. Therese returned to stirring the ancient goop. Rob explained the basics of his favorite strategy game to her. And you play this with your friends, she asked, looking genuinely interested. Sometimes. I know a lot of the guys in and around my continent. Allegiances shift. Sometimes we work together, but most of the time, we try to take each other's lands. We get a little competitive. I'm glad you have something that keeps your mind off the pain and the boredom, Therese said. She was right. He hadn't thought about his leg or how trapped he felt even here in the beach house, when he was busy fighting the latest battle or figuring out the most efficient way to rebuild his army. It made him feel a little better about playing the game. Is there a monthly fee or something? Therese asked, looking curious. Sorry, none of my business. I noticed you grabbing your credit card. Her cheeks turned the prettiest shade of pink, and Rob had to try hard to suppress a grin. No fee. The game itself is free. You pay for add-ons. Like today. I could have spent the next couple of days building troops from scratch. Or speed it up by using Denari. Denari? Therese looked confused. It's the in-game currency, how the game developer makes money. You can move along faster and get access to more powerful weapons and defenses when you use them. And you pay real money for these denarii? He nodded. She was catching on. You haven't played any app-based games? She shook her head. That was hard to believe. Everyone he knew gamed on their phone. Most of the women he knew were into little farming games or busy restoring old houses or something along those lines. App-based games were big business. His friend Chris had made a small fortune with them. Come to think of it, he hadn't seen her use her phone much at all. She wasn't glued to it like most people these days. Can I ask you something? Therese turned off the stove and moved the pot to the side before joining him at the table. It's a weird question. Sure. Ask away. How much are you spending on that game? There was a challenge in her eyes. I'm not sure. I guess it depends on how much denarii I need to spend to keep up with the guys. He'd never given it a thought. It was just something you did with the push of a couple of buttons. The only reason he'd needed his credit card today was because it was a new card that he needed to update on his account. How much did you spend today then? About $500. What? The spoon she was using to stir the vegetables in the marinade hit the floor. I didn't spend it all. It's the best deal on denarii. You get more when you buy them in bigger bundles. He didn't understand why she looked upset. You spent $500 on a game? Rob shrugged. Yeah, but that should last me about a week. Unless one of the guys really gets into it. Then we can burn through those packs in a day. Therese looked shocked, and she'd gone quiet. Really, it's no big deal. You know I have plenty of money. It's just a little harmless fun with the guys. She still didn't move. He was pretty sure she didn't even blink. And you said it yourself, it takes my mind off the pain. It's a good thing, really. That's $26,000 a year, she said quietly. He didn't get it. Do you have any idea what I could do with that kind of money in Gambia? How many people could have access to fresh drinking water? She looked sad and stunned. Then her expression changed. Do you know how many lives could be saved with that kind of money? And you, you wasted on a game. Every. Single. Week. Hey, it's my money, 
and I have plenty of it. I don't get what the big deal is. It's just a couple of hundred bucks here and there. Heck, he spent more than that on gas most days. Especially when he was racing. And most of his cars were electric. What you're saying is that, because you have more than the average person, you get to waste that money on whatever you want? Without any thought for others? Exactly. Why should I care about some people in Africa I've never met? Let them figure it out themselves. My grandfather did. He started with nothing, and now look at us. His family had built a financial empire worth billions. And as soon as he talked the board into letting him take the reins, he'd do his part to maintain and expand what his father and grandfather had built. She got up and walked out the back door. Rob picked up his crutches and made his way to the back deck. By the time he stepped out the door himself, he could see her off in the distance, briskly walking down the beach. He was sitting in one of the deck chairs when she returned almost an hour later. He grabbed his crutches and got up. I'm sorry. That sounded a lot harsher than I meant it. It's not that I don't care about the people there. And my company has a lot of different philanthropic projects. Mostly to get the tax right off, but she didn't need to know that. Thanks. Therese nodded and walked inside. He followed her as fast as his crutches would let him. By the time he reached the kitchen, she pulled two bowls out and was scooping the goop, as quinoa, into each before topping it with some of the chopped vegetables that had been marinating in olive oil, vinegar, and various herbs and spices. This actually smells good, he said. Don't sound so surprised. She smiled and it made him feel a little better. Sorry, I stormed out on you. That was very unprofessional. Don't worry about it. I was out of line. I didn't mean that stuff I said. I'm not that careless. He hoped she'd forgive him. He'd hate to lose the one bright spot on this long road to recovery over some careless words. It's pretty important to you, isn't it? The drinking water. Therese nodded. You spent some time in Africa? He searched his memory for exactly what Sam and Jason had mentioned when they'd first approached him with the idea of hiring her. Peace Corps? I spent three years in Gambia. Mostly working on projects to bring clean drinking water to some of the remote villages. Her eyes darted to her phone. Rob noticed it sitting on the kitchen counter next to her purse. Do you have pictures? he asked, hoping his hunch was right. I do. I received some earlier today from one of my colleagues. Would you like to see? Therese became animated and excited as she shared the pictures, telling him a little about the children and the projects she'd worked on over the years. He couldn't shake the feeling that she was holding something back, sugarcoating her experience over there a little. Even so, it was easy to see how passionate she was about the wells. From what she'd told him, it made a real difference to each of the communities. Any plans to go back, he asked. Nothing concrete, was all she said before getting up and busying herself with the dishes. What would you like to do this afternoon? It was an obvious attempt at changing the subject. Rob wondered what that was about, but decided to let it go for now. He'd do a little research into Gambia and the projects the Peace Corps spearheaded down there. And he'd see if there was some more information to dig up about Therese. Hadn't Brad mentioned a PI down here he'd used from time to time? Chapter 4 Could you help me with this shirt? Rob hated having to ask Therese for help with something as simple as getting dressed. I have a conference call with my board of directors, he said when she rushed to his room. He pointed at the shirt and tie hanging in his closet. It was one of several sets he'd brought with him from Phoenix on the off chance he'd have to dress in something nicer than his usual t-shirts and board shorts. What about pants? Therese asked. I'm not sure we can get a regular pair of suit pants up your cast. He waved her off. I'll be behind the desk. I'll keep the shorts on. Therese held the shirt out for him to slip into. Thanks, I have it from here, he said. She nodded and left his room. That made it a little more bearable to depend on her for everything. 
He hated that there wasn't much he could do for himself. He buttoned up his shirt and tied the tie, using the webcam on his laptop as a mirror. At least this was something he could still do on his own. Unlike taking a shower, or driving to the store, or grabbing a beer out of the bottom of the fridge. The list was endless. Rob checked the time. He had 20 minutes before the start of his call. Plenty of time to check on his troops and start work on some new defensive walls. He felt a little guilty playing after his conversation with Therese. But there was nothing like it to give him that adrenaline rush in his current situation. It wasn't like he could take one of his cars out on the track or even do something as simple as going for a run on the beach. Gaming was his favorite method of stress relief while he was cooped up in the house. He looked longingly at a couple of runners out on the beach. He really could use that run. Or any type of exercise for that matter. Doing nothing but sitting around the house was making him soft around the middle. He'd had trouble buttoning his shirt earlier. Maybe this healthier diet wasn't such a bad idea. He made a mental note to ask his doctor about what type of upper body strength training he could start doing. Feeling calmer and much better about himself and his abilities as a warrior and the owner of a billion-dollar finance empire, he straightened his tie and logged into the video conference call with his board of directors. Good morning, everyone. What's on the schedule for today's call, he said when the connection to the Manhattan conference room went live. How are you, son? It's good to see you up and about, Mr. Covington, the CEO of Marshall Mutual said. How's the leg? I'm doing well, and the leg is healing right on schedule. Should be good as new in a few more weeks. That was probably a slight exaggeration, but a guy could hope. Which brings me to my reason for today's call, unless there's more urgent business we need to address. Not at all. Everything's running smoothly here. What's on your mind? Mr. Covington asked. As you can imagine, I have a lot of extra time on my hands right now. Rob pointed toward the broken leg that was just outside of the view of his webcam. And I'd like to put this time to good use. I've been doing a little preliminary research and think there are some investment opportunities in the biotech field that are worth looking into. There's one company in particular that's doing some very interesting work developing a flu vaccine. Rob, let me stop you right there. Mr. Kevington looked up from the stack of paper in front of him that he'd started flipping through when Rob had started talking. We have plenty of investment opportunities we're looking into, and as a company, we aren't interested in biotech. Frankly, it's too risky if you ask me. You could say that about a lot of the other projects we invest in. Mr. Kevington looked surprised. You've been reading the reports? Of course. I've been studying them for years. And he had noticed that the company was taking a direction he wasn't too happy about. Coal and steel didn't strike him as investments that would carry Marshall Mutual into the next century. I think it is time I started taking a more active role in my corporation. His CEO and chair of the board of directors paled slightly. Rob? An older gentleman, three chairs down, raised his hand to get his attention. Mr. Tynesson. It's good to see you. Rob had always liked his father's legal counsel, and the man had been patient when it came to explaining his father's complicated will when he passed away a few years ago. Good to see you too. I'm glad you're looking better. It was a little touch and go there for a while. Mr. Tynesson had been the only one in his company to visit him during the week he'd been stuck in the hospital after his accident. About your position in the company. I thought I'd made it clear when we went over your father's will that he left you a silent ownership only. You can't step in to run things without full approval of the board, son. It's not that we don't value what you could contribute, Mr. Covington said. This simply isn't a good time. We're in the middle of some very delicate negotiations, and any change in the leadership team would be seen as weak. Frankly, it isn't something Marshall Mutual can afford right now. Rob's stomach tightened at this latest rejection of his request to join the company. He silently counted to ten to get his rising temper under control. It wouldn't have to be in an official capacity. 
I simply think it's time I started becoming a little more involved in the day-to-day -day operations. Learn what's going on at my company. Rob, that's not possible right now. Even if we brought you in off the books, which could cause an accounting nightmare, by the way, it would still start rumors. I'm sorry. It's simply not possible. Mr. Kevington glanced down at his large gold Rolex. We are going to have to wrap this up. We have a meeting with a potential new investor in a few minutes. Rob sat at the small wooden desk in his bedroom for a few minutes, replaying the conversation in his head. He couldn't shake the feeling that something shady was going on at Marshall Mutual. Something his board of directors was hiding from him. He could see no other reason for their continued attempts at keeping him out. Granted, he hadn't been trying very hard, at all really, until recently to become involved in his family's business. Maybe they simply needed proof he was serious. Feeling slightly better, Rob grabbed his crutches and made his way into the kitchen in search of something cold to drink. How did your call go? Therese asked. She sat at the kitchen table, sketching in a small notebook. Could have gone better, he said. What are you working on? Nothing special, just killing time, she said and closed the leather-bound book before shoving it into her large purse. There's time for coffee before your doctor's appointment this morning. Would you like some? He nodded and sat down at the table. He'd forgotten all about his appointment with Dr. Clark up in Myrtle Beach. It was his first time meeting the orthopedist who had come highly recommended by his physician back home. When do we need to leave? In about an hour. I'm going to grab a shower and change. Would you like me to help you change your shirt first? Rob shook his head. He would get out of his own dress shirt if it was the last thing he did. He may not be able to do anything about his board of directors, but it was high time he regained some of his independence and some measure of control in his life. Well, that was a colossal waste of time, Rob said, while making his way back into the house. I don't think so. Therese unlocked the front door and held it open for him. Dr. Clark seemed nice, and he was very impressed by your progress. Both breaks are healing nicely, and once the ligament is strong enough, you get to move into a boot. I'm not talking about Dr. Clark. I'm talking about the PT guy. At Rob's request, Dr. Clark had referred him to a physical therapist so he could start to get some exercise. Rob would have preferred to do it alone or with a good personal trainer, but Dr. Clark had made it clear that was a bad idea. He'd reluctantly agreed to let him start doing something to loosen his back and shoulders and gain some of his strength back, but only under the supervision of a qualified physical therapist. Rob wondered if he could switch to someone who would let him do more than some simple stretches, shoulder rolls, and a few arm strengthening exercises with five pound dumbbells. Five pounds, he mumbled under his breath. You can barely feel those things. How is that supposed to do anything? What did you say? Therese asked, waving at Miss Doris before shutting the door. Never mind. I'm going to go take a nap. He was in a bad mood and didn't want to risk letting it out on her. By the time he woke back up an hour later, Miss Doris was sitting at the kitchen table. Therese was pouring them each a cup of coffee. The smell of it must have woken him up. Rob ran his fingers through his sleep-tousled hair. Without a word, Therese set a steaming cup of coffee in front of him. I brought that apple pie, I promised you, Miss Doris said. Would you like a slice with your coffee? Before he could respond, Miss Doris cut the pie and putting a slice on a small plate in front of him. Thank you. He took a bite. This is really good, he said, surprised. Miss Doris laughed. Of course it is. I've won three Palmer Island Best Pie competitions with this recipe. Her voice lowered. The key is to soak the raisins in a little spiced rum. Miss Doris has been telling me about the harvest festival the Methodist Church is putting on this weekend. It sounds like fun. Therese sounded excited. We should go. Rob said before turning to Miss Doris, pointing to his crutches. Unless you think these are going to be a problem. The older woman with the most stunning steel-gray eyes he'd seen looked thoughtful for a moment. 
It does get a little crowded and there are going to be some excited kids running around. There aren't a lot of places to sit and rest either. It may wear you out. She glanced up at him apologetically. I'll manage, Rob said gruffly before reaching over to grab another slice of pie. Therese stopped him by putting her hand on his arm. Easy on the sugar. It encourages inflammation. Something inside Rob snapped. He was going to be stuck in this house all week and now she was trying to cut out his pie? At least this is edible, which is more than I can say about those sticks and twigs you've been feeding me, he barked. Therese shook her head and smiled. You liked the vegetable risotto I made last night just fine, and I heard you raving about the salmon to your friends on the phone. Here, have another cup of coffee. It's full of antioxidants. Miss Doris Rose. I better get back to the house. My niece, Sarah, and her little baby boy are supposed to be over in a bit, she said. When she reached the door, she turned around. I'll talk to the preacher and see if we can add a few more benches and sitting areas. That will make it easier for you to enjoy the fair. Rob nodded his thanks. See you Saturday. That's nice of her, Therese added. You look like you're in pain. Have you been taking your Tylenol? I can't remember, Rob grumbled. Maybe it was the pain that was making him impatient and upset. Now that he thought about it, his leg was bothering him again, and his back and neck felt tense, despite the light upper body workout he'd done with the PT guy. Therese handed him two white pills and a tall glass of water. Take this, she said before starting to work out the kinks in his back. We'll try another massage before bed tonight, but for now, this should help ease some of the tension. It did. He felt like butter in her hands. Rob closed his eyes and focused on relaxing his body. He enjoyed the warm touch of her hands as they worked and kneaded his shoulders. She was close enough to feel the heat radiating of her body against his back. Her scent of lavender and something else he couldn't quite put his finger on. It was earthy but fresh with just a hint of bitterness to it. He sighed contentedly. Better? Therese asked, and he nodded. He assumed she would stop, but her strong fingers kept working the muscles of his neck and shoulders. So, you're not a fan of my cooking, she asked. I didn't say that. Irritating his caretaker hadn't been his smartest move today. You're right. That risotto was delicious. But? But I'm used to different food, and I've had a crappy day. Can't a guy get a little comfort food from time to time? Like what? she asked. Like pizza and beer, or a big juicy steak with all the trimmings. You know. Real food. Therese snorted. Not sure I would call that real food. But I get your point. How about we compromise? We eat healthy 80% of the time and add in some comfort food. His eyes lit up, and he nodded a little more enthusiastically than he should. Within reason, she warned before giving one last rub of his shoulders and upper arms and stepping away. He felt the lack of her presence more profoundly than he'd expected. He liked having Therese, close. He liked having her around. Do you mind if I go for a quick walk down the beach before dinner, she asked. I need to work off some of that pie. Of course not. He wished he could join her. Since that wasn't in the cards, he could at least do some of the exercises the PT guy had shown him this morning. If he upped the weights a little and tripled the reps, it might actually do something. I have some work to catch up on anyway. Grab me when dinner is ready. By the time the back door opened and closed, Rob was dripping in sweat and feeling better. His shoulders burned and he could actually feel his core. That was the kind of workout he'd expected this morning. It was good to feel those endorphins coursing through his system. He slowly made his way to the bathroom, cursing the crutches that kept getting in the way in the small, tight space. He managed to freshen up and pull a fresh t-shirt on by himself. He was slowly getting better at this stuff, in thanks to the various tips and tricks Therese had been sharing with him. Feeling much better about himself, he sat down at his laptop to do a little research into his company. 
he didn't particularly like what he saw. New, large investors coming on board that he could find no information about online. Funds being transferred into offshore accounts. Something smelled a little fishy. Or maybe he was being paranoid. Marshall Mutual's new CFO had mentioned working on some new strategies that would help minimize their taxable income. Rob looked up when the doorbell rang. He waited to see if Therese would call him. When he didn't hear anything from the main living area, he went back into his research. He'd come across some interesting ideas for low-waste packaging and a few startups across the globe that were pretty innovative. Some fairly small, low-risk investments in a few of these companies could be just what his company needed to move into the future. He was working on a proposal for his board of directors when a soft knock sounded on his bedroom door. Come in, he said. The door opened just enough for Therese to poke her head in. Dinner is ready if you're hungry. She looked at his computer. No rush, though, if you're busy. It'll keep. Give me a minute to finish this up and we can eat. He hadn't realized how hungry he was after his workout until she'd mentioned food. Now, his stomach started to growl. He hoped the sound didn't carry across the room. Sounds good. Therese smiled at him and closed the door. Rob tried to focus on finishing his presentation, but that smile and those bouncy blonde curls kept popping in his mind. After a few more attempts to put his idea of investing into ecologically sound startups into words, he gave up, opting to jot down a few notes on what he was trying to convey instead. He'd get back to it after dinner. Or tomorrow. It wasn't like the board was eagerly awaiting his proposal. Rob thought he smelled sausage and pepperoni pizza as he slowly made his way down the hall and toward the living room and kitchen. That couldn't be right. It had to be some sort of healthy food in disguise. Did they make sausage-flavored tofu? In here, Therese called from the living room. When Rob walked in, he saw a large pizza box sitting on the coffee table along with two bottles of beer and I love Palmer Island cozies. Pizza and beer? Yep. I decided dinner tonight was one of those 20% occasions. You looked like you could use some comfort food earlier. Therese grinned. Take a seat and grab a slice. The game is about to start. His night was definitely looking up. Pizza, beer, and his favorite team, the Colorado Rockies, were playing the Carolina Panthers. He thought their best tight end came from somewhere down here. Thankfully he'd retired last year, giving his boys a fighting chance tonight. When did you do all this? Rob asked before taking a big bite of his pizza. It was greasy and gooey and hit the spot. Therese grinned. While I was out on my walk earlier. I stopped by the little convenience store near the pier and called the pizza in right before I got back. I thought you'd like the surprise. He did. What surprised him even more was how important Therese had become in the few short days she'd been taking care of him. Chapter 5 My mom is on her way over here with my niece and nephew, Therese said. She hoped Rob wouldn't mind the disruption of their peaceful morning. My sister and her husband are away for the weekend and she's babysitting. For some reason, she decided it would be nice to bring them down here. No problem. I look forward to meeting them. Rob was in a good mood today and a surprisingly good sport about this. She'd been worried he'd give her grief. Hopefully, Paul and Corinne would behave themselves. At five years old, the twins could be a handful. Which was probably why her mom had sounded slightly desperate to come for a visit on the phone. If worse came to worst, she'd take them out on the beach, Therese decided. They were sitting on the back deck, enjoying another warm October day, when Miss Doris came walking up. Hello you two. Are you ready for the harvest festival this afternoon? She climbed the steps up to the back deck and sat down in one of the remaining chairs. Can you believe how warm it is? This late in October? She wiped a bit of sweat off her forehead. And me spending all day in the kitchen baking cookies, brownies, and pies. For the bake sale. I wish you'd told me you'd be baking all day, Therese said, I could have helped. The oven in the kitchen is amazing. 
Miss Doris nodded. That's kind of you to offer. Brad put that in over the summer. Replaced most of the appliances. Except the old icebox. They just don't make them like that anymore. Therese nodded. She'd wondered what the story was with the fridge. It looks like it's from the 50s. That's probably right. It's left from Brad's grandparents. Nice folks. He inherited the house from them about 10 years ago. Didn't change a thing until he got married. I wonder what they are going to do now that he has a wife and daughter. They are going to need more room if they plan on spending more than a few weeks in the summer down here. The house is huge though, Therese said. It had four bedrooms, a large kitchen and living room, and a smaller sitting room that led out to the street and would make a good home office. All in all, it was bigger than her parents' place. I would think there's more than enough room for three people. You don't know Brad and his family, Rob said. That's right. You two know each other. I forgot about that, Therese said. Known him for the past 15 years. My dad did some business with Sam and Brad's mother, Evelyn. I'm closer to his brother Pete in age, but somehow it turned out I got along better with Brad. I ended up going to school in Arizona, and he kept me from getting into too much trouble. To be honest, he's the main reason I graduated. Therese would have loved to hear a little more about him and Brad. It sounded like they had a bit of a little brother-slash-big brother relationship. She got the feeling that it had been important to Rob. From what she'd worked out about him so far, and from the little he shared and a bit of googling, he didn't have any family left. He was an only child and both his parents had passed away. She was glad he had a bit of a substitute family and hoped she'd get a chance to meet this Brad. Brad and his family come down here quite a bit, she asked. Miss Doris nodded. Brad used to only come down a few times a year. He used to be a bit of a workaholic. Since he met Kat and Hannah, he spent a lot more time here. They are here for about a week a month. Maybe a little less since Hannah started school. Do you think they'll be here while you're staying at the house? Therese asked Rob. She hoped their stay didn't keep the Suttons from enjoying their beach house. There's plenty of room, and I can move back home for a few days if my staying is an issue. It isn't. And yes, they might come out for a long weekend. They weren't sure on the exact timing yet. I think you'll like them. I don't know Kat and Hannah very well, but the way Brad talks about his stepdaughter, she's a little firecracker. She's a joy. Such a cute little girl. You'll love Kat too. She's lovely. Stayed at my beach cottage this spring. That's how the two of them got together. Miss Doris had a glimmer in her eyes that made Therese think she'd had something to do with getting the two of them together. I can't wait to meet them, Therese said. She was about to offer Miss Doris something to drink when she heard the front door ring. Therese glanced down at her watch. That must be my mom. They are early. Therese's mom is visiting with her niece and nephew, Rob explained to Miss Doris as she walked through the living room. Aunt Therese, you didn't tell us you had a beach house. Both of the twins jumped on her and hugged her. She loved these two and couldn't keep a big grin from her face at their enthusiastic response to her temporary living quarters. It's not my house. I'm staying here for a few weeks to take care of a patient. His name is Rob and he has a broken leg. It's in a cast. She ushered her niece and nephew into the living room and made them sit down on the couch. Now this is important, guys. I'll take you out to meet him in a second. He's a very nice guy, but his leg is hurt pretty bad. It's super important that you don't bump into him. It would hurt him a lot. Do you promise to be careful? Both of them nodded, their little faces looking serious. Therese hoped she'd gotten her point across and they wouldn't forget to be careful around Rob's leg. And remember what we talked about in the car, her mother added. We are guests here. Be nice and use your inside voices. Don't make me regret bringing you here. Therese took each twin by the hand and walked them out on the back deck. Rob, I would like you to meet my mother, Pam, and my niece and nephew. 
This is Corinne, and this is Paul. Rob smiled at the kids and held his hand out. Each of them cautiously approached him and turned to shake it. Nice to meet you guys. It's kind of you to come visit me. He grabbed his crutches and rose. Pam, it's a pleasure to meet you. Your daughter is doing a wonderful job taking care of me. His smile turned into a grin as he added in a loud whisper, and let me tell you, that's not always easy. Her mother looked smitten. Mom, this is our neighbor, Miss Doris. Miss Doris, this is my mother, Pam Bowman. The two women shook hands. You look familiar, Miss Doris said. Do you spend much time here on Palmer Island? Pam shook her head. After a little more back and forth, the women discovered that they knew each other through church. Both were active members of their local Methodist congregations and had crossed paths at some of the larger local events. We have the local harvest festival this afternoon, Miss Doris told Pam. You should bring the kids. They'd love it. Which reminds me. I have overdone it with the cookie baking. Let me run back and fix a plate. These guys are probably ready for a snack. She turned and looked at Therese. Do you have enough milk? Therese nodded. By the time Miss Doris was back, everyone had moved into the kitchen. This milk tastes funny, Paul said after gulping down half the glass in one go. Tell me about it, Rob mumbled. Therese had encouraged him to use rice or almond milk in his coffee and cereal, but the stubborn man refused. They'd compromised on organic 2%. Paul didn't seem to be a fan either. Miss Doris had been right. The kids were ready for a snack and acted like they hadn't eaten all day. I promise, I fed them breakfast, her mom said, shaking her head at her grandchildren. Grandpa did too. He made us eggs before he went to work. Corinne reached over to grab another chocolate chip cookie. You made these? They are good. Miss Doris looked pleased. That's enough sugar for you too. Therese moved the almost empty plate from the table to the kitchen counter. Wash your hands and go play in the living room. I'll help you find something to do, Rob said, grabbing his crutches. Sit. Have a cup of coffee and a cookie, he said to Therese. You haven't had much of a break yet. Therese nodded and spent a pleasant half an hour sipping her coffee and chatting with Miss Doris and her mom. Rob seems nice. Her mother smiled at her across the table, and Therese had to suppress a groan. The woman had been trying to get her married off for years. He's very polite, Miss Doris added. I'm glad you two are getting along. There used to be a lot of yelling and door slamming. The poor man had a string of bad luck when it came to nurses when he first got here. I didn't realize. How many? Her mother was a bit of a gossip and couldn't wait to hear all about Rob and his personnel issues. I'm not quite sure. At least, two or three. Miss Doris didn't seem to mind a bit of gossiping herself. It had been five if you counted the nurse that flew down here with him, but neither one of them needed to know that. Therese wasn't convinced it had been bad luck. More of an attitude problem with Rob, in part because of the huge amount of pain he had been in at the time. Rob and Therese seem to be getting along well though, Pam said. Miss Doris nodded. Therese didn't like the direction this conversation was headed in. She heard giggles and a nice deep laugh from the living room. Rob and the kids sounded like they were having fun. She rose and went to check on the three of them. All three sat on the couch in front of the large flat-screen TV. Rob was in the middle, his leg propped up on the coffee table, a small pillow tucked under it. Her niece and nephew were on either side of him, curled up against him. They watched cartoons and took turns pointing to the TV. Did you see? That was so funny. That was such a roadrunner move, Rob added. When he noticed the confused look on Paul and Corinne's faces, he added. Roadrunner? The cartoon? He's a running bird and a coyote chases him. You must have seen it. Both kids shook their heads. Oh, we're going to have to fix that. It's only one of the best cartoons out there. 
Rob picked up the remote and started to search around. Roadrunner was only available through a paid subscription service, but the man didn't hesitate. Before Therese could remind him that the kids were only here for another couple of hours, he'd signed up for the first month. Therese made a mental note to remind him to cancel it tomorrow. She stood there for a moment, taking in the sight of him and the kids enjoying themselves. It was nice to see his softer side, and it was good to hear him laugh. He'd make a great dad one day she realized. For some reason, that thought both scared her and gave her a warm fuzzy feeling in her stomach. Not that it mattered. He was a client. A patient. A job that helped her pay off her debt so she could get back to doing something meaningful and important. Not that helping Rob get better wasn't important. It just wasn't the same as the work she'd been doing these past few years. Mind if I join you guys? Therese asked. Rob looked up and gave her the most dazzling smile. He seemed genuinely happy to see her, and it sent the butterflies in her stomach into overdrive. Scoot over and make some room for your aunt, he told Paul, before patting the seat beside him. Therese wasn't sure how she felt about sitting this close to Rob. Paul had moved, but he barely gave her enough room to sit down. She found herself squished between the two of them. Thankfully, this was Rob's good side. His broken leg was the left one. Without skipping a beat or letting on that he knew what he was doing, he put his arm around her shoulders and pulled her even closer. Now, this here is one of my favorite episodes. Wait until you see what he tries this time. Don't even think about it. Pam looked at her grandson sternly. That's Miss Doris's entry into the pie baking competition. Touch it, and you'll regret it. How will I regret it? Paul's hand hovered over the banana cream pie Pam carried in. They'd offered to help Miss Doris transport the mountain of cookies, cakes, bars, and pies to the harvest festival at the Methodist Church on the island. You will regret it when everyone else is eating funnel cakes and candied apples and you don't get any, Pam said. Paul stuck his hand in his pocket and nodded. I would regret that. Rob had to work hard to keep a straight face at the youngster's expression. The idea of missing out on sticky treats appeared to be a serious threat and enough to motivate Paul into his best behavior. What do you two want to do first? Therese asked looking around the stands and activities set up in the large field next to the church. There were various food stands, face painting, pumpkin carving, and more. Rob had a hard time seeing it all from their current vantage point at the bake sale. I want to go on a hayride, Corinne said, pulling on her aunt's arm and taking off in the direction of the horse-drawn cart filled with hay that took riders on a tour of the island. Let's try the corn maze. I bet I can make it to the center first, Paul said, a glimmer of excitement in his eyes. Unlike his twin sister, he wasn't trying to take off. His grandmother's warning kept him on his best behavior. Corinne, wait a minute. Therese pulled her niece close and looked at the attractions, then over at Rob. I'm not sure either one of those would be a good idea with your leg, she said apologetically. Oh, man. Do we have to sit around all day because of Rob? Corinne sounded disappointed and Paul didn't look much better. Of course not, Rob said quickly. You guys go have fun and I'll hang out here and keep an eye on the cookies and pies. We'll find you a couple of chairs, and make you comfortable, Miss Doris said. Don't worry about him. Go have fun. We'll keep an eye on Rob over here, she added, looking at Therese. And I'll keep him company. Pam turned to Miss Doris. I'm sure you could use an extra pair of hands at the sales table. Are you sure? Therese asked, looking at him with her pretty blue eyes. It was easy to see she wanted to enjoy herself with her niece and nephew. Go, have fun. I'll be here when you get back. I can't promise I won't sneak some cookies though. He winked at her and motioned for her to go. Therese still looked reluctant to leave him. We'll put him to work, Miss Doris said to her. She turned to Rob. How would you like to judge the pie-baking contest? I'm sure Reverend Peters wouldn't mind having a fifth judge. That way we don't run the risk of having a tie. Mary beside her, chuckled. 
as if, Miss Doris's friend mumbled under her breath. Rob wondered what that was about. At least the offer seemed to convince Therese that it was okay to leave him for an hour or so. We'll be back in a little while, she said with a sweet little wave in his direction. Have fun, he said. When you get back, I'm buying everyone a round of funnel cakes. Corinne and Paul looked excited at the prospect and then the three of them took off to get tickets for the hayride. Take pictures, Pam called after them before turning to Miss Doris. Let's find this young man a chair and then you can put me to work. And don't you worry. I've run the bake sale at St. Luke's for the past 15 years. I know what I'm doing. Rob was surprised how much he enjoyed himself despite being shoved into a chair in the corner. The ladies dug up a fairly comfortable chair with armrests from inside the preacher's house, along with some pillows for his back and one of the folding chairs that were spread out around the food carts to prop his leg up. They'd set him up behind the bake sale table, out of the way of the foot traffic. It made for a nice people-watching spot and he got to listen to the church ladies chat away as they sold cake after cake. Miss Doris's creations were the first to sell out. The woman must have a reputation as a great baker on the island. They make a cute couple, don't they? Pam was busy packing up an order of cookies and chatting away with Miss Doris and Mary. The three of them seemed to have forgotten about Rob sitting within earshot, waiting for the pie tasting to start. They do. And you can tell there's a spark there, Mary added before handing one of the peanut butter pies to a happy customer. Rob had no doubt it was well worth the $25 price tag. It's for a good cause, the woman said to her husband before walking off happily with her treat. I like Rob. He's a little crusty around the edges, but underneath all that is a good heart. What he needs is a few good people in his life that love him and care for him. Miss Doris leaned in and Rob had a hard time making out the next few words. I don't think he's had an easy childhood, bless his heart. The other two women nodded. Therese hasn't mentioned any family, Pam said. And I don't think anyone has been down to visit. More nods. Well, we'll just have to continue to take care of him then, Miss Doris said resolutely. Rob cleared his throat and grabbed his crutches to get their attention. I'm going to take a little stroll around and use the facilities before the judging starts, he said. Do you need help? Miss Doris asked. I'm happy to walk with you. No need. Rob waited her off, before heating himself out of the chair. You must be our new pie judge, a middle-aged man wearing dark suit pants and a white dress shirt approached him. Rob noticed the man's clerical collar. And you must be the reverend I've heard so much about, Rob said. He leaned against the chair and held out his hand. Rob Marshall. Reverend Peters. Thank you for volunteering your time. Why don't I show you the restroom in the fellowship hall over there? It'll be easier than those portable toilets over there. Rob was grateful for the offer and followed the man to the large building off to the side. I swear I didn't know the banana cream pie was Miss Doris's Rob assured everyone. Therese couldn't help herself. It was too much fun to tease him. My mom carried it in. You were with her in the car, and I distinctly remember you talking about the amazing smell. It tasted even better, Rob said. Is there any left? You've had enough sweets for one day, Therese said, suddenly feeling old and more than a little uncomfortable. You know too much sugar causes inflammation, she added quietly. He nodded. How much did you pay him to pick your banana cream pie? Mary asked her friend with a twinkle in her eye. Couldn't leave it up to chance, could you? Settle down, ladies. Reverend Peters walked up and stood next to Rob. I looked at all the votes and Miss Doris would have one with or without Rob. It was very nice of him to volunteer, and I trust his judgment was fair and unbiased. Even if he lives next to Miss Doris, and I have no doubt that she's offered to bring over more baked goods while he recuperates. We were just teasing, Mary said. No hard feelings, I hope. We all know we don't stand a chance when it comes to making pies. No one here has quite the talent Miss Doris has. Is the contest open to bakers from outside the parish? Pam asked. 
Therese got the feeling her mother had sensed a challenge and was ready to pit her own baked goods against those of Miss Doris. There's a cookie contest during the first week of the Christmas festival, Miss Doris added helpfully. We'd love to have you enter, wouldn't we, Reverend? Therese got the feeling her mother had made a new best friend and that Pam would be spending more time down here on Palmer Island even after her own job caring for Rob ended. We would love to have you enter your best cookies, Pam, Reverend Peter said. He turned to Therese. Your mother tells me you spent some time in Gambia? It shouldn't surprise her. Now that she was home safe and sound, her mother loved to brag about the good her daughter had done. I have. I was with the Peace Corps for three years. We spent most of our time building fresh water wells for some of the remote villages. Important work. I have a friend from college who's down there. Reverend John Shepard. You didn't happen to cross his paths in your time, did you? Therese shook her head. No, but I've heard of him. He's been doing good work for ten years or so, hasn't he? She'd hoped to meet the Reverend, who was known for his cause, but the one time she'd been to the small town where he was building his church, he'd been away. He has. We do what we can to support him from here. It's the reason for the Harvest Festival. We hope to raise enough funds to help him start on the construction of a school for girls. In that case, Rob said, why don't I buy what remains of the pies and cakes? He grabbed his wallet and pulled out several hundred dollar bills. Will this cover it? The Reverend nodded. That is very generous of you. John will appreciate it. He turned back to Therese. All proceeds from today go straight to him. The owner of the local Ford dealership covers the wire fees. Last I heard, he was pretty close to having enough to buy the land, Therese said. That had been five months ago. She hadn't heard any news about Reverend Shepard since she'd returned stateside. He bought the land last month. This will go towards the first building supplies. Reverend Peters weighed the money Rob had given him around before checking himself and handing it to Pam to add to the money bag. I still can't believe you two worked so close to each other. It really is a small world. I can't wait to tell him about this in tonight's email. The Reverend smiled. He'll be excited to hear how well we did this year. In large part, thanks to our new benefactor and pie-eating volunteer here. Let me wrap those cakes and pies up for you, Miss Dora said, before hustling over to the baked goods table. Rob stopped her. No need. I've had my share of sweets for today. I'm sure Reverend Peters here knows some people who'd appreciate a slice of pie or a cookie. He looked at the Reverend expectantly. Of course. I'm sure we'll find some use for them. What if we took them to the senior center? Miss Doris asked. They have some activities scheduled for tomorrow morning. I have a feeling this is going to take a while, Rob said to Therese. Let's get out of here. I'm ready for some peace and quiet. Rob rose in bed, trying to figure out what had woken him. The bedroom was completely dark. He reached for his phone. 3.30 in the morning. No, 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 no. The soft screams were coming from Teresa's room down the hall. He pulled his covers off and reached for the crutches leaning up against the nightstand. The noise stopped and he considered crawling back under the covers. He knew he wouldn't be able to sleep without checking on her first. He got up and made his way down the hall. Thomas. Rob heard her mumble something else but was unable to make out the words through the closed door. From the sound of it, she was thrashing back and forth in the bed. He softly wrapped his fingers on the door. Therese? Everything okay? No answer. Only more mumbling and what sounded like soft sobs. He twisted the doorknob. It wasn't locked. Carefully cracking the door open just wide enough, he poked his head in. The full moon shone a little light through the half-pulled curtains in Teresa's bedroom. It was enough for him to make out the blanket-covered form on the bed. She was still now, no more thrashing, but he still heard the muffled crying. Therese, he tried again. Are you okay? Still no answer. 
she must be asleep, caught in a nightmare. He debated for a moment what to do. He hated the thought of leaving her in the middle of what had to be an excruciating experience. How would she react if he woke her though? Was this an invasion of privacy? Throwing caution to the wind when he heard the next low scream from her lips, he made his way to her bed and reached down to touch her shoulder. Wake up, Therese. You're having a nightmare. It took several attempts before her eyes flew open and she sat up, almost pushing him to the floor in the process. What? What are you doing here? In the faint light, Rob could make out the trail of tears, crisscrossing her sleepy face. You were dreaming. And calling out. He gingerly sat down on the bed beside her, using his free hand to stroke her arm. It's okay. You're safe and everything is fine. The confused look slowly cleared from her face. I'm sorry, she said finally in a soft voice, rough from sleep and the screams she'd been uttering in her dream. Nothing to be sorry about. That must have been a pretty bad dream. Do you want to talk about it? I thought I was back in Africa. In Gambia, where I worked. Rough time, he asked. She nodded. I'd rather not talk about it. At least not now. Maybe tomorrow. He nodded and started to get up. She put a hand on his arm. Would you stay? Just until I fall back asleep? Chapter 6 Where's the bacon? Rob joked the next morning. Therese looked better. A little tired, but no longer frightened and sad. Not a chance, Therese shot back. Not after all that pie you had yesterday. This morning you're stuck with scrambled tofu and fresh fruit. She poured him a cup of coffee and set the half and half on the table in front of him. Thanks. Rob took a cautious bite of the tofu spinach scramble she'd prepared. Not as bad as I'd feared. Don't get me wrong. It isn't bacon and eggs, but it's edible. I'll take that as a compliment, she said, smiling at him over her coffee cup. Can I ask you a question? He wasn't quite sure how to start this conversation. Sure. If you're worried about the tofu creating some sort of estrogen response. He cut her off. That's not it. I was wondering if you'd tell me a little more about your time in Africa. Oh. Confusion washed over her face. What do you want to know? I'd love to hear a little more about the wells you built and the impact it had on the villages, he said, purposely not mentioning her nightmare. If you don't mind. It's okay if it's something you don't want to talk about. I understand. Rob held his breath and waited for her to respond. Okay, Therese pushed the tofu around her plate. I'm not really sure where to start, she admitted. How about why you signed up for the mission in the first place? That's easy. Her big smile took his breath away. I needed a break after nursing school. I'd been stuck in school and in hospital rooms for four years. I wanted to do something outside. Something that had a real impact, and to be honest, I was ready to get out of South Carolina. Rob nodded. He understood that feeling. The need to get away from it all and feel free. Did you pick Gambia for any particular reason? Yes, she laughed. That was the first open spot. I picked it because I could leave within two weeks. Getting the visa pushed through and finding a doctor to catch me up on all the necessary immunizations wasn't easy, but in the end, I got it all done. How was it out there? In the beginning. Couldn't be easy going from living here, he swept his arm around, to living in a rural African village. It wasn't easy. I'll admit, there was a bit of a culture shock. She looked lost in memories of that early time, her eyes taking on a vacant look. And I wasn't used to that much manual labor. But none of it mattered when I saw them enjoying the fresh water. When I started drinking it, instead of relying on the purifier, the core issued us for personal use. Rob watched her entire face light up when she recounted the times they were able to complete a well for a village. He felt for her when she described how hard it had been to leave the people she'd grown close to when it was time to move on to the next village. 
and he couldn't shake the feeling that there was something she wasn't telling him. Some experiences that were too hard to recount, too difficult to relive with someone sitting across the kitchen table from you. I did a little research after I found out what you did in Gambia, he admitted. You did? What for? Therese asked. I was curious. To be honest, I wanted to figure out what would drive someone to move to a different continent and volunteer to do hard manual labor while living in the most primitive of conditions. It wasn't like. I get it. At least I think I do. You made a difference. Did something real. To be honest, I'm a little envious of your experience out there. Therese sat back and swallowed. You do? You are? Most people think I'm crazy for wanting to go back and continue the work there. Or that I'm doing it to make up for something. Not sure what they think I have to atone for though. A sad laugh escaped her. Why do you think I did it, she asked. I think you did it, wait. He shook his head. I think you still do it, still think about those people, about those kids every day because you care. You hate the thought of them suffering and you want to do what you can to help them. To better their lives. Therese stared at him and then her entire face lit up with the most dazzling smile. You get it. You really do. Rob's chest expanded with pride and joy. He sat a little taller, amazed at the intense connection between them. From what I've seen, there's a lot of good work going on all over the place. There is, but it's not enough. You should see the difference a well makes to a community. The kids and women don't have to walk miles and miles each day to get water. The rate of sickness and premature death goes way down. People have time to farm and work and produce excess. The clean water. It has a cascade effect, he asked. It improves all areas of their lives and in turn changes their local economy for the better? Yes. Exactly. That's why these types of projects are so important. Their scope goes well beyond making it easier for the villagers to get water and preventing waterborne illnesses. Rob sat back. Their brief conversation had given him a lot to think about. He hadn't just learned about Therese and what motivated her. It made him question his own life, his choices, and what he could and should do with everything fate or luck or God had given him. I'll get it. Rob said when the doorbell rang. Therese had both hands in the sink, doing the dishes after breakfast. He should ask Brad why this place didn't have a dishwasher and see if he could have one installed. With the cast, doing dishes was one of the many things he couldn't help with around the house. Good to see you up and about, Sam said when he opened the door. We're here to cheer you up and get both of you out of the house and into the sun and fresh air. Come on in. We just finished breakfast. I think there's coffee left. Rob stepped aside and let the couple in. Why did you ring the bell? Don't you have a key, he asked. That would be rude. You're staying here, Sam said. Where's Therese? Rob pointed toward the kitchen, and by the time he and Jason made their way there, Sam was busy drying plates and chatting with Therese. You're going to have so much fun. Sam turned around to speak to her husband. Therese has never been paddleboarding. Or kayaking. Can you believe it? Paddleboarding? Rob asked, more than a little confused. How did that make any sense? He could barely make it out to the deck, let alone stand on a thin foam board. Not you. You get to lounge on the beach and watch. Trust me, it will be entertaining. Sam's face was determined, and he'd heard enough stories from Brad about the youngest Sutton sibling to realize there was no use in trying to talk her out of this little adventure. I wouldn't mind giving it a try, Therese said. We don't have to stay out long. And the sun and fresh air might be good for you. Rob nodded, resigning himself to a long morning of sitting on the sidelines. To his surprise, it was entertaining to watch Therese flounder with the board for a while. And then her joy when she got the hang of it. The sun was shining, but it wasn't as unbearably hot as it had been all summer in Arizona where he spent much of his time. 
The breeze off the ocean wasn't exactly cool, but enough to keep it from feeling sweltering. After a while, the warm air, breeze, and sound of the ocean lulled him to sleep. Rob woke with a start when something cold hit his legs. The tide was coming in and it was dangerously close to his chair already. He looked out over the ocean. Sam, Jason, and Therese were still out there, paddleboarding back and forth, just past the breakers. They were a good ways out, and there was no way they would make it to him in time. If he didn't want to get his cast wet, he needed to move now. Scrambling out of the chair, Rob reached for the stack of towels. His crutches didn't give him much of a grip in the sand and he almost flopped into the wet sand. Cursing under his breath, he decided to leave them. He managed to grab a corner of the beach chair while holding onto his crutches and started to drag it further up the sand. It was slow going and if he thought making it out here with the help of Therese and Jason had been tough, this was a different ball game. The sand was soft and uneven, making it hard to navigate with a pair of crutches. He let go of the chair after a few feet, hoping he'd gotten it far enough that the tide wouldn't sweep it away. The house and the steady surface of the back deck still seemed a long way off. The dry sand further up on the beach was surprisingly hot in the midday sun. Rob. Are you okay? Therese came running up to him. Why didn't you wait for us? Or call if you'd had enough. The water was coming in. I had to move, he said. Oh. Therese turned around and looked at the waves making their way further up the sand. I didn't realize we'd been out there that long. You were having fun. He grinned, the hot sand and his solo track halfway back to the house forgotten. Looks like you figured it out pretty quickly. I don't know about that. It's a lot harder than it looks. She waved at Sam and Jason returning with the three boards. It was a lot of fun, she added. I lost the towels, Rob said, looking out at the wet beach towels, gently rocking back and forth in the surf. Therese ran down and grabbed them, picking up the chair along the way. He couldn't wait to get this cast off and get back to moving around at something faster than a snail's pace. I'm sorry, man. I didn't mean to keep her out that long. Jason jogged up, dragging two of the large boards with him. He leaned them up against the side of the deck and came back to help Rob make it through the last of the sand and up the stairs. You look like you got some Sunday. When they made it inside, Therese insisted on checking his cast and helping him rinse the sand off his good foot before grabbing her own shower. By the time she had him settled on the couch, Jason and Sam walked in wearing clean clothes, their hair wet from washing the salt water out. We grabbed quick showers. Hope you don't mind, Sam said before heading into the kitchen. Anybody else want something to drink? Is it too early for beer? Rob asked. Probably. And it looks like you're all out. Water or tea? By the time Therese came back from her own shower, the three of them were sitting on the couch, drinking sweet tea, and watching baseball. I ordered Chinese takeout, Sam said. Hope you don't mind. Good idea. Therese grabbed a bottle of water from the fridge and sat down on the couch next to Rob. I'm famished. What did you get? Jason and I got kung pao and sesame chicken, Sam said. I think you guys ended up with beef and broccoli, and some sort of shrimp and veggie dish. Therese looked at him and smiled. Great choices. Thank you. It was the healthiest stuff he could spot on the menu and she'd noticed. The strange feeling of pride rose in his chest again, and he couldn't help but grin back at her. No problem, he said before his stomach growled loudly. Chapter 7 You are burnt, Therese said the next morning when Rob finally made it into the kitchen. She'd been up for hours and had started to worry about this patient of hers. A feeling of guilt came over her at the sight of his bright red forehead and nose. Sitting out on the beach had done quite the number on him. I can't believe you didn't get burnt, he grumbled, accepting the cup of coffee she held out to him. I put on sunscreen, Therese admitted. The ball of guilt inside her stomach grew. She protected her own skin by applying plenty of sunscreen when she'd gone to change into her bathing suit yesterday. 
It hadn't even occurred to her to make sure Rob was protected from the rays as well. Sure, he was a grown man who should be able to take care of that himself, but he was also her patient. And quickly becoming more than that, she admitted to herself. The more she got to know the incredibly rich, incredibly handsome, and often incredibly stubborn guy, the more she liked him. Yes, he was gruff and a little rough around the edges, but deep down, he had a heart of gold. Watching him with her niece and nephew had proven that. I'll get you some aloe for that, Therese said. She returned a minute later with a couple of pieces and started to peel them. When you said aloe, I thought you were talking about that bluish-green stuff in a bottle. Rob looked surprised. Not the actual plant. Will this even work? Nothing better than the real thing for sunburn. Trust me. I grew up around here. As a teenager, I ended up with at least one good burn a year. She wasn't proud of it. Her and her friends would lay out on the beach or by the pool and work too hard at getting a tan. During her time in Gambia, she'd worked hard to avoid getting sunburnt, and for the most part she had succeeded. Still, there was the worry about skin cancer. How does it work? Rob looked genuinely interested when she walked over with a bowl of the medicinal plant. All you have to do is peel it. I like to slice it into small strips. Makes it easier to handle. May I? When he nodded, she started to gently rub the slippery pieces of fresh aloe over the burned areas of his skin. It will feel a little sticky after it dries. Try to keep it on for as long as you can stand it. We'll add more in a couple of hours. He nodded. This feels better already. He sounded surprised. I told you. You can't beat the real thing. Where did you get it? There's a large aloe plant in my room. It must be a couple of decades old. I wonder who planted it. I can ask Brad the next time I talk to him, Rob offered. Thanks. Now let's look at your leg. She was worried that he had injured the newly healed break on his walk up from the beach. She couldn't believe he had tried to drag the chair with him. The man was on crutches. And he looked like he was in more pain this morning than he had been the past few days. She wasn't sure if it was from the sunburn or if his leg was bothering him. We should have Dr. Clark take a look to be safe. I don't think that's necessary. My leg feels fine. You are in pain. I can see it on your face. Therese was ready to use whatever pressure was needed to ensure he was okay. I'd feel a lot better if we had someone take a look. I'm sure Dr. Clark wouldn't mind. My leg doesn't hurt much more than it did yesterday morning. The pain comes and goes. It takes time. So, you're admitting that it hurts more than it did. Teresa's worry increased. It should be getting better, not worse. I'm making the appointment. You're not going to let this go, are you? He asked. Therese shook her head. Fine. But only if we can do something fun while we're out. She nodded and dialed the doctor's office. They were happy to fit Rob in, and half an hour later, they were driving up to Myrtle Beach. You're going to be okay, Dr. Clark said. He studied the latest set of x-rays. You're not healing as quickly as I'd like, but I don't think you've done any serious damage. I would like you to take it easy for a week or two. Stay off the leg as much as you can. Get some rest. Therese had to bite her tongue to keep the I told you so from slipping out. At least their little trip out on the beach hadn't done any long-term damage. Have you been working out? Dr. Clark moved behind Rob and started applying pressure to different spots around his back and shoulders. Some soreness through here, he asked. Nothing I can't handle. Todd showed me a couple of upper body strength training moves that I could do at home. And you thought you'd add some weight and increase the reps to get a better workout, right? The doctor walked back around and sat in front of Rob. Rob looked like he'd been caught with his hand in the candy jar. Not by much. I need to burn off a little steam, get those endorphins flowing. I get it. Helps with the stress and the pain. But I need you to cool it for a few more weeks. 
stick to what Todd comes up with. He's an experienced physical therapist. He'll push you, trust me. But not until your leg is ready for it. Therese felt horrible. How had she missed this? When and where was he working out? She'd have to keep a better eye on him until he finally smartened up and listened to his doctor's advice. I'm glad you came in, and I'm happy we didn't find anything serious. Take it easy, and we'll have another look in two weeks. If you follow protocol, you may be ready for a boot by then, Dr. Clark said. I'm sure you're ready to ditch those crutches. That was good news, Therese said as they walked out of the doctor's office. About the boot. You'll be able to walk a lot more with that. We could venture out a little further, go explore some of the parks around here. Rob nodded. Speaking of exploring. I believe you promised me an adventure. You heard what the doctor said. He wants you to stay off your feet for the next couple of weeks. Therese couldn't believe he still wanted to go do something. She was ready to strap him to the couch if needed. It'll have to be something that involves a minimum amount of walk. I have an idea. He gave her directions to downtown Myrtle Beach and had her park in front of the Skywheel. You're kidding. I am not going on there. Therese felt sick just looking at the tall structure. It's not that bad. It'll be a lot of fun. I bet the views from up there are amazing. I'll give you that. But do you see how high it is? She leaned across him to get a better look. She couldn't even see the top of the wheel from their current vantage point. Did I mention I'm afraid of heights? Seriously? You flew to Africa though, right? He asked. Yes, seriously. Have been since I was a kid. Therese leaned back into the driver's seat. And planes are different. They are enclosed. They have a pilot. This is no different. The cabins aren't open. It's all metal and glass. And there's an operator in the booth over there. He pointed at a small structure next to the large wheel. I promise it's perfectly safe. It'll be fun and if you let me out here, I don't have more than a few feet to walk. Before Therese could come up with a decent reason why this wasn't a good idea, he'd grabbed his crutches and opened the door. Resigned to her fate, she went in search of a parking spot. By the time she returned, Rob had a pair of tickets in hand. Why are we in the black gondola? Therese asked after helping him get settled on the bench in the surprisingly spacious cabin. I upgraded us to the VIP experience, Rob said. That explained the cushy leather seats. Meaning? We get twice the time in the air and there's a glass bottom for an even better view. Therese looked at the floor and groaned. Sure enough, she was standing on glass. It was unnerving even with less than a foot of space between her and the ground. This isn't good. Her legs shook, so she quickly took a seat on the bench opposite Rob. You look a little green, Rob said, sounding concerned. You really are scared. All Therese could do was nod. A small yelp escaped her lips when they started to take off and the cabin shook back and forth. You're okay. You're safe. I'm right here with you. Rob reached across and took both of her hands in his. They were warm and strong, and strangely comforting. Look at me. She did. She stared right into his warm brown eyes, focusing on her breath and trying to tune out everything around her. Her heart raced, sweat broke out on her forehead. It's your fear response kicking in. Your body is dumping a bunch of adrenaline. His voice was steady and soothing. Focus on the rush. Tap into that feeling of being alive, of everything coming into sharp focus. She did as he asked. Surprised, she noticed that she did feel incredibly alive. She was aware of everything. His breath, her heartbeat, which started to slow down. Every move and sound the structure made as they slowly started to climb. The warmth of the sun streaming in through the glass. That's better. Tap into that feeling. Find the joy in it. The rush. Therese nodded. The panic and fear were ebbing. 
that's better. I'm better. Thank you. She tried to smile. Therese wasn't sure if it was a convincing one, but she was feeling better. And she was grateful to Rob. Good. He smiled and unlike her own, his reached his eyes. Time to be brave and look out the window. Therese shook her head. No can do. This is good. I have it under control. Let's ride this out. I'm not going to let you miss out on this. It's beautiful. Trust me. He squeezed her hands, encouragingly. All you have to do is move your head a tiny little bit. I promise I won't let go. One little look out the window to your left, he coaxed. Therese risked a quick look. They were much higher than she'd expected. The cabin had settled after those first few shakes when they'd started up and was smoothly gliding higher and higher. See? Not so bad. Look around. You can see miles inland and far enough out over the ocean to see cruise ships. He moved his head to point to the window behind her with his chin. Think you can turn around? Or do you want to come sit on this side? That's when Therese made the mistake of looking down. Why had he chosen the one cabin with the glass floor? You could see all the way down to the ground. It was terrifying. She quickly looked back up and shook her head. I'm good here. She took a steadying breath, and letting go of one of his hands, she turned to look through the large glass window behind her. Pretty, isn't it? Rob asked, squeezing her hand again. It is. Therese let her gaze roam. The view over the ocean was stunning. There were several cruise ships out in the ocean and a couple of dark spots much closer to the shore. Therese squinted to see better. Are those, it couldn't be. Sharks? They probably are. Let me see. Rob pushed himself up from the bench and reached for her. His crutches were tucked into one corner of a cabin. She helped him sit back down next to her and they both turned to look out of the window and down to the spot here the ocean met the sand. I'm pretty sure those are sharks. Fairly large ones. I've read somewhere that they've sighted a couple of great whites off the South Carolina coast. I'm glad I didn't know about this yesterday, Therese said, shuddering at the thought of paddle boarding in shark territory. Makes you think twice about diving back into the water. I have a good excuse, Rob said, pointing at his leg. Oh look. You can see them playing putt-putt from here. When I'm in my boot, we're so doing that. Therese risked a quick glance at the glass bottom. It wasn't quite as terrifying as it had been the last time. She wasn't sure if she was getting used to the experience or if it was the fact that Rob was by her side with his arm wrapped around her. You weren't kidding. You can see the whole course from here. And the rope climbing one too. Therese even caught a glance of her old little Prius before looking back up. By the time the big wheel had made a full rotation and their VIP cabin was back at the bottom, she was almost sad that it was over. She looked around for her purse and handed Rob his crutches. We're not done yet. VIP, remember? We get to go around again. And then they'll take our picture. Why would they do that at the end? Isn't that something you should do at the beginning? You know, in case someone gets sick? No way. The end is much better. They capture the excitement and fun of the ride that way. Ready to go back up? It wasn't like she had a choice. That said, she had a lot more fun the second time around. The fear was gone, thanks to Rob, and she was able to enjoy the ascent, the brief pause at the top, and finally the descent back to the ground. Therese even got her phone out and took several pictures of the view and of Rob who grinned like a goofball into the camera. His joy was contagious. By the time they got off the ride, they were both in a much better mood than they had been this morning. You know what? Rob said after they'd gotten their souvenir photo. I think there's something to this, laughter is the best medicine theory. I am almost pain-free, and I haven't taken anything since this morning. We'll have to make sure you have more to laugh about for the next few weeks then. Her mind already churned with possibilities.
How about some food first? Rob glanced down at his watch. He was one of the few people other than her father who still wore one and it looked expensive. No wonder I'm starving. It's almost four o'clock. And I haven't had lunch yet. Is there such a thing as lunch and dinner together? Like brunch for breakfast and lunch, she asked. He nodded. Liner? Dunch? Therese shrugged her shoulders. I'm not sure either one of those is an actual word. And they don't sound right. We need to come up with something better. After some food. Why don't we pick something up on the way home? Therese said. Unless you'd rather sit in a fancy restaurant somewhere. Rob shook his head. I've had enough adventures for one day. I'm ready to hit the couch, shove some food in my face, and watch a ball game. Or a movie. Maybe one of those laugh-out-loud comedies, to test my theory about laughter for pain relief. Okay. Wait here. I'll get the car. By the time she was back, he looked up the restaurants that offered takeout between the Skywheel and Palmer Island. What are you in the mood for for dinner? he asked, with a smirk. Seafood would be nice. A salad topped with something grilled. She thought for a moment. And ice cream for dessert. There's a carton of butter pecan in the back of the freezer. Therese Bowman, have you been hiding ice cream from me? Rob asked, mirth in his voice. When she risked a cautious glance at him, she saw his eyes danced with glee. I wouldn't exactly call it hiding. I've kept it out of sight for both of us to avoid temptation. But sometimes you need ice cream and today I do. Plus, I deserve it after facing my fear of heights like that. You do. We both deserve some ice cream tonight. He glanced down at his phone. How about a grilled shrimp salad? There's a little place just off the highway at the south end of Myrtle Beach. Chapter 8 Rob woke the next morning with a throbbing headache and pressure building in his stomach. He barely made it to the bathroom sink before he got sick. Everything okay in there? He barely heard Teresa's voice over the retching. No. Not really, he bit out. She was by his side within seconds, holding him up and handing him a glass of water when he was done. It wasn't until he looked up that he noticed how pale she looked. Sick too, he asked. She nodded. Since about five this morning. I don't think I have anything left in my stomach. Yet, here she was helping him. You don't have to stick around. I'm sure the last thing you... Stop. It's fine. I may need to run in a minute but you clearly could use the help. She closed the lid to the toilet. Sit, and I'll see what I can do about the sink. Thirty minutes later, they were both lying on the couch, buckets next to them on the floor. We need help, Therese said. Someone to keep an eye on us and get us some Gatorade and crackers. Who would want to risk walking into this? Rob asked. I don't think it's contagious. Feels like food poisoning to me. The shrimp salad, Rob groaned. I thought something tasted a little off. I never should have picked that place. Not your fault, she mumbled tiredly. I'm going to close my eyes for a minute. She looked worn out, and she was right. They could use help. He was in no position to get her to the hospital if things got worse. Didn't people die from food poisoning occasionally? or pass out from dehydration during something like this. He had no idea how much time she'd spent hugging the toilet in the early morning hours while he was sound asleep. He picked up his phone and dialed. Miss Doris was over within minutes, letting herself in with the spare key Brad and Cat left with her when they were gone. In case something comes up while everyone's away, she'd said before walking into the kitchen to empty the large picnic basket she'd brought. Here, drink this. She handed him a bottle of bright yellow sports drink. I keep a case of them in my pantry for emergencies. Miss Doris? What are you doing here? Therese was barely able to lift her head. Miss Doris was there in an instant, helping her drink a few sips of the electrolyte drink. 
looks like a pretty bad case of food poisoning to me. What did y'all have for dinner? Rob told her about the grilled shrimp salad and where they'd picked up their to-go order. Ah, that explains it. I've heard of a few cases over the summer. Surprised they are still open. I figured the health department would have shut them down by now. Rob felt even worse. He should have checked Yelp. Reviews, or at the very least, paid attention to the letter grade posted on the door of the establishment before ordering dinner from there. Now Therese was forced to pay the price. Do you think she needs to see a doctor? He asked, looking over at his pretty blonde nurse, sunk down into the couch. Let's give it half an hour and see if the liquids help. If she doesn't perk up, I'll call Dr. Franklin. He's my family doctor and he'll make a house call if need be. Miss Doris looked as concerned as he felt. I don't think we could get her to his practice on our own. Rob nodded and spent the next 30 minutes keeping a close eye on Therese. He'd started to feel better and was able to keep the liquid down. Miss Doris continued to feed Therese small sips of Gatorade, staying by her side and talking to the young woman softly. Eventually, Therese was able to sit up and not long after that, color returned to her face. You scared me there, he said with a small smile. Me too, Miss Doris added. For a moment, I was afraid you were losing consciousness. How are you feeling, dear? Honestly? Like someone took a baseball bat to me. Therese took the offered bottle and drank half of it in one gulp. Slow down, Miss Doris advised, taking it away from her. You don't want to push it. Lay back down and rest. If you're both up for it, I'll bring you some pretzels. Miss Doris turned out to be an excellent caretaker. She even dealt with the mess Rob had left in the bathroom sink. Once she was convinced the two of them would be okay for half an hour on their own, she dashed off the store, returning with more supplies and everything she needed to make them a batch of chicken and rice soup. That smells great, Rob commented from the couch. He'd turned on a documentary about ancient Rome as background noise while Miss Doris was busy stirring pots. That's a good sign. If food smells appealing again, you're on the mend. How about you, Therese? Ready to try a little soup? The gray-haired woman walked into the living room and smiled encouragingly at both of them. I'll give it a try, Therese agreed. Rob's right. It smells pretty good. She started to rise from the couch, but her face twisted into a grimace. Ouch. I haven't been this sore since that trial session with a personal trainer in college. You stay put. I'll bring you each a bowl when it's ready. Miss Doris looked like she meant it and Rob wasn't surprised when Therese sat right back down. The little old lady could be quite authoritative when she needed to be. She returned to the kitchen, leaving Rob and Therese to finish their show about the creation of the Pantheon. Are there any crackers left? Therese asked. Rob looked around the table and pointed to a pack of them. Want a share, she asked before moving to sit next to him. His stomach growled. Therese laughed. I take that as a yes. He took a couple of the crackers and noticed how much better she looked than she had a few hours ago. You look cute, with your hair all. He waved his hand around his own head, trying to describe her curls. Ha. Huh. I'm a hot mess. I've been laying around all day and haven't even showered. I don't care. I think you look pretty. Much better than when you were all green around the nose. Or half unconscious on the couch. He'd been worried about her there for a little while. That's when it hit him. He'd been more worried about her and her well-being than his own all day. That was new. The strange thing was, he kind of liked it. Ready for soup? Miss Doris asked. She carried a tray with three bowls into the living room. Rob's stomach growled again, despite the crackers they'd shared and Teresa's joined in. They looked at each other and laughed. Yes, yes, we are, he bit out. Glad to see you two are feeling better. If you're keeping this down, I'm going to head back home for the night, Miss Doris said, if you promise to call me if you need me. No matter how late it is. I need to start preparing for this hurricane. 
What hurricane? Rob and Therese asked in unison. Chapter 8 Rob woke the next morning with a throbbing headache and pressure building in his stomach. He barely made it to the bathroom sink before he got sick. Everything okay in there? He barely heard Therese's voice over the retching. No. Not really, he bit out. She was by his side within seconds, holding him up and handing him a glass of water when he was done. It wasn't until he looked up that he noticed how pale she looked. Sick too, he asked. She nodded. Since about five this morning. I don't think I have anything left in my stomach. Yet, here she was helping him. You don't have to stick around. I'm sure the last thing you. Stop. It's fine. I may need to run in a minute, but you clearly could use the help. She closed the lid to the toilet. Sit, and I'll see what I can do about the sink. Thirty minutes later, they were both lying on the couch, buckets next to them on the floor. We need help, Therese said. Someone to keep an eye on us and get us some Gatorade and crackers. Who would want to risk walking into this? Rob asked. I don't think it's contagious. Feels like food poisoning to me. The shrimp salad, Rob groaned. I thought something tasted a little off. I never should have picked that place. Not your fault, she mumbled tiredly. I'm going to close my eyes for a minute. She looked worn out, and she was right. They could use help. He was in no position to get her to the hospital if things got worse. Didn't people die from food poisoning occasionally? Or pass out from dehydration during something like this? He had no idea how much time she'd spent hugging the toilet in the early morning hours while he was sound asleep. He picked up his phone and dialed. Miss Doris was over within minutes, letting herself in with the spare key Brad and Cat left with her when they were gone. In case something comes up while everyone's away, she'd said before walking into the kitchen to empty the large picnic basket she'd brought. Here, drink this. She handed him a bottle of bright yellow sports drink. I keep a case of them in my pantry for emergencies. Miss Doris? What are you doing here? Therese was barely able to lift her head. Miss Doris was there in an instant, helping her drink a few sips of the electrolyte drink. Looks like a pretty bad case of food poisoning to me. What did y'all have for dinner? Rob told her about the grilled shrimp salad and where they'd picked up their to-go order. Ah, that explains it. I've heard of a few cases over the summer. Surprised they are still open. I figured the health department would have shut them down by now. Rob felt even worse. He should have checked Yelp. Reviews, or at the very least, paid attention to the letter grade posted on the door of the establishment before ordering dinner from there. Now Therese was forced to pay the price. Do you think she needs to see a doctor? he asked, looking over at his pretty blonde nurse, sunk down into the couch. Let's give it half an hour and see if the liquids help. If she doesn't perk up, I'll call Dr. Franklin. He's my family doctor and he'll make a house call if need be. Miss Doris looked as concerned as he felt. I don't think we could get her to his practice on our own. Rob nodded and spent the next thirty minutes keeping a close eye on Therese. He'd started to feel better and was able to keep the liquid down. Miss Doris continued to feed Therese small sips of Gatorade, staying by her side and talking to the young woman softly. Eventually, Therese was able to sit up and not long after that, color returned to her face. You scared me there, he said with a small smile. Me too, Miss Doris added. For a moment, I was afraid you were losing consciousness. How are you feeling, dear? Honestly? Like someone took a baseball bat to me. Therese took the offered bottle and drank half of it in one gulp. Slow down, Miss Doris advised, taking it away from her. You don't want to push it. Lay back down and rest. If you're both up for it, I'll bring you some pretzels. Miss Doris turned out to be an excellent caretaker. She even dealt with the mess Rob had left in the bathroom sink. Once she was convinced the two of them would be okay for half an hour on their own, 
she dashed off the store, returning with more supplies and everything she needed to make them a batch of chicken and rice soup. That smells great, Rob commented from the couch. He'd turned on a documentary about ancient Rome as background noise, while Miss Doris was busy stirring pots. That's a good sign. If food smells appealing again, you're on the mend. How about you, Therese? Ready to try a little soup? The gray-haired woman walked into the living room and smiled encouragingly at both of them. I'll give it a try, Therese agreed. Rob's right. It smells pretty good. She started to rise from the couch, but her face twisted into a grimace. Ouch. I haven't been this sore since that trial session with a personal trainer in college. You stay put. I'll bring you each a bowl when it's ready. Miss Doris looked like she meant it and Rob wasn't surprised when Therese sat right back down. The little old lady could be quite authoritative when she needed to be. She returned to the kitchen, leaving Rob and Therese to finish their show about the creation of the Pantheon. Are there any crackers left? Therese asked. Rob looked around the table and pointed to a pack of them. Wanna share, she asked before moving to sit next to him. His stomach growled. Therese laughed. I take that as a yes. He took a couple of the crackers and noticed how much better she looked than she had a few hours ago. You look cute, with your hair all. He waved his hand around his own head, trying to describe her curls. Ha. Huh. I'm a hot mess. I've been laying around all day and haven't even showered. I don't care. I think you look pretty. Much better than when you were all green around the nose. Or half unconscious on the couch. He'd been worried about her there for a little while. That's when it hit him. He'd been more worried about her and her well-being than his own all day. That was new. The strange thing was, he kind of liked it. Ready for soup? Miss Doris asked. She carried a tray with three bowls into the living room. Rob's stomach growled again, despite the crackers they'd shared and Teresa's joined in. They looked at each other and laughed. Yes, yes, we are, he bit out. Glad to see you two are feeling better. If you're keeping this down, I'm going to head back home for the night, Miss Dora said, if you promise to call me if you need me. No matter how late it is. I need to start preparing for this hurricane. What hurricane? Rob and Therese asked in unison. Chapter 9 What's the latest? Therese asked as she walked into the living room, two cups of coffee in hand. Rob had the TV tuned to the Weather Channel, which broadcast constant updates on Hurricane Isaac. The storm is gaining strength, and they think it will make landfall somewhere along the South Carolina coast. They'll know more by tomorrow. We should get ready. I'll make a list. Therese dug around the drawer of the side table until she found a notepad and pen. Have you been through a hurricane before? she asked, looking over at Rob. His brows were wrinkled and his mouth was shut in a tight line. No. Any idea how bad this is going to get? he asked. Should we evacuate? I can have a plane out here in a matter of hours. I think we'll be fine. It's a fairly small storm. She glanced up at the TV and watched the latest update for a minute. A Category 1 storm usually doesn't do too much damage. I talked to Miss Doris earlier, and she's staying put. She is? He stared at her disbelievingly. She's been riding out most hurricanes in her house. This little strip of land sits a good bit higher than most of the other oceanfront homes. Between that and the stilt construction, we shouldn't have to worry about the storm surge. We might lose power for a day or two, but overall, it shouldn't be too bad. Rob nodded, but didn't look convinced. We can leave if you'd rather not stick around. My parents' house is a little further inland, or we can head up to Charlotte and stay in a hotel. If you think it's safe, we'll stay, Rob said. I'll call Brad and see what he wants me to do to prepare the house. Good idea. I'll take stock of the food and water we have. We should probably stock up on some non-perishables, flashlights, candles, that type of thing. 
She wrote down a few of the items she knew they would need on her list before moving into the kitchen. By the time she was done, Rob was off the phone with Brad. There isn't a whole lot to do. The generator in the back is shot, but Brad said he doubts we'll be able to find a new one. I guess they run out of those pretty quickly. Therese nodded. There's plywood under the house for the windows. If it looks like it's going to get bad, we should find someone to put those up for us. For now, Brad said not to worry about boarding anything up. Therese agreed. A Category 1 hurricane shouldn't do too much damage. We'll bring in the deck furniture and anything else around the house that could fly off. But there's plenty of time for that later in the day and tomorrow morning. Our biggest priority right now is food. Will you be okay by yourself if I hit a couple of the stores to see what I can find? I'll be fine. Sure, you don't want me to come with you, he asked. Don't take this the wrong way. But I'd just get in the way. I get it. I'll see what I can get done around here. I'll be back as soon as I can. Would you mind starting a couple of batches of ice cubes? In case there's no bagged ice left. No problem. Call if you run into any trouble. Sounds good. I'll be back as soon as I can. She didn't know what he'd be able to do from here in his cast. The sentiment was nice though. I was starting to worry, Rob said when Therese walked back in two hours later. Everything go okay? She nodded and plopped on the couch. I'm pretty sure I got everything we need. The store shelves are getting pretty bare. Hope you like whole grain bread and crunchy peanut butter. I made some coffee, Rob said. You look like you could use some. Thanks, I do. Therese got back up and poured herself a large cup. I better get some of this stuff put away. Did you talk to Miss Doris while I was gone? She stopped by and dropped off some jars of homemade soup. She seems well prepared and invited us to come over if we run out of food. That's nice of her. Does she need help with anything? Therese asked. Rob shook his head. She's got it covered. A friend from church is coming over this afternoon to help around the yard and board up the windows if needed. She said he'd be happy to help us as well. He'd be sure to pay the guy of course. Therese shoved the ice in the freezer and grabbed the milk and eggs from the bags and held them up triumphantly. Took going to three different stores, but I found milk and eggs. Milk, eggs, and bread. What's with that? Does everyone crave French toast when these things hit? Therese laughed. I guess so. Either that or because it's so versatile. You can make a lot of different things with a handful of ingredients like that. Comfort food that fills you up. That's true. The real question is. Did you buy enough for us to have French toast for lunch? Chapter 10 the wind is really picking up, Rob said. He was out on the back deck looking over the ocean. If there's anything else you want to bring inside, we'd better do it now. Therese stepped outside, the gusts off the ocean blew her hair in her face. She pushed it back in a futile effort. Groaning, she dug a hair elastic out of her pocket and quickly pulled the tangled mess into a ponytail. It wasn't pretty, but at least she could see. The Atlantic Ocean churned with the oncoming storm. Seeing it made her stomach drop, and she turned to look around the deck and the side of the house. I think we're in pretty good shape, she said, speaking up so Rob could hear her over the noise of the wind and the waves. I'll take one last look under the house and check on my car. Sounds good. I'll be right here. He stood at the deck railing, his crutches beside him, mesmerized by the big waves and the wall of clouds making its way on shore. Therese ran down the steps and quickly scanned the area below the stilt-built house. She grabbed a few toys and a broom before walking over to her car and making sure it was locked. She'd parked as close to the house as possible in a sheltered spot. By the time she made it back on the deck, Rob was calling her over. She dropped the items by the back door and joined him at the rail. These people are crazy, he yelled over the noise of the crashing waves. He pointed to a group of surfers making their way to the edge of the water. 
Even I know you get some unpredictable currents this close to the storm. Do you have your phone on you? She nodded and pulled it out of her pocket. Right here. You think they'll be in trouble? I hope not. Let's assume they know what they are doing. He didn't take his eyes off the group. That has got to be such a rush. If I wasn't stuck with this cast, I'd be tempted to join them. Seriously? Why? Therese asked. You just said it's unpredictable and dangerous. Because of the adrenaline. It makes you feel alive like nothing else. Therese shook her head at his words. I'd have to learn to surf first though. They watched the surfers head out into the water with their boards, struggling to make it through the rough surf. Rob had been right. A strong current pulled them past Brad's beach house, then Miss Doris's. By the time two of the surfers rode a wave all the way back to the beach, they were almost a quarter of a mile further south than where they had started. Small groups of people gathered on the beach, watching the group of six surfers, locals, Therese assumed, paddle out and ride the rough waves in. The spectacle lasted for a good hour. Even Miss Doris came out into her yard at some point and waved at them. I'm going to walk over and make sure Miss Doris has everything she needs, Therese said before turning to head across the small strip of sand between the two houses. I'll come with you. There are enough other people watching these guys. Rob kept up with her as she walked across the deck and down the steps. The sand still slowed him down, but overall he was getting around better and better with the crutches. Can you believe those kids? Miss Doris shook her head when they reached her. Do you have time to come in for some coffee and cookies? Rob's face lit up, and Therese didn't have the heart to tell him to stay away from the sweets. Besides, he'd been eating pretty clean since their shrimp salad incident. There had been no more takeout after that. These aren't your hurricane snacks? Rob asked when the three of them were settled in Miss Doris's cozy kitchen. This guy on TV keeps warning everyone not to eat them unless he gives the all clear. Miss Doris giggled. No, don't you worry. You're not eating my hurricane snacks. I am well stocked. She stood up and opened the door to a large walk-in pantry. I'm well prepared. Trust me, I'm not going to run out of snacks anytime soon. Therese walked over to take a look. Miss Doris wasn't exaggerating. That's a grocery store in there. She turned to Rob. If we start to run out of anything, I know where to go. She turned when she heard the front door open. Aunt Doris? We're here, the voice of a young woman called out before the door shut. We're in the kitchen, Miss Doris called back. That's Sarah. My niece. Great niece actually, but that makes me sound old. Especially since she's had Charlie. Wait until you meet him. A pretty young woman carrying a baby on her hip stepped into the kitchen. She struggled with a large duffel bag and Therese and Miss Doris rushed to help her. Come here, Charlie. Come to Granny Doris. The older woman took the baby. Therese grabbed the duffel bag and stepped back, giving the young woman room to take off the diaper bag and purse she had slung across her body. Where do you want this? she asked. You can drop it in the hall, by the stairs. I'll take it up to my old room in a minute. I'm Sarah, by the way. Therese. Nice to meet you. This is Rob. We're staying in Brad Sutton's house for a few weeks. How fun. Except for the hurricane of course. How long have you guys been together? Sarah looked from Therese to Rob and back, a friendly smile on her face. Oh. We're not, Therese stopped halfway out the door, clutching the duffel bag in front of her. We're not a couple, Rob said, walking over to shake Sarah's hand. I'm an old friend of Brad's. He's offered me the place while my lake heals. Therese is kind enough to take care of me and put up with my grumpiness. Therese hid the heat that crept into her cheeks by walking out into the hall to drop the bag by the stairwell. Straightening, she pushed her hair behind her ears and walked back. Don't believe a word he says, she told Sarah. Deep down, he's a pretty nice guy and an excellent patient. 
Ain't that the truth, Miss Doris added, handing Charlie a spoon to play with. Rob here volunteered to judge the pie contest at the fair and bought up all the baked goods that were left at the end of the day. Where's Ryan? He'll be here in a little bit. He's having someone install hurricane shutters at the house. Turning to Therese and Rob, she added, we live a few miles up. This is our first hurricane as homeowners. It has Ryan a little worked up. The house will be fine. And if something were to happen, you know you always have a home here, Miss Doris said. Sarah smiled at her great aunt and went to pour herself a cup of coffee. That was nice of you to make sure the bake sale sold out. I'm sure Reverend Peters was pleased. I'm sorry we couldn't make it, Aunt Doris. Ryan had some big events going on at the resort and little Charlie here came down with an ear infection. Trust me, you didn't want to be anywhere near him. Poor thing was screaming at the top of his lungs. She shook her head at the unpleasant memory. He seems fit as a fiddle to me, Miss Dora said before putting the young boy down. He took off crawling across the kitchen floor. I took him to see Dr. Martin first thing Monday morning. She prescribed some antibiotic drops and he was better that night. I'm glad it didn't happen during this storm. Can you imagine being stuck in a house with a screaming baby? That did not sound like fun at all. Not that the idea of being trapped while a wild storm raged outside, pushing the ocean closer and closer, had a lot of appeal to begin with. Therese shuddered, wondering yet again if they wouldn't be better off driving as far inland as they could get before it hit. Are you guys evacuating or are you staying here? She asked Sarah after joining her at the table to finish her own cup of coffee. We're staying here. Ryan is a little reluctant to leave the new house, but I figured my aunt could use the company. Plus, she has the best stocked place on the island when the power goes out. Sarah grinned at her great aunt. We've seen. We'll be over if we start to run out of anything, Rob said, grinning himself. And you're welcome to do so, Miss Doris added. I mean that. If there's anything you need, you come over or you call. Brad still has an old landline phone in the house, doesn't he? Therese thought for a moment. I think there's an old phone on the kitchen wall. I'm not sure it's connected though. In case it is, take down my number. Miss Doris walked over and Therese pulled her phone out of her purse. That won't do you much good when the power runs out. Do you have a pen and paper? Therese shook her head. The older woman dug through a kitchen drawer before handing Teresa pen and a scrap of paper. She wrote Miss Doris's phone number down carefully, reading it back to the woman per her request. She stuck the note into her pocket, ready to stick it on the fridge when they got back. I doubt you'll need it, Sarah said. I don't think it will get too bad. We might not even lose power, especially if it doesn't make landfall anywhere near us. She rose and dug around the diaper bag, pulling a glass jar of baby food out. How about some peaches and cereal for you, she asked her son. Charlie babbled back at her, his fist in his mouth, a little bit of drool running down his chin. Miss Doris used his bib to wipe it off. I bet that ear infection was caused by some of his back teeth coming in. That was the doctor's best guess too. She gave me a numbing tincture to rub on his gums if it gets bad. Sarah pulled a dark glass bottle from the bag and sat it on the table. Miss Doris picked it up and looked at it critically. A little whiskey always did the trick for my boys. She got up and held the baby out to Therese. Do you mind holding him for a minute? Therese took the grinning baby, entertaining him with her car keys and the spoon he still held while Sarah heated water to make the cereal and Miss Doris rummaged through her pantry. You look like a pro, Sarah said, carrying a bowl of peaches and cereal over to the table. I have a niece and nephew. Twins. They are a lot older than this little guy though. It's been a while since I held a baby. How old is Charlie? Therese asked. Nine months. He was born Christmas Eve. Do you mind if I feed him? Therese hoped she wasn't crossing a line. After all, they'd just met. Not at all. Knock yourself out. I should warn you, though, he's a messy eater. 
Sarah pushed the bowl closer and handed her a plastic spoon. Those peaches may stain, she warned, but Therese didn't mind. Propping Charlie sideways on her leg so she could aim better, she fed in the mix of rice cereal and strained peaches. She took care not to overfill the spoon and used it to quickly catch the bit of food he pushed back out. You're good at that, Sarah said, sounding surprised. Lots of practice. My sister needed all the help she could get when the twins were this age. I can only imagine. It's all I can do to keep up with him. Sarah walked around the kitchen and tossed the baby food jar in the trash can. If you're good over there, I'll take our stuff upstairs. Therese nodded and continued to feed Charlie. Glancing up, she caught Rob's eye. He looked curiously at the two of them, but didn't say a word. By the time she'd finished feeding Charlie, Sarah was coming back down the stairs. The doorbell rang. I'll get it, Sarah called from the hallway. Moments later, she walked back into the kitchen, followed by a handsome young man. Ryan, this is Therese, and the guy with the crutches over there is Rob, a friend of Brad Sutton's. Sarah looked at Therese and Rob. This is Ryan. My husband. Ryan waved at them before turning to his wife. I have all of Charlie's stuff in the trunk and a bunch of boxes of paperwork and stuff. Just in case. Just in case? Rob asked, his eyebrows raised. In case our house floods. It's sitting on lower ground than this place. Ryan looked concerned. The wind's picking up speed. Won't be long before it starts raining. I'd like to get everything inside before it does. Therese used the washcloth Miss Doris handed her to clean the last of the sticky fruit and cereal mix from Charlie's face and hands. She got up, tossed the cloth in the sink and walked over to Rob. Can you hold him while we get the stuff? She held the baby out to him. Rob looked shocked, but put his arms out. He held the large baby awkwardly out in front of him, propping him up on the kitchen table. A.H.M., hello there, little guy. How was that peach stuff? Therese had to bite back a grin. He looked more than a little uncomfortable. Put him on your lap, she suggested. Sarah walked over and put a couple of little plastic toys on the table. He likes playing with these, she said. Are you going to be okay for a few minutes? Of course. We'll be fine. Rob sounded more confident than he looked. Call out if you need help, Ryan said before heading out to his car. Between the four of them, it didn't take long to unpack the car. The first sprinkles of rain started to fall after they'd made it back inside. Just in time, he said, looking pleased that the task had been accomplished. We'd better get back before it starts to pour, Therese said. Rob gladly relinquished the baby to his father and grabbed his crutches. Take this. Miss Doris held a large picnic basket out to her. Therese realized that was what the older woman had been working on when she'd been rummaging through the pantry earlier. It's nothing much but it'll get you through the first day, or, so if the power goes out. That's not necessary? Just take it, Sarah said. She's not going to let you leave without it. Therese nodded and thanked Miss Doris before heading out the front door. It was easier for Rob to walk along the sidewalk back to Brad's house. A few minutes after they'd made it back to the house, the rain started in earnest. It came down in thick sheets that blew sideways. Within moments, it got dark, the thick clouds of the first bands of the hurricane blocked out much of the sun. Therese turned on a few lights and got to work unpacking the basket. Boom! The light flickered briefly before going out along with the TV. There goes the power. Therese felt around for one of the flashlights she'd stashed around the house. There. That's better. I'll start lighting some candles. She looked over at Rob. So far, he'd dealt with the hurricane like a pro. Even now, he didn't seem scared. Instead, he looked excited, standing by the window, looking at the raging ocean outside. This is pretty spectacular. Come look before we lose the last of the sunlight. He waved her over. 
Therese wasn't eager to see the ocean churn in the early evening light, but she stepped over and joined him anyway. The ocean looked wilder than it had earlier. She doubted any surfer would head in now, even if the light wasn't fading. It looked more like something out of one of her nightmares than the ocean she loved. So much for not losing power, Rob said, joining her back on the couch. And from the looks of it, the storm hasn't made landfall yet. He was looking down at the screen of his phone. The latest predictions have it coming in just south of us. That's not good, Therese mumbled under her breath. How so? Isn't it better than a direct hit? He looked at her, more curious than worried. Maybe. All I know is that some of the strongest winds and the highest chances for tornadoes are in the northwest quadrant, the one that'll come right over us if Isaac makes landfall just south of here. Do they think it will go straight inland or right along the coastline, she asked. It'll hug the coastline according to this latest data, Rob said, holding his phone out to her. Therese glanced at the spaghetti models. It didn't look good. If it played out that way this close to landfall, and every indication was that it would, Palmer Island would get the worst of the storm. She worried about the damage it would do to the homes and the fragile dunes at the south end. Tornadoes? Rob asked. I thought they were a Midwestern thing. We get them here occasionally, and they are a big problem with some of the larger hurricanes. They can do quite a bit of localized damage. She couldn't keep her voice from shaking. One of them took our roof off when I was in elementary school. She'd woken to the sound of a tree crashing down on their home and her father bursting into her room. Was everyone okay? Rob asked. For the first time since she handed him baby Charlie, she saw concern in his eyes. We were fine, other than being pretty scared. A tree fell on the living room. We were all asleep on the other side of the house. Jason's parents took us in and insisted on paying for everything that wasn't covered by insurance. The help had been a godsend at the time. It wasn't until years later that Therese realized how much the kindness of the McKenna family had meant to her parents. I'm glad everyone was okay. Things can be replaced, people can't. Says the guy who crashed a car and broke his leg. Therese looked at him across the room. That was different. How? To her, it seemed like he'd taken an unnecessary risk for a cheap thrill. Well, not so cheap, depending on the car. It was a calculated risk. Nine times out of ten, it's perfectly safe. I pushed a little too hard, but there were plenty of safety features and a crew on standby to save my bacon. How did it happen? she asked. If you don't mind talking about it. Therese watched him closely to see how he'd react. His expression didn't change much. If anything, he looked thoughtful. I've been racing cars for a while and I'm getting into electric cars. I'm building a team out in Arizona and was out on the track. He smiled at the memory. We had the car ready to go, and I decided I should take it out for a spin. It wasn't my first time in an electric race car, but the first time in this particular one. He looked up. It's a new car my company is working on based on a Tesla. Therese nodded. She'd heard of Tesla cars. High-performance electric cars that had nothing in common with her little hybrid Prius. They are actual race cars that run on batteries, she asked to confirm. Yes. It acts and feels like a regular combustion engine race car. He paused. But different enough to get you in trouble when you're working on instinct. Like I said, this was the first time I'd driven the new car. I should have taken it easy, gotten a feel for it. I did, for the first lap. Then, I decided to see how far I could push it. How quickly, I could make it through some of the tighter turns of the track. The car was gripping the tarmac like a dream, and I couldn't wait to find out what it could do. You went too fast? I got cocky. I went into the last hairpin turn too fast. Lost control and rolled it. After my crew chief figured out I'd make it out alive, he chewed me a new one. It took them weeks to get the car put back together. And even longer for your leg to heal. Therese said. The wind continued to howl, rattling her nerves. 
Do you want some tea? she asked. How do you plan on heating the water without power? Rob looked at her like she was losing her mind. I filled a couple of old thermos bottles earlier. There were four of them in one of the kitchen cabinets. It won't stay hot for long, but it's enough for tea tonight and coffee in the morning. She walked into the kitchen and grabbed the chamomile tea. Rob walked in behind her. Chamomile? I think I'll pass. There's peppermint and Earl Grey. He shook his head. I'm good. He walked over to the large kitchen window. This is something else. Teresa's gaze followed him. It was pitch black outside, only the occasional flash of lightning lit up the sky. When it did, she caught a glimpse of the raging waves outside. She shuddered and went back to fixing her tea, hoping it would calm her nerves. She carried her cup back to the living room, Rob following behind. She curled up on the couch, wrapping one of the throws around her. Everything okay? Rob asked. Therese nodded, putting on a brave smile. I'm not a huge fan of the wind and the tree branches beating against the house. The sound always took her back to the day a tree crashed into her childhood home. We're going to be okay. He walked over to the couch and sat down next to her. This isn't any worse than the winds we get every winter up in New York. And these trees are used to it. He looked around the living room. What we need is something to do. A distraction. What do you do around here without power, he asked. Read, talk, play board games. Board games. Now there's an idea. Rob bent down to shuffle through the boxes stacked on the shelf below the coffee table. Our options are Scrabble, Monopoly, Candyland and Battleship. I loved playing this as a kid. What do you think? He held the box, depicting several naval combat vessels out to her, excitement sparkled in his eyes. How could she say no to that? I'll play, Therese agreed and sipped her tea while he pulled the game pieces out of the box and started to set up. Therese grabbed one of the oversized pillows and set it between them to hold the game. Rob's excitement was contagious. They played several rounds, Therese winning all but one. You are letting me win on purpose, she said after sinking yet another one of his ships. Why would I do that, he asked. You're beating me fair and square. The huge grin on his face belied his words. To take my mind off the hurricane? Therese had to admit, if it was his purpose, it worked. She felt more relaxed than she had all evening. Ha, huh, that's not a good enough reason to let you sink my fleet. He winked. Is it working? Possibly. He had distracted her, and for the past few hours, he'd extruded nothing but calm. He hadn't walked back to the window or commented on the waves. How do you do it? she asked. Do what? Stay so calm and work through the fear. Her heart beat faster, anxiety rising now that she was no longer distracted. Something large crashed onto the roof and Therese shrieked. Rob swiped the board game and pillow off the couch and pulled her into a hug. He wrapped his arms around her tightly. It's okay. Nothing happened. It was just a branch from one of the oak trees. We are fine. We are safe. Therese pulled herself together. I'm sorry, she said after pushing out of the hug. That was very unprofessional. She pushed her hair behind her ear and rubbed her hands together to warm them up. Her entire body felt chilled. Don't be ridiculous. You've gone above and beyond to take care of me on a daily basis. We made it through that shrimp incident together, we'll make it through this. As friends. Are you cold? He pulled a throw off the back of the couch and wrapped it around her. Wait here. I'll make you some more tea. He made his way to the kitchen with the help of his crutches and pulled a fresh cup from the cabinet. Therese? Yes. I didn't think this through. Hmm. I can't bring the cup to you. Oh, Therese looked up at Rob. He stood between the kitchen and the living room, his face turning red. I'll grab it. 
Did you make two cups? He nodded. Therese threw the blanket off and walked into the kitchen. Two cups of herbal tea sat on the counter. She moved them to a tray along with a jar of honey. Do you like oatmeal raisin cookies? she asked. I do. Good. Because Miss Doris sent some back with us in that basket. She dug through the hurricane supplies their neighbor had packed for them and put several of the cookies on a plate. They smelled freshly baked and delicious. It's okay to have our hurricane snacks now? Rob asked, a small smile playing around his mouth. Yep. When the power goes, the snacks come out. Not much else to do, and we have enough food for weeks. No need to ration. She put the tray on the coffee table and returned to her spot on the couch. Feeling better, he asked after she'd eaten a cookie and drank most of her tea. I am. I'm sorry about, earlier. Nothing to be sorry about. It's the adrenaline. The tea and the cookie should help you process it. He grabbed another cookie. These are really good. He was right. Miss Doris was an amazing baker. Therese should thank her and think of a way to return her kindness. Once they made it through the storm. Do you get used to it? Therese asked. Get used to what? The adrenaline rush. You race and climb and do all sorts of stuff to cause it on purpose. Does it feel different with practice? Rob was quiet for a moment, looking thoughtful. I don't think you get used to it. It's more like your attitude toward it changes. I look forward to it. It makes me feel alive. I don't try to avoid it. I face my fears head on. It's not always pleasant. She looked at his leg. That's not what I meant. Mentally, it's not always easy or fun to face those fears. But when you do and you make it through to the other side, the endorphin rush is something else. Therese nodded thinking back on the feeling of giddiness when they left the skywheel. Let's hope that feeling will carry us through however long this power outage lasts. Rob picked up his phone and set it back down. No cell reception. We're officially cut off. I think I saw an old weather radio, Therese said. She found it on the top shelf in the hall closet. She turned it on and they listened for a few minutes to the robotic voice relaying the latest storm information. So far so good, Therese said. It doesn't sound like the winds will get much stronger than this. A few more hours and we'll be through the worst of it. She was tired and curled back under the blanket. I think it's over, Rob said an hour later. He rose from the couch and made his way over to the window. The winds calmed down. I think I can even see a few stars. It's the eye of the storm. It'll be quiet for a little while, Therese said drowsily. She drifted in and out of sleep. Her eyes fluttered shut and the last thing she remembered was Rob sitting back down on the couch next to her. Daylight streamed in through the windows when Therese woke. Rob softly snored next to her. Her head was cradled up against his shoulder. His legs were propped up on the coffee table. The large throw she'd wrapped up with earlier in the night now covered them both. It was over. They'd made it through the storm. Therese lifted the blanket and got up, careful not to disturb Rob. It had been a long night. She couldn't believe they'd fallen asleep during the hurricane. At least she had. She wondered if Rob had stayed awake through the second half of the storm, watching over her. Part of her thought he might have. It was the only explanation for why she'd slept. She'd felt safe with him there. It was a nice feeling. Nice, but also a little unsettling. Therese almost dropped the cup she'd pulled from the kitchen cabinet when the phone rang. Apparently, the old landline was still in use. In the hustle and bustle yesterday, she'd forgotten to check. Hello? Sutton Residence. Therese Bowman speaking, she said, hoping the ring hadn't woken Rob. Therese, honey. It's Miss Doris. I'm calling to see how the two of you made it through the hurricane. Everything okay over there? 
Therese heard Sarah talking to baby Charlie in the background. Yes, we are fine. I haven't noticed any damage. We haven't ventured outside yet, though. How about you? Everything all right with you? The power is out and the yard is a mess, but other than that, we've made it through just fine. Baby Charlie slept through most of it. Didn't phase the little guy at all. Miss Doris laughed. I, on the other hand, didn't get a wink of sleep. I see a nap in my future now that I know you two are okay. Chapter 11 Any update on when power might be restored? Rob waited at the front door for Therese. With plenty of debris and sand covering the sidewalks and roads, she put her foot down and forbidden him to venture out to talk to the power company crew working a few blocks down the road. They aren't sure yet. A couple of big oaks are down at the next intersection. They can't work on the power lines until they find someone with equipment big enough to remove them safely. They are working as fast as they can. Any news about the power? Miss Doris called from next door and Therese relayed what information she had. Those poor men are working day and night. We should take them some food. I'm going to make some sandwiches. Miss Doris turned and started to walk back. We have more chips and Gatorade than we can get through even if the power's out for another week, Therese said. I'll pack some up. The two women made plans to meet back on the street in 20 minutes. I take it I'm not allowed to come with you, Rob grumbled. A little fresh air would do me good, you know. Tell you what. As soon as I get back, I'll clear off the back deck and put a chair out there. You can sit in the sun and watch the ocean. Therese rushed into the kitchen, pulling bottles and bags from the pantry and cabinets. Rob had to check himself to keep from sounding whiny. The problem was that he was sick and tired of sitting around doing nothing. Everyone else jumped into action, even without power. Everyone except him. He was stuck in the house. Doing nothing. Not something he was particularly good at. As soon as the roads are clear, we'll go for a drive, Therese said while packing the bottles into a large basket. I know this is rough on you. I'll be back as soon as I can. Maybe this will help make our road a priority. Hang in there. We will get back to normal. She headed to the front door. Your most important job is to stay off your leg and do everything you can to avoid re-injuring yourself. He knew that. Dr. Clark had made that point multiple times, including this morning when he'd called to check on Rob. Which had been nice. Unnecessary, but nice. He'd even set up a follow-up appointment for Rob in a few days to check on his progress and hopefully move him into a boot. Rob couldn't wait. He watched Therese leave through the front door when he heard the phone in the kitchen ring. Thank God. I've been trying your cell phone all morning. How are things down there? Are you guys okay? Any damage to the house? Brad sounded pretty worried. We're fine. The house is in good shape. There's sand everywhere and I heard what sounded like a large branch land on the roof. As far as I can tell from the inside, there's no damage, but we should probably get someone to take a look. Any other time I'd climb up there myself. Rob stared at his cast in disgust. Hey man, I'm just glad you're okay and that someone's at the house. I drive cat nuts any time a storm rolls through. I can't relax until I know my grandparents' place is still there. The house is fine. It may have some age to it, but it's solid. I'd send you some pictures, but so far, the power's still out. Yeah, it can take a while if a lot of trees are down. We might have to wait for a few days before coming down. They are supposed to reopen the airport in a few hours, but the roads down to Palmer are still closed. No sense in coming down until there's power. It'll get hot around here without air conditioning. Rob already felt the sweat beating on his forehead and it was only mid-morning. What number can I reach you at while I'm tied to this landline, he asked, before jotting down the numbers, Brad rattled off. Thanks for holding down the fort. I'll call someone local, to come look at the roof. You two sit tight. Rob grunted. 
People need to stop telling me to stay put. Brad laughed. Listen, I have to run. Hannah wants to go out for a ride. I'll check back in later. By the time Rob made his way into the living room, Therese was back. Those guys working on the power lines are amazing, she said. The crew working on our street came all the way from Alabama. They drove out here and have been working almost non-stop, don't even leave to grab food. They appreciated the lunch and the drinks. She walked over to the sink. Still no running water either. Brad called. They'll be down in a few days once the roads are clear and we have power. Therese nodded. They won't mind both of us staying here as well? Not at all. The house is plenty big enough, and I don't think they plan on staying long. He wants to check on the house and see for himself that it's okay. Have you heard from your parents yet? I called my mom this morning. They are fine. Looks like the worst of it went through just south of us. They didn't even lose power. Once the roads are open, we can head over there for showers and to hang out in air conditioning. Therese walked around the kitchen, what do you want to do today? Are you hungry? They spent most of the day sitting around the house reading, playing a few more rounds of Battleship and Scrabble, where Therese tried to insist that Liner was an actual word, and worked their way through a good portion of the snacks they'd bought. I'm going to go take a nap, Rob said out of sheer boredom. It was early afternoon, and he hadn't gotten more than a few hours of sleep. How's your leg? Therese asked, looking concerned. It's fine. No pain. The cast itches like crazy though. He was sweating and the heat and lack of shower didn't help. Hang on, I have an idea. Sit over here and put your leg up on the table. Therese pointed to the couch and he did as told. She grabbed a washcloth from the bathroom and wet it using some of their bottled water. She used it to wipe the area above his cast and as far as she could reach inside the cast before handing him a small bottle of hand sanitizer. The alcohol in this will help cool you off and hopefully take some of the itch away. He squirted some of the cool, clear liquid in his hand and applied it as far down into the cast area as he could reach. She was right. It did work. Therese walked into the bathroom with the wet washcloth and returned with two clean ones, handing one to him and using the other to wipe her face, her neck, and her arms. Rob followed suit. That's better, he said when he handed her the cloth. I might actually be able to nap. Thank you. You're welcome. Sleep well. He found Therese sitting on the back deck in the shade of one of the large oak trees that surrounded the house. She was reading, a bottle of water, beside her. Hey, how was your nap, she asked. Restful. I don't feel quite as on edge anymore, he said. The hour of sleep had done him good. Sorry about the grumpiness earlier. He lowered himself into the chair next to hers. Feels good out here. The breeze off the ocean was cool and much more pleasant than it had been in the house. Remind me to open the windows around the house. If we can get a good breeze flowing through it, it should cool the whole house down tonight. Therese put her book down. I'm glad you're feeling better. You look more rested and relaxed. What's that scent? he asked, picking up hints of lavender again. He still couldn't figure out what the secondary scent was. All he knew was that he liked it. It brought back feelings of being happy and safe and carefree. Oh, you can smell that? Out here? Too strong? Teresa's cheeks turned a lovely shade of pink. It's not strong at all. Just a hint of lavender and something else. It's lovely. Therese grabbed a small silver pendant he hadn't noticed before. It looked almost like a locket. I put on some essential oils. Lavender and grapefruit. It makes me feel a little cleaner and more like myself. It's a calming, refreshing blend. Grapefruit, he said softly, memories turning in his head. That explained it. That's a strange look. Therese sat up and looked right at him. It reminds me of someone. Someone I haven't thought of in a long time, he said. Tell me about this person. 
I have a feeling there's a great story there. She smiled at him encouragingly. I don't know if I've told you this. My mom passed away when I was two years old. My dad was busy running Marshall Mutual and hired a string of nannies to take care of me. I had no idea. I'm so sorry. That couldn't have been an easy way to grow up. Compassion lit her eyes and made it hard for him to continue. It was all I knew. Some of them were better than others. Bridget was by far my favorite. She'd take me out to play, read me books, and hug me. Eventually, my father decided she was coddling me and fired her. He shrugged. I remember her better than most of the others. She loved grapefruit. She'd eat half of one with brown sugar on top every morning and drink a glass of grapefruit juice every afternoon. And the essential oil blend reminded you of her. Of Bridget. Therese jangled her necklace and another wave of the pleasant scent hit him. I can give you some, if you'd like to wear it, or diffuse it. Diffuse, he asked. You don't know much about essential oils, do you? She asked with a small laugh. The basic idea is to evaporate them slowly. You can use a diffuser necklace or bracelet like this. It has a porous stone in the middle that holds a drop or two of the oil. As it evaporates, you get the scent. Or you can add it to different types of diffusers to spread the scent through a room. With a lot of them, you mix a few drops of oil with some water that's heated by a tea light. I've seen those. He'd come across quite a few of them in a store in Arizona that sold crystals, incense sticks, and the like. He'd been in search of a birthday gift for a friend who was a bit on the eccentric side and ended up with a Himalayan salt lamp and a Tree of Life necklace. Therese would probably have liked the necklace too. He didn't think it worked with essential oils though. Tell me more about growing up. The rest of the nannies weren't as nice as Bridget, she asked. Where did you grow up? New York? Rob nodded. My family owns a brownstone not far from Central Park. My father spent most of his time there, close to the office. But not you? Therese asked, curiously. No. He thought I was too much of a distraction. I was raised at the Marshall Country Estate in upstate New York. He laughed dryly. My father said it was more suited for a young boy, out in the fresh air and the wide open fields. Sounds pretty lonely. It was. Most of the time it was me, the nanny, a cook, and a couple of people who worked around the house. I didn't spend much time around other kids my age until I started boarding school. That was a bit of a shock. It had also made him realize how isolated and lonely he'd been. The first year had been rough. After that, he'd figured out how to interact with his schoolmates. And he'd discovered the thrill of playing football, baseball, and everything else that got his adrenaline pumping. How did you meet Brad? My father did business with his. We went out to Phoenix for a few different events and meetings. Evelyn, Brad's mother, would put me together with her kids. Pete's closer to me in age, but Brad and I got along from the start. We stayed in touch over the years, and I went out to Arizona for college. He's been trying to keep me from killing myself ever since. Rob looked up and saw Teresa's stunned and confused look. Nothing like that. I wasn't depressed or anything. Just a bit of an adrenaline junkie. Therese coughed and hid a smile behind the hand covering her mouth. Okay. I am an adrenaline junkie. I like the way it makes me feel. There are other ways to feel alive and happy, Therese said, a small smile playing around that pretty mouth of hers. Rob? He walked into the kitchen. Therese had the old-fashioned landline phone in one hand, covering the receiver with the other. How would you feel about a drive up to Sam and Jason's golf course in Myrtle Beach? We could get a hot meal, sit in air conditioning, and maybe even get a hot shower. She looked excitedly up at him. Works for me, he said, hiding a smile. Her excitement was contagious, and truth be told, he was more than ready to get out of the house for a little while. Electricity would be an added bonus. Yes, dinner tonight sounds perfect, Therese said. 
We'll see you guys in an hour. She hung up the phone. I can't wait to get out of here. Let's get ready. They cleaned up as best they could without running water or power and headed out to the car 20 minutes later. Oh no, Therese said when she opened the door. It's soaked. I don't know how this happened. He looked around the car. All windows were tightly closed. Did you have any trouble with the sliding roof? It hasn't worked since I bought the car, but it's never leaked if that's what you're asking. She leaned into the car for a closer look. And the floor looks wetter than the seats. Maybe if we sit on some towels? Rob looked around the ground. There was still a good bit of water and plenty of sand sitting around the car. Try to start it, he said. She climbed in and turned the key. Nothing. Shaking her head, Therese tried again. What's going on? I think enough water rushed under the house to flood this area. He took another look and realized she'd parked in the lowest spot of the lot. Can you look under the car? Does it look wet? Or is there salt and sand stuck? She climbed out of the car and looked under it. No water, but yes, there's sand and salt everywhere. You think it flooded from below? He nodded. And ruined my engine. My car. Therese stood back up and brushed the sand off her jeans. This isn't good. We're stuck and I'm without a car. She looked like she was on the verge of tears. We'll have someone look at it as soon as we can find a garage that's open. Okay. That's not helping us right now though. He was with her there. He looked forward to getting out of the house, off the island, and to seeing Sam and Jason again. Maybe we can call for a ride? Everything okay over here? Miss Doris walked up, carrying Charlie on her hip. Car trouble, Rob said. It may have flooded the engine during the worst of the storm. Oh no. And you two had plans to go somewhere? We're supposed to meet Sam and Jason for dinner up at the golf course, Therese said, disappointment in her voice. Any other time or place, he could have had a new car bought for her in less than an hour. But now, his hands were tied. He didn't like feeling helpless. And this time it didn't have anything to do with his broken leg. Why don't you take my car? Miss Doris said. Sarah and Ryan went up to check on their house. They should be back in the next little bit here. Are you sure you wouldn't mind? And you definitely won't need it? Therese asked. We'd only be gone for a couple of hours. And we could bring you back anything you need from up there. Sam said they have power and most stores and restaurants are open. That's kind of you, but I think we are fine. I have plenty of everything. Miss Doris moved Charlie from one hip to the other. Except maybe a couple of bags of ice. For the cooler. You've got it. Ice is actually a good idea. Teresa's entire face lit up. It's a deal then. You two are taking my Oldsmobile. I'll get you the keys. Therese looked down at her jeans. Let me run in and change into a clean pair of pants. Why don't we meet you over there in a couple of minutes? It didn't take long to get on the road. No wonder the power is still out, Rob said, looking out of the passenger seat window. Miss Doris's Oldsmobile had quite a bit more legroom than Teresa's Prius. It made the ride with the cast more comfortable. Do you want to take a shower before dinner? You're welcome to use the locker rooms here in the club, or I can give you a ride to our house, Sam said when they arrived at the club. Do we smell that bad? Rob asked. Not at all. I just figured. With the power outage and all. A shower would be very nice. Thank you. Therese smiled at Sam. I'll grab some clean clothes from the car. Do you want some help? Can't be easy to shower with that cast, Jason said. Yeah, that might not be a bad idea. If you don't mind. Not at all. I broke my leg playing ball in high school. What I remember most is how itchy it got and how impossible it was to keep the cast dry and myself somewhat clean. 
Sam and Jason walked them to the locker rooms when Therese returned. Hang on, I have an idea. He ducked into the kitchen and returned a minute later with a trash bag and a couple of rubber bands. This should keep the cast pretty dry. The bag worked well and Rob felt great after the shower. Wearing a fresh shirt and shorts, he joined Therese, Sam, and Jason for an early dinner on the patio overlooking the golf course. A crew of maintenance workers combed the grounds, picking up falling limbs and blowing leaves off the green. Did the storm do much damage up here, he asked Jason. No, we got lucky. We lost power for a few hours, but no major damage. We'll have the course up and running in the morning. They chatted about Sam and Jason's plan for Willow Run over dinner. That sounds ambitious. I had no idea. Therese sipped her sweet tea. When are you closing the golf course down? At the end of the year. We're working on restoring some of the grounds around the fairways to their natural state already and the first few guest cottages will be ready by spring break. They'll run on solar power and we're using as many recycled and easily renewable materials as possible in the construction. Your dad has been coming up with all sorts of cool ideas for landscaping, Sam said. Clever, turning the golf course property into an eco-resort, Rob said. You're attracting a different crowd. And it's something this area could use more of. We didn't have much of a choice. The golf course wasn't viable for much longer. I'm hoping the resort will be something we can pass down to our kids. Jason looked around the sprawling landscape. It'll take some work, but I think it'll be worth it in the end. Kids? Therese sounded surprised. Is there something you want to tell me? She looked at Jason, eyes wide and eyebrows raised. Not yet, Sam said, putting a hand on Therese's. So far, the kids are theoretical. Please don't mention anything to Jean. Jason's mom is bugging us about grandkids enough as it is. Therese laughed. I can see that. No worries. My lips are sealed. Don't mention it to your mom either, Jason said, looking worried. Of course not. Therese turned to Rob. My mom is a bit of a gossip and my dad works here. If I tell her, Jean will know about it before the end of the day. She turned back to Jason and Sam. Your secret is safe with me. This salmon is delicious, by the way. The food was amazing. The fact that they hadn't had a hot meal for three days probably helped, but there was no denying that Willow Run employed an amazing chef. We'd better head back, Therese said an hour later. They'd hung out in the clubhouse with Sam and Jason as long as they could, enjoying the air conditioning and various creature comforts he'd taken for granted. Like running water, working internet, and a working cell phone to name a few. I don't want to leave Miss Doris without a car for too long. Why are you driving Miss Doris's car? Sam asked. Mine got flooded in the storm. Teresa's shoulders slumped and her eyes went to the ground. Oh no. Let me know if you need someone to look at it. Brad knows a couple of places on the island that do good work. I have it covered, Rob said. Therese looked up at him in surprise. We'll talk about it later, he said. We should get on the road. What do you mean you have it covered? Therese asked as soon as they pulled out onto the highway leading back to Palmer Island. I made some phone calls. One of my mechanics has a friend down here who will come take a look at the car tomorrow. If it's salvageable, he'll tow it to his shop. You didn't have to do that. I know I didn't have to. I wanted to. Besides, I have a doctor's appointment next week. It's in my best interest to make sure you have a working vehicle. He shrugged and they both felt silent for a while. Thank you, Therese said. Hey, that's the pier in Garden City up ahead. Do you want to stop for some ice cream if they are open? Maybe walk out on the pier? Rob regretted that he'd agreed when he saw the flight of stairs he'd have to climb on his crutches to get up to the pier. The elevator on the side of the building was out of order. Hang on, Therese said before running off around the side of the building. She was back in a flash. Come this way. There's a ramp. 
it'll be easier to get up than these steep steps. She was right. The wheelchair ramp made it easy to get up to the pier. They picked up ice cream cones at the little cafe tucked into the corner of the tackle shop and arcade before walking out onto the actual pier. Lick, Therese said, holding his ice cream cone out to him when the chocolate chip and peanut butter cup he'd ordered started to melt. They slowly made their way to the end of the pier, stopping every so often for ice cream breaks. We probably look like a couple on their honeymoon, Rob said when he noticed glances and smiles from other visitors. The sun was low on the horizon, bathing the beach and the ocean in a golden light. Therese turned, both ice cream cones in her hands. Hey, watch it. She almost smeared the chocolate cone all over his white button-down shirt. Oops. Sorry. She pulled the cone closer. I think you're right. I guess we do make a cute couple. The remark was offhand, and he knew she didn't mean anything by it, but hearing her refer to them as a couple did something to him. He could see it. He could see them walking hand in hand on the beach. He itched to pull her close and run his fingers through those wild curls of hers. The lack of hair care products at the club and the high humidity in the air after the storm made them curl even more than usual. She'd taken to pulling it back in a quick ponytail, but tonight her hair was down, and the golden locks danced in the ocean breeze. I think there are a couple of benches at the end of the pier. Do you want to go sit down? It might give us a chance to finish this ice cream before it melts. He nodded, his voice too thick to speak, and they headed further down the pier. Two sets of benches sat on either end, and he lowered himself down on one of them. Therese sat down next to him and handed him his ice cream cone. Thanks. They sat next to each other, finishing their ice cream while watching the waves roll in. Put your leg up. Therese stood up and pointed to the vacant part of the bench. You've been on your feet a long time. Elevate it for a bit before we get back in the car. He did as asked, but his leg took up most of the bench. Therese stood next to him, arms wrapped around herself. Cold, he asked. I'm sure it's just the ice cream. I'll be fine in a minute. The wind blowing her skirt around. The thin blouse she wore didn't provide much protection from the air either. It's gotten chilly, he said. With the setting sun, the air temperature had dropped significantly. The breeze coming off the water cooled his exposed skin. He put his good leg on the ground. Come sit. He motioned to the spot in front of him. I'm fine, she said, wrapping her arms around herself tightly. You're freezing. Come sit. If you're making me rest my leg, the least I can do is keep you warm. He grabbed her hand and pulled her closer. She relented and sat down, snuggling into his chest. Wrapping his arms around her, Rob had a hard time keeping his breath steady. She felt good in his arms. Right. Like this was where she belonged. The faint scent of lavender and grapefruit still clung to her, though he saw no sign of the pendant she'd worn before. Better, he asked. Therese nodded and sighed contently. Yes. This is nice. She turned and smiled that dazzling smile of hers. Holding his breath, he lowered his head, drawn to her mouth like it had its own gravity field. Everything around him faded into the background until all he saw were those sparkling blue eyes and her raspberry pink lips. Her eyes held his gaze. She wasn't stopping him. Instead, he sensed anticipation in her own held breath. Beautiful night, isn't it? Rob's head jerked back at the comment from an older gentleman strolling up the pier and Therese stood quickly, tucking her hair behind her ears. Yes, it's beautiful, she said quickly before turning to face him. I think we should head back. Miss Doris will be waiting. Chapter 12 You bought a car? A brand new Prius? Therese looked stunned when the man from the car dealership handed her a key. Kurt looked at yours yesterday and didn't think it was worth trying to rebuild the engine. And you needed a car. Rob shrugged, as if it were no big deal. Here's the title, ma'am. The young man in a light gray suit handed her a folder. Tax, title, and tags are taken care of. 
Enjoy the car. My card is in there if you have any questions. He turned and walked to the company car that had followed him to the house. Therese opened the folder and glanced at the paperwork. It has my name on it. Of course it does. It's your car. Rob didn't understand why she was making such a big deal about this. You bought me a car. A brand new car. Why? I told you. You need one to drive me around. This isn't right. You can't just buy me a car. Especially not a brand new Prius. How much did this cost? She looked panicked. I'm not sure. We can call if you really want to know. Of course I want to know. Her tone went from worried to angry. How else am I going to pay you back? That's when it hit him. She was worried about going further into debt to pay for the new car. You're not paying me back. I'm the reason you were here instead of at your parents' house during the hurricane. I'm the reason your car flooded. The least I can do is replace it. You didn't have to replace it with a brand new model, she said. Her tone was softer, less angry. He knew he had her. Rob shrugged. The new model has more legroom on the passenger side. Can't blame me for wanting to be comfortable. Plus, it was faster to get a new car here than to try to find a decent used one. He pointed at the keys in her hand. Can we drop this and take it for a spin? We're due for some more ice anyway if you don't want the stuff in the cooler to spoil. Therese looked at her watch. There isn't really time for it before your doctor's appointment. Why don't you get ready for that and we'll leave a little early and make a lap around the island. Might give us an idea of the damage the rest of the area has suffered. Good idea. Give me a couple of minutes to change. He rushed as fast as his crutches would allow. Rob couldn't believe he'd forgotten about his doctor's appointment. This was the big one. The one that would decide if he'd be stuck in the cast for a few more weeks or if he could use a boot that would allow him to move around more easily. He was in the car, hair wet, teeth brushed, and wearing a fresh button-down shirt, within minutes. Therese laughed at his eagerness. I've never seen you this excited to make a doctor's appointment. The last time, I had to drag you there kicking and screaming. She drove across the island, fiddling with the dials and settings on the dash. How does it drive, he asked, trying not to be too obvious about watching the reactions that showed plain as day on her face. Like a dream, she beamed. Does it have built-in Bluetooth? Looks like it. Do you want me to hook up your phone? Yes, please. It's in my purse. It sat right at the top. Rob grabbed it and turned on the screen. He had to suppress a chuckle. Your friend Miriam wants to know how cute I am and would like a picture. Teresa's face turned bright red. She didn't say a word. Glad you think I'm cute. Say cheese. He held the phone out and snapped a quick pic of the two of them before sending it off. That's a good picture of us. Mind if I send it to myself? He didn't wait for her reply. I hope he has good news for me. Rob said while they waited for the doctor. His assistant had taken a new set of x-rays that would help Dr. Clark determine if Rob was ready for a boot. Therese could feel the tension in the air. She was anxious for him herself. I'm sure he does. You've done well and you haven't been in nearly as much pain lately. I'm sure the leg is healing well and getting strong enough to bear some weight. Therese took his hand in hers, surprised how cold it was. He was usually the steady one, the one calming her down and helping her work through anxiety and fear. And no matter what he says, you'll be fine. Being stuck with those crutches for another week or two would be annoying, but it wouldn't be the end of the world. We'll get through this, no matter what he says today. She squeezed his hand encouragingly when the door opened and Dr. Clark stepped in. He put the x-rays up on a backlit board. I brought your old x-rays in to show you the difference. You've made some amazing progress. Here's your break when you first saw your doctor in Arizona a month ago. He pointed out the area of the fracture, still clearly visible in the image. 
and here it is today. You didn't need years of medical school to see the difference. Therese smiled at Rob encouragingly. That's looking pretty good to me, she said. Rob nodded and kept quiet. I agree. I think you've healed enough for us to fit you with a boot. The doctor looked at Rob, a stern expression on his face. I know you're ready to be more mobile. It's important that you take it easy. Go slow at first, and if there's any discomfort, rest. If there's any pain, even just a little, I want you to call me. He turned and looked at Therese. Can I count on your help to keep him from overdoing it and re-injuring himself, he asked. I'll do my best. Therese smiled and looked from the doctor to Rob and back. I think Rob understands that his leg is going to take some time to fully heal. I think the past few weeks have taught him a good deal of patience and about the limits of his body. I don't think he'll push the boundaries too far. I won't. Whatever it takes to avoid going back in this cast. It's coming off today? Rob asked, a reluctant glimmer of hope in his eyes. Therese wondered if he was tempering his hopes. It's coming off right now. Take a seat up there and I'll send someone in to cut it off. We'll have you in a boot before you leave. The doctor rose. I recommend hanging on to those crutches for a few days. Use them in conjunction with the boot until you get comfortable putting your full body weight on the leg. Remember, your muscles have been taking it easy while your bones were healing. It'll take some time to build them back up. It didn't take long for the cast to come off. Therese helped him clean his injured leg before the doctor returned to adjust and fit the boot. Rob cautiously scooted off the examination table and put both feet on the ground. Go ahead and put a little weight on the boot, Dr. Clark encouraged. It won't snap. I promise. It was the most cautious Therese had seen Rob in their time together. It works. The pure joy on Rob's face when he was able to stand on his own two feet without the aid of crutches, a chair, or her shoulder, took Therese's breath away. Any pain or discomfort? Dr. Clark asked. Rob shook his head. It feels strange. A little unstable maybe. But no pain. Good. The doctor grabbed the crutches. Try walking on it. Take some of the weight off with these and use them to stabilize yourself. Rob did as asked, moving across the room like a pro. Slow and cautious, but there were no signs of pain or discomfort on his face. Looking good, the doctor exclaimed. Stick with both crutches for a day or two. Then, try cutting back to just one. It won't hurt anything to use them longer if that's more comfortable. The most important thing to remember is that your leg still needs time to heal. Rest and elevate it as much as possible and call me if there's any discomfort. Rob nodded, taking the doctor's advice seriously. Therese hoped she wouldn't have to remind him of it too often once he got comfortable and gained confidence in his leg and the boot. Get out of here you two, and enjoy this beautiful day. It was a nice day. Sunny and not too hot. The way it often was after a big storm roared through the area. It felt like the weather was trying to make up for the destruction it had wreaked. What would you like to do? Therese asked when they got to the car. She took his crutches and put them in the back seat. Honestly? I wouldn't mind checking into a hotel up here, take another shower, and sit in air conditioning for a while. Would you mind? That actually sounds amazing. I know, just the place. She pulled out of the parking lot and headed up to the ancient mariner. Nice place, Rob said when they pulled into the valet parking lot of the popular resort. The foyer was open and airy, full of tropical plants, with a tall glass ceiling above. Several restaurants and shops were spread out across the ground floor. She couldn't begin to guess how many floors the building was high, but there had to be several hundred rooms in this building alone. Therese Bowman for Ryan Beckheim. Is he available? She asked the friendly receptionist. You're in luck. He just came in. Are you a friend of his? More of an acquaintance. I know Miss Doris, his. Therese wasn't sure how to describe Sarah's great aunt. 
Of course. One moment, please. The woman picked up the phone and had a brief conversation. He'll be right down. If you want to wait over there, the chairs are quite comfortable, she said looking at Rob. What are you guys doing here? Ryan asked when he joined them in one of the plush seating areas a little while later. You own this place? Rob looked surprised, and Therese had to suppress a giggle. She couldn't believe he hadn't put it together when she'd asked for Ryan. My family does. I run the day-to-day -day operation. What brings you up here? Everything okay with the house? Everything's fine. We were hoping to rent a room if you're not booked up. Therese looked at him hopefully. Shouldn't be a problem. Let me see what's available. He rose and Therese started to follow him. Rob put a hand on her arm to stop her. Would you mind grabbing me some water and get my pills out of the car? My leg is getting a little sore. Of course. She looked at him carefully. He didn't look like he was in a lot of pain. Maybe he'd gotten better at hiding it. She'd have to keep a close eye on him the rest of the day. Maybe spending the next few hours close to the doctor's office and other medical care facilities wasn't such a bad idea. Too bad they hadn't brought a change of clothes like they had when they'd gone up to see Sam and Jason. They could have gotten two rooms and stayed the night. I'll come with you, Rob said to Ryan and the two men walked to the reception desk. Shaking her head, Therese headed out to the valet station in search of her car. By the time she returned with the pills and a bottle of water, Rob was waiting for her back in the seating area. Ryan was nowhere to be seen. Her heart sank. Maybe the hotel was booked. Trying not to let disappointment show on her face, she handed Rob the water and started to open the bottle of ibuprofen. It can wait. Let's head up to our room, Rob said, a huge grin on his face. Ryan hooked us up. Hooking them up was an understatement. Therese gasped when she opened the door and stepped into a large suite with what looked like two bedrooms, a kitchenette, and a large sitting area. It had a small dining area, a large desk, and an amazing view of the Atlantic Ocean. This is amazing. She spun around, trying to take it all in. She turned to Rob. This has got to be a mistake. I'll call down to the front desk. No mistake. I asked if one of their executive suites was available and it just so happened to be free tonight. He grinned shamelessly. We can't do that. We can't take advantage of Ryan like that. Therese felt heat creeping up her neck and into her cheeks. We're not taking advantage of him. I insisted on paying the regular rate for the rooms. I'm sure he's lost a good bit of business with tourists cancelling trips because of the hurricane. Thankfully, the resort didn't have any major damage. The pools are closed until tomorrow though. As if she'd even considered a dip into the pool. She hadn't brought a bathing suit for one. Plus, it would be rude for her to go for a swim in the pool when Rob was stuck beside the pool or in the room. This room. This large suite that he'd paid for. You didn't have to do that, she said, unable to keep the longing out of her voice. She walked through the space and into one of the bedrooms. She almost moaned at the sight of the large tub in the ensuite bathroom. A soak in there would be heavenly. Though, she should probably rinse all the sweat and grime off first. It's a done deal. Go take a shower, soak in the tub. I'll order us some lunch. Rob said, perusing the room service menu. Therese turned and headed for one of the bedrooms. Wait. We didn't bring clean clothes. There's a bathrobe in the closet. Leave your clothes by the door and I'll send them out for dry cleaning. Unless you'd rather go shopping first. He raised an eyebrow. Dry cleaning seemed extravagant, but desperate times called for desperate measures. And there was no way she was skipping a soak in that tub. Relaxing in the warm bubble bath was heavenly. By the time Therese re-emerged wrapped in the hotel's fluffy bathrobe, her wet hair in a towel turban, she felt like a new person. It'll be a while before our clothes are back. I had them send up some stuff from one of the shops downstairs. 
Rob held a paper bag with a logo of one of the boutiques she'd spotted in the lobby stamped on it. I hope this fits. Therese pulled a simple but elegant linen dress out of the bag. Oh! This is beautiful. Go try it on. Rob said. She noticed he was wearing clean clothes as well. Dressed in a pair of khaki shorts and a dark blue button-down shirt with the sleeves rolled up, he looked nice. Dressier than she'd seen him aside from their dinner date with Sam and Jason. His hair was damp, making it appear darker and he hadn't bothered to shave. She kind of liked the five o'clock shadow on him. Therese tried to find a price tag on the dress, without any luck. She should have known better. Rob would have made sure there was no indication to how much this dress had set him back. It wasn't that expensive, Rob grumbled. Go put it on so we can eat. Only then did Therese notice the tray of food on the small dining room table. Several covered dishes sat on it, along with a large pitcher of what looked like iced tea, glasses, plates, and silverware. Her stomach grumbled at the sight of the food. Without wasting a second thought on the missing price tag of the dress, she rushed into the bedroom and slipped into it. It was a perfect fit, hugging her curve softly. A thin leather belt gave the dress shape, and it went well with the leather sandals she'd worn. Slipping into the shoes and running a comb through her hair to untangle the curls, she was back in the main living area of the suite within minutes. Thanks to the air conditioning, her hair should dry on its own. She'd worry about taming her curls after lunch. I wasn't sure what you were in the mood for, Rob said, pointing at the covered food. We can order something else. Therese walked up and pulled the metal covers off the plates. I love crab cakes, she said, then laughed when her stomach grumbled again. There were several salads, cold roast beef sandwiches, and an entire tray of raw oysters on ice. I skipped the shrimp, Rob said as he made his way over to the table. Good thinking. Therese doubted she'd have shrimp in any form for a while. This is perfect. Way too much food for the two of us, but everything looks delicious. Between the two of them, they made a serious dent in the food. Therese felt stuffed and happier than she had been in days by the time she rolled the cart out to the hallway. What do you want to do now? We've got all day to enjoy the amenities. Rob looked at her expectantly. You could head down to the spa, get a massage. Honestly? I think I'm ready to chill in the room. Maybe take a nap? She didn't want to sound ungrateful, but the idea of doing much of anything seemed almost impossible. Want to watch a movie, he asked, pointing to the large screen mounted to the wall opposite a narrow couch. Therese glanced at it and the chairs grouped around. It's going to be hard for you to elevate your leg and get comfortable, she said, looking around. We could watch it in one of the bedrooms. She swallowed hard, hoping he wouldn't get the wrong idea. Not a bad idea. Go grab some pillows off your bed, he said, already heading into his room. He'd settled on top of the covers, several pillows propped up behind him, and both legs stretched out in front of him, by the time she arrived. Get comfortable, he said before turning on the TV and scrolling through the channels. How about this, he asked when they landed on a travel show about Hawaii. Have you ever been? Therese shook her head. This looks great. I'd love to go sometimes. How about you? I went a couple of years ago with some friends. We hiked up to one of the volcanoes. Amazing trip. I'd love to go back, but somehow it's never seemed to be the right time. They watched the show in companionable silence. Rob spoke up once when the area he'd visited was covered. That's the volcano, right there. The program featured an aerial view of an active volcano that occasionally sent small streams of molten lava down the mountainside. I didn't realize it was active. Wasn't that dangerous, she asked, turning over on her side to watch Rob. He shrugged. We hired an experienced guide, but yes, there was a chance we'd be in the wrong place at the wrong time. It was part of the appeal. And we got some awesome pictures. He put his arm behind his head, leaning further back to relax. Therese rolled on her back and snuggled into the pillows. She pulled the throw from the foot of the bed over herself and settled in to watch the rest of the show. 
The next thing she remembered was waking up snuggled against Rob's side. He was softly snoring. Smiling, she adjusted the blanket to cover both of them and drifted back to sleep. The next time she awoke, Rob was looking at her, a smile playing around his lips. Hey there, sleepyhead. Ready to get up? Teresa's cheeks warmed. Sorry. She murmured. For what? We both needed a nap. He pulled the blanket off himself and swung his legs off the bed. Coffee, he asked. Instead of making a pot in the room, he picked up the phone and ordered it from room service along with a tray of cookies. I have a bit of a sweet tooth, he admitted sheepishly. I noticed. I was there for the pie-eating contest, remember? She laughed. You've been surprisingly good, even through the hurricane, and lunch was pretty healthy, all things considered. I think you can get away with a couple of cookies with your coffee. They carried their afternoon treat out on the balcony and spent a pleasant hour watching people on the beach. Their suite up on the sixth floor was close enough to be able to make out who was combing the sand and playing in the waves, but high enough up to enjoy a great view across the ocean. Do you like sushi? Rob asked. I do. What did you have in mind? Therese looked at him across her coffee cup. Room service had delivered a silver carafe of steaming hot coffee and two beautiful china cups to serve it in. She was a little nervous about dropping it out on the balcony and held on to the cup itself in addition to the delicate little handle. There's a sushi restaurant on site. Ryan said it's amazing. They hired a chef from Japan to run it. I was wondering if you'd like to try it out for dinner. Therese hesitated for a moment. We don't have to. It was just a thought. It sounds lovely. I'm just worried about driving back to the island in the dark with debris still covering some of the roads, she said. Why don't we plan on spending the night here, he asked. The suite is paid for, and we'd both sleep better here than on the island without power. We can call Miss Doris in the morning to see how things are looking and go from there. It wasn't a bad idea. And he was right. They would be more comfortable here. Sleeping with the boot was uncomfortable enough for him without the lack of air conditioning. There was no good reason why they shouldn't spend the night. There were two perfectly good bedrooms after all. In that case, sushi sounds perfect. Therese smiled and rose to pour herself another cup of coffee. Looking down at her dress she groaned. What's wrong? Rob looked up, sounding concerned. My dress. I should not have napped in this. It's completely wrinkled. Rob laughed. It's a good look on you. Especially with your bed hair. Her hands flew to her head. It's not that bad. And there's a handheld steamer in the closet next to the iron. I'm sure that will take the wrinkles right out. These are for you, Rob said when Teresa emerged from her bedroom. Her dress was wrinkle-free, and he wasn't sure what she'd done, but her hair hung in soft golden waves around her face. It had been cute in a messy, wild kind of way earlier, but now she looked stunning, wearing nothing more than a little mascara and lip gloss from the looks of it. They are beautiful. Her smile lit up the room. You didn't have to get me flowers. And how did you know that sunflowers are my favorite, she asked. I wanted to and lucky guess. He grinned, happy he'd guessed correctly when he'd noticed that a picture of sunflowers was the background image on her phone's home screen. Let me find something to put these in. She headed to the kitchenette and found a glass vase in one of the cabinets. She lingered at the coffee table she'd set them on before turning back to him. Ready if you are, she said, looking happy and relaxed. Let's go, he said and held an arm out to her. Since they didn't have far to walk, he opted to use only one crutch to help take some of the weight off the boot. She laughed softly and put her arm in his before pulling the door open. Rob liked walking through the lobby with Therese on his arm. Pride filled his chest when he caught a glimpse of the two of them in the mirrors that lined the elevator. Once they reached the lobby, it was a short stroll to Oishis. We have a reservation. Marshall for two. Rob told the hostess when they walked in. 
she walked them to a private booth, tucked into a corner of the restaurant, and handed them each a menu. What looks good? Therese asked, glancing through the offerings. Do you trust me, he asked, unable to keep the grin off his face. Um, sure. Why? Enough to be a little adventurous for dinner? Okay. She looked a little apprehensive. Is there anything you're allergic to or anything you're not willing to try? Therese looked thoughtful for a moment, then shook her head. When their waitress arrived with two tall glasses of ice water, he was ready. Sushi for two, chef's choice. Ask him to make it interesting. Oh, and a bottle of sake please. I've never had sake, Therese admitted. It's a bit of an acquired taste, he said, pouring her a small cup of the warm rice wine. See how you like it. He watched her take a small sip. Her eyes flew open and her lips tightened. She put the achoco down. Not my favorite, she admitted. The sushi chef came to their table when the food arrived. He gave them a quick rundown of what he'd prepared. It was an interesting mix of familiar favorites like eel and dragon roll, and a bit of fried vegetable tempura on the side, along with an impressive offering of 15 different nijirai bites of fresh fish flown in from Japan, and several hand rolls including two amazing-looking tuna rolls. I suggest you start with the nijirai, the chef suggested. Enjoy, he said before rushing back to the kitchen. Rob motioned for Therese to start. Don't overthink it, he said with a smile. We can always order more. You have got to be kidding. There's enough food here, for a family of six. She picked up her chopsticks and chose one of the nigri. Eel from the looks of it. MMM. He chose a bit of his own. The fish was fresh and perfectly cut. The fish to rice ratio made for a nice balance between the flavor of the salmon and the starchiness of the grain. There was just a hint of spiciness from the wasabi and the soy sauce he dipped the piece in, which gave it the umami taste so unique to a great piece of fresh sushi. I can't eat another bite, Therese said. They'd made an impressive dent in the offerings the chef had brought to the table. Rob couldn't resist another tuna hand roll, his personal favorite. What did you like best, he asked. The dragon roll, she said after giving it some thought. I'm a sucker for avocado, she admitted. Everything was excellent though. I'd have it all again. Except for the sake. It felt strange walking back to the suite together after their dinner date. They had gone to dinner late and lingered for a long time at the table, both reluctant for the evening to end. I think I'm going to head straight to bed, Therese said when they stepped into the suite. He nodded and walked with her to her bedroom door. Thank you for having dinner with me, he said hoarsely when she turned. He raised his hand and brushed a lock of her hair back. It felt soft and silky in his hand and he heard her breath catch. Thank you, she said softly. It was lovely. She didn't move, didn't turn back to open the door. Hoping for the best, he slowly lowered his head and brushed his lips across hers. When she didn't back away or ask him to stop, he captured her mouth with his, finally tasting those soft, raspberry lips he hadn't been able to keep his eyes off all night. It had been torture watching her laugh, sigh, and raise piece after piece of sushi to that pretty mouth of hers. All he'd been able to think about was how much he wanted to kiss her. Turned out, it was even better than he'd imagined. He had no idea how long they stood there kissing, Teresa's back pressed against the bedroom door, his hand wrapped in her hair, both more than a little breathless when he raised his head. Her eyes were soft and another small sigh left her lips. Good night, he said before gently kissing her on the forehead. Good night. She opened the door behind her and just like that, she was gone. The perfect end to the perfect night, he mused as he slowly made his way to his own room. Chapter 13 Slowly but surely, life went back to normal. Or as normal as it could get when you worked for a billionaire hotshot sidelined by a fracture who hobbled along in his walking boat. At least the power was back on. When Therese had called Miss Doris Wednesday morning from the hotel, the older woman had assured her that everything was back up and running. The beach access at the south end will be closed for a while, but the roads are clear and the power is back on, 
she had said before offering to run next door to turn the air conditioning on. Therese had gladly taken her up on the offer. By the time she and Rob had enjoyed their breakfast, she still dreamed of those flaky croissants, and made it back to the island, the house was cool and the entire refrigerator cleaned out. Therese had told the kind woman it had been unnecessary, but all Miss Doris had done was wave her off and insisted they join her for dinner. I could use the company, she'd said. Sarah, Ryan, and the baby are back at their own house. Since then, Therese had given the entire kitchen a good cleaning, caught up on laundry, and restocked the fridge and pantry with plenty of fresh, healthy food. And a few sweet treats, for Rob. The two of them had settled into a comfortable routine of PT appointments, board games, and the occasional brief walk on the beach. And to her surprise, there had been no more nightmares about Gambia. Hey, how do you feel about a little field trip? Rob asked, walking into the kitchen. He'd gotten good at getting around with his boot, using one of the crutches to take the pressure off a leg and keep his balance. What did you have in mind, she asked, while washing the last of the breakfast dishes. I just got off the phone with my friend Tony. He's down here for a race at the Myrtle Beach Speedway. He invited us out to check out his car and meet his crew. He looked excited. Sure. I wouldn't mind getting away for the day. She had no idea what types of cars they raced or what to expect really. Wear sunscreen and bring a hat, Rob said. The sun gets pretty intense out on the track. Therese stood in front of her closet, trying to decide what to wear. She had no idea what the social etiquette of a place like that was. She assumed casual and ended up pulling on a pair of denim shorts and a dark red peasant blouse with three-quarter sleeves that would provide some protection from the sun. Her favorite Willow Run baseball cap, left over from her days of working summer jobs on the course, completed the outfit. Cute, Rob remarked as they headed out to the car. The new Prius was a dream to drive and took a lot less time to charge than her older model. An hour and a half later, they were at the track. It's a late model stock car race, he'd explained on the drive up. They are similar to NASCAR cars. He'd gone into a lot of detail on the differences between a late model and NASCAR stock cars and what made this a particularly challenging race, but most of that had been lost on Therese. They'd come up early to meet up with Rob's friend and team owner, Tony Griffin. The place already hopped with racers, mechanics, and a few spectators. Therese trailed behind the two men, only half listening as they made their way to the garage where Tony's team prepared for the race. Rob, I didn't know you were down here. A young man in his early twenties, wearing a race suit, jogged up. What happened? Crashed. Broke my leg. Rob shrugged. The car looked worse. Racing? No, I overdid it during a test run. That's what I get for thinking I know better than my drivers. Rob grinned, enjoying the banter and shop talk. Therese couldn't believe how many people he knew as they walked around the track. Come on. You're one of the best drivers out there. Definitely the best owner driver. Aside from me, of course. The tall blonde had a cocky smile that was part arrogant, part charming. If he wasn't so young, he probably wouldn't get away with it. And who's this? This is my friend, Therese. Therese, this here is Theo. Theodore Braxton Hinsley IV. Only son and heir of the guy that runs one of the largest hedge funds in New York. And a notorious playboy, he added in a stage whisper. He's the only guy I know with more money and more time on his hands than me. And what does he do? He races pretend stock cars. Rob punched the guy in the side. You're just jealous because you can't race until that cast comes off. Theo turned to Therese. If his leg weren't broken, he'd take over one of Tony's cars, or by his own, so he could enter. You're not wrong, Rob said, looking longingly out toward the racetrack where a group of cars put in a few practice laps. How much longer are you stuck in that thing? Theo asked. I'm heading out to the French Alps in a couple of weeks with some friends. We're wingsuiting off Mont Blanc. Any interest? I wish I could, Rob said. It's on my bucket list. 
My leg isn't anywhere near healed yet, but when it does, you're on. I want to organize another trip to STRYN. Tell me when and where. I'll be there. I heard it's legendary. Theo turned to Therese and kissed her on the cheek. It was nice to meet you, Therese. I hope I get to see you in Norway. I have to head back and check on my car. He waved at Rob and jogged off toward one of the buildings scattered around the racetrack. STRYN, she asked. And what in the world is wingsuiting? STRYN, Norway. It's one of the best places to wingsuit. Rob noticed the confusion in her face. It's similar to paragliding, but a million times better. You wear a suit that allows you to glide through the air. It's as close as you can come to actually flying. The rush is unlike anything else, and the views are amazing. Especially up in STRYN. You won't believe how beautiful it is to see the fjords and the rough coastline from above. You say that like this is something I'd consider doing. You're talking about those suits that make you look like a flying squirrel, right? Therese wanted to make sure she wasn't misunderstanding. Yes. That's it. I can show you some videos from my last trip out there. Rob pulled out his phone and found a YouTube video shot in the first-person view of one of these flights. Or did you call it a jump? Either way, it looked terrifying. The view is stunning, she admitted grudgingly. And she had to give it to him, it would be hard to get that kind of perspective of the landscape in any other way. Except maybe a helicopter, but then you'd have to deal with the noise, and she thought it wouldn't quite have the same 360 degree view. Not that she had any experience with helicopters either. Propeller planes in Africa were as adventurous as she'd been in the air. And then, only because it was the sole mode of transportation available. She preferred to keep both feet on the ground, thank you very much. You'll love it. Rob took a deep breath, getting ready to sing the praises of wingsetting. Therese put a hand on his arm. Let me stop you there. The video is breathtaking. But there is no way I would ever try something like this. It's even crazier than jumping out of a perfectly good airplane. Remember, she pointed at herself. Girl with a fear of heights and anxiety issues. Trust me, you'll get over that. Wait until you take that first jump. You'll be hooked. Rob walked over to the stands. The race was about to start, and it was time to take their seats. Therese followed behind, waiting until he had taken his seat before responding. It's not going to happen, she said. She looked right at him, hoping she was getting her point across. It's not me. Okay, I get it, he said. No wingsuiting for you. He leaned back and settled in to watch the race. Why don't I get us some snacks? Want something to drink? Therese rose, suddenly feeling agitated. Like he'd just dismissed her concerns about extreme sports as trivial. And not wanting to do something as silly as jumping off a huge cliff with nothing but a bit of cloth between her and sudden death was anything but trivial. Water would be good. And maybe some popcorn? He grinned one of his heart-melting smiles at her. As she walked to the concession stand, Therese played their conversation back in her mind. Taking risks and doing things like racing cars and jumping off cliffs were part of Rob. They were things he enjoyed, and that wasn't likely to change. If the car wreck didn't keep him from wanting to race again, nothing else would change. He was and would always be an adrenaline junkie. The question was, could she live with that? You went to the racetrack? How fun. How was it? Miriam picked up her double shot mocha and grabbed a seat by the window in the roasted bean. It was fun. Loud, but better than I expected. Therese sat down across from her friend and took a cautious sip of her skim milk vanilla latte. The day had been fun, despite the disconcerting conversation about wingsuits. Tony's car had done well, finishing third in the main race. They'd celebrated with the crew first in the pits, then over pizza and beer at a dive bar near the racetrack. The food had been surprisingly good, and she'd enjoyed herself. Did you meet some of his friends? 
Miriam asked before pulling apart the bear claw she'd ordered to go with the sugar-laden drink. Want some, she asked, holding a chunk of the sticky pastry out. Therese shook her head. He knew a few people on the track. I'm not sure I'd call them friends. Except for Tony. He's a pretty nice guy. Crazy about cars of course, but he was fun to talk to. Why this emergency coffee date if everything is going well with you and Mr. Hottie patient? Don't call him that. And don't remind me that he's my patient. And my boss. Ah, uh, that's what you're conflicted about. So, you two are getting kinda serious? Miriam leaned in, ready for Therese, to share the juicy details of what was going on between her and Rob. He is pretty hot. And he has a kind smile. Therese grinned. He is, and he does. He's a really nice guy. I like him. Did I tell you we kissed? No, you didn't. When did that happen? A couple of days ago when we were staying at a hotel in Myrtle Beach, while the power was out here on the island. We were coming back from dinner, great sushi place, by the way. We should go there for lunch. Yeah, yeah, Miriam said when Therese paused. Stop changing the subject. The kiss? He walked me to my door and we kissed. Therese's cheeks grew warm at the memory of that one, incredible kiss they'd shared. So, you guys had separate rooms? Good. I hope he paid for yours. Actually, it was a sweet and yes, he paid for it. Fancy. It had been. The ancient Mariner Resort had been the fanciest place Therese had ever stayed at. It had also been the complete opposite of the accommodations she'd had for the past four years. That was part of the problem with her and Rob. They came from such different worlds. Don't go all quiet on me now. What happened next? More kisses? Hot dates? Miriam asked. Nothing like that. We went back to being friends, I think. Therese took another sip of her coffee. He hasn't tried to kiss me again, if that's what you're asking. And I don't think you can call the trip to the racetrack a hot date. It was fun, and it was hot out in the sun. She trailed off. Do you want him to kiss you again? Miriam asked softly. Yes. No. Therese put her cup down and folded her hands in her lap. I don't know. What's the problem? You like him. I can tell. I do, but there are so many reasons why this couldn't possibly work out. I work for him, for one thing. Kissing him crossed an ethical line. What I should do is resign. That's crazy talk. He has what, a couple more weeks in that cast? You're not going to be his nurse for much longer. If things don't work out between the two of you, you need that bonus. Miriam had a point there. True. It was just one kiss. Mostly, we're good friends. It was a lie, and Miriam knew it. Yeah, no. You guys passed the friend's line long before that kiss. Miriam shoved another piece of pastry into her mouth. What's really bothering you, she said. Or at least that's what Therese thought she'd said. It was hard to tell with all the food in her mouth. We come from totally different worlds. He's filthy rich and grew up on an estate in upstate New York. He was raised by nannies and has more money than he knows what to do with. You've met my parents. You've seen the house I've grown up in. You two aren't the first couple to overcome different backgrounds. From what I've heard about the guy so far, he doesn't strike me as a stuck-up rich boy. He acts pretty normal, with a disposable income and a few eccentric hobbies. I know. That's the other problem. The guy is an adrenaline junkie. And he's forcing you to do that stuff with him? Miriam asked, looking a little concerned. No. He's asked me of course, but I'm not doing anything I don't want to do. Well. He did talk me into riding the skywheel. Teresa's lips curved up in a quirky half-smile. That doesn't count as an extreme sport, Miriam laughed. 
that's a run-of-the-mill tourist attraction. A pricey one, but there's nothing dangerous about riding that. True. It was actually kind of fun once I got used to it. And Rob was great about talking me through my fear of heights. That doesn't sound so bad. It wasn't. Rob challenged her and made her push herself. It was a good thing and something she needed in a partner if she wanted to live life to the fullest. The problem is that he loves things like wingsitting and base jumping and racing those crazy fast electric cars of his. And you're worried he'll get hurt again. It's bound to happen sooner or later. And the next time he might not walk away with nothing worse than a broken leg. Therese swallowed hard. One day, he might not walk away at all. Then what am I supposed to do? You're scared of getting hurt, of having your heart broken. Therese nodded. I know it's stupid. There are no guarantees in life. If the Peace Corps taught me anything, it's to make the best out of the time and resources we are given. Think of it this way. Are you willing to give up on what could be an amazing love story because of what could go wrong? Therese shook her head. It may end for other reasons. Are you shutting him out because you two could grow apart over time or one of you may find someone else? People break up all the time. It's a lot more common than having someone die on you young. Therese barked out a sad little laugh. You're right, and I'm not worried about that. If I was, I'd never open my heart to anyone. All set for your big love story with Rob then? Miriam asked, grinning at her. I don't know. That still leaves the worrying any time he goes off on one of his adventures. Therese finished her coffee and put the empty cup on the table in front of her. I don't know if I'm okay with the waiting to hear if he's okay. The wondering if this is the trip he gets hurt on. Miriam took her hand and squeezed it. That's something only you can answer. My only advice is that you figure it out now, before the two of you get any more involved than you already are. Miriam had a good point. Therese thought about it on her drive back to the beach house. Was she ready to give this relationship a shot? And would it be worth the risk of losing the huge bonus Rob had offered her? What would happen if they started dating? Or if things went south, before the end of her contract? Was it worth risking the chance of erasing all her debt and being able to start her charity years earlier than she'd expected? Was getting involved with Rob worth risking the clean water she could be supplying to hundreds of young children just like Thomas? Was looking for her own happiness worth risking the lives of others? Chapter 14 Therese? Sorry, did you say something? They sat on the back porch of the beach house, enjoying the sun and the fresh breeze coming off the ocean. Therese had been staring out over the ocean for the past half hour. The more Rob thought about it, the more he realized she'd been distant and quiet since yesterday. I asked what you wanted to do the next couple of days. The weather is supposed to stay like this, he said, repeating the question. Not for the first time that morning, he wondered what was going on in that pretty head of hers. I'm not sure. Do you have something in mind? She turned and looked at him, finally giving him her undivided attention. Maybe she hadn't been avoiding him after all. Nothing in particular. I wouldn't mind getting away though. Even if it would be just for a day or two. I get restless when I'm stuck in the same place for too long. He smiled apologetically. You have another doctor's appointment on Wednesday. We probably shouldn't go too far, but we could do something. There's a lot to see and do all up and down the South Carolina coast. Do you have a favorite? He asked. Her eyes lit up and Rob couldn't wait to hear what got her so excited. Hunting Island. It's past Charleston, not far from the Georgia line. It's a pretty big state park right by the ocean. There's camping, fishing, swimming, an old lighthouse you can climb. Oh, and there are these dead trees that have washed up on the shore. They're sitting in the sand, getting covered by the surf each high tide. As the water evaporates, they make the most interesting sounds. It's something else. Her enthusiasm for the place was contagious. Rob couldn't wait to see it. He'd already looked for camping supplies on his phone. 
I can have a tent, sleeping bags, and all the basics here by tomorrow. We can leave first thing Monday morning. Therese glanced over his shoulder at the order on his screen. That's what you're spending? We could stay in a nice hotel in Beaufort for that kind of money. Yeah, but where would the fun be in that? Picture it. A campfire, lightning bugs, the sound of the ocean. And marshmallows. We definitely need to stop at the store and grab a pack or two. We could make s mores. All right, a camping trip it is, she agreed, a huge grin on her face. You are right, this place is amazing. Rob looked around the vast expanse of beach, covered in large, dead trees. The view alone was worth getting some sand in his boot. Do you mind if we rest for a minute over there? I want to try to get some of this sand out. They made their way up towards the dunes, finding a large tree trunk that looked dry. Rob sat down, awkwardly removing the fastenings on the protective boot. Here, let me. Therese handed him a water bottle before leaning down to gently slip the plastic contraption off his foot and leg. Sand poured out as she turned it upside down. You weren't kidding. Is your foot okay? Rob wiggled his toes and wiped the last of the sand off his foot. There were a couple of tender spots, but nothing he couldn't handle. All good, he said before holding his hand out for the liner. Therese turned it inside out, shaking it well before handing it back to him. He moved his foot, gently moving it in circles, seeing how his ankle would respond. It felt good to move his leg without the boot and the cool air felt nice. Easy there. You don't want to overdo it. Let's get this back on. Therese helped him put on the boot. I think I'd be fine without this, he told her, knowing full well it would rile her up. Don't even think about it. The leg may feel fine, but the break isn't fully healed yet. The last thing you want to do is re-break it. That would add weeks, if not months, to your recovery time. She looked at him with those pretty blue eyes, concern shining in them. Concern for him. It hit him that she really cared about him, what he did, and how he felt. This wasn't professional courtesy. It wasn't because he was paying her well. It went well beyond what anyone else, including his father had ever shown him. And it made him regret his words. Don't worry. I was kidding. I won't do anything to jeopardize my recovery. Cross my heart. He made an X with his fingers over his heart. Good. You'd better not. She checked the last of the straps and stood. All set. You're good to go. Why don't we head on over to the lighthouse? It'll be easier to walk out there on the path than in the sand. After that, we should probably head back to the campsite and set up. They'd arrived an hour earlier and were both ready to stretch their legs for a bit after the three-hour drive down here. They'd checked in with the ranger and then headed to the day visit section to see the lighthouse and stretch of beach around it. Sounds like a plan. We should figure out lunch too. His stomach growled at the mere thought of food. Therese laughed. Lucky for you, I packed us some sandwiches. Remind me to grab the cooler when we get back to the car. We can have a picnic by the lighthouse. He rose, heading for the path to the parking lot. Hey, slow down there, six million dollar man, she said, running after him. You've gotten pretty fast with those crutches. Therese had insisted he bring and use both of them on the uneven terrain of the park. His brief walk down to the beach had shown him she'd been right. It made getting around a little easier, and he'd count it as an upper arm workout, with the sand adding to the resistance. That six billion dollar man to you, he said, turning his head to grin back at her. That had been a mistake. He hadn't paid attention to where he'd planted his crutches, and one of them landed in a small hole in the sand. Therese was at his side in a flash, preventing him from landing face first in the sand. No kidding. I knew you were pretty well off, but six billion. I can't even imagine. She shook her head, looking unfazed. That was different. Usually you could see dollar signs in people's eyes when he divulged his net worth. It's not all mine. The company is worth that much. 
your company. So it's still you. And at that point, those extra zeros probably don't make that much of a difference. She paused with that thoughtful look again. Penny for your thoughts, he asked as they set off toward the lighthouse again. Cheapskate. A penny? Therese pretended to be upset, but he saw right through her. He knew what she was doing. Deflecting to avoid his request. Fair enough. One thousand dollars to the charity of your choice for your thoughts. Therese stopped dead in her tracks what? Tell me what caused that thoughtful look on your face just now and I'll write a check to whatever charity you pick when we get back to the beach house. Scratch that. I can do it from my phone. He pulled it out of his back pocket. Zero bars. As soon as we get reception. Therese swallowed hard, then turned to look back across the vast stretch of beach covered in tree trunks. I was thinking that those zeros would make a difference when it comes to how much charity work a person can support. A person. Not him, not your average billionaire. A person. That's true. We do some, for tax purposes. To be honest, I couldn't even tell you what charities the board supports. It was something he'd be looking into in the coming weeks. His board of directors may be able to keep him out of the day-to-day -day operations and decision-making, but he'd be damned if he let them decide what to do as far as charitable work was concerned as well. The company was doing well and could use another tax break. Talking them into doubling or tripling their giving shouldn't be that hard. He didn't think Kevington and his buddies cared as long as it didn't cut into their salaries or bonuses. You're quiet, Therese said, opening the trunk of her Prius to get to the cooler tucked inside among their newly acquired camping gear. He must have been lost in his thoughts longer than he realized. He had no idea how they'd gotten here. What can I do to help, he asked. I've got it. Let's head back to the lighthouse. I saw some picnic tables out there. We can eat and then take a look at some of the buildings around it. If I remember, there's some historical stuff to look at. He fell into step beside her. I was thinking about my company and that I would like to see what we can do to increase our charitable giving and make sure it goes to places where it actually does some good. I was wondering if you'd like to help me with that. At least with some of the preliminary research. He'd seen enough media reports about charities where the majority of the money donated went to administrative cost. He doubted his CFO cared much about what happened to the money Marshall Mutual donated as long as it counted as a tax write-off. I'd be happy to, Therese said. She set two bottles of water on the picnic table before digging around in the large backpack purse she'd carried to produce two apples and two sandwiches. Turkey and Swiss. Dig in. She didn't have to tell him twice. Robin held his sandwich and the piece of fruit before downing the bottled water. Thanks, that hit the spot. He looked around the area, able to enjoy the view of the tall black and white striped lighthouse and the buildings surrounding it. I bet the view from up there is amazing, Therese said, following his gaze. You've never been? He was surprised. This was her favorite spot around here after all. Never had the chance. It's a bit of a hike. 167 steps. You should go, he said. He couldn't believe she'd never been and wished he could walk up there with her. I'm not leaving you down here by yourself. He caught her looking at the ticket booth. I wouldn't mind resting my leg a bit. I think maybe I overdid it on the beach earlier. I'll hang out here and you can take some pictures for me from the top, he coaxed. Are you sure? When he nodded, Therese went to get a ticket. She returned a few minutes later to check on him. I won't be long, she promised before jogging to the entrance. Take your time, he called after her, not sure if she heard him over the sound of the seagulls and the crashing waves. He settled in to spend the next little while people watching. He was surprised how much he was enjoying himself despite being sidelined during some of their activities. He liked spending time with Therese and couldn't wait for another chance to kiss her. Despite her fear of heights and her determination to not give things like wingsitting a try, she was quite adventurous and enjoyed this little road trip as much as he did. 
he envisioned her tagging along as he traveled the world in search of the next thrill. Therese was back sooner than he'd expected, jolting him out of his daydreams of their future when she ran up and plopped onto the bench next to him. She was a little out of breath, a huge grin on her face. It was amazing, she said. I wish you could have seen the view. The pictures don't quite do it justice. They scrolled through the images on her phone before heading back to the car to set up camp. You have no idea how to put this together, do you? Therese asked, standing in a pile of tarp and poles. It said it was quick and easy to assemble. Rob read through the directions again, hoping they would make more sense this time around. He pulled his phone out of his pocket, opening YouTube. You could find tutorials for just about anything on there. All he needed was the model number of the tent. Still no reception? Therese asked. That's what I get for being out in the middle of nowhere he mumbled under his breath. I guess we'll head to that town you mentioned and get a hotel. Do you folks need some help? A young park ranger driving a Ford Ranger truck stopped, his window rolled down. We do. You don't happen to know how to put one of these together? Therese said, holding out a handful of poles. Not a problem. I have this one myself. It's pretty easy to put together. The ranger got out of his truck to put the tent together. So, you guys are a couple, he asked, while guiding one of the large poles through a tube inside the tent material. Yes, Rob said immediately, not wanting the ranger to get the wrong idea. He'd noticed the guy checking out Therese. No, Therese said in the same breath. The ranger looked up and eyed them, both suspiciously. Early days. We haven't had the weary going steady talk yet. Rob walked over to get a better look at what the guy was doing with the tent. Ah, uh, got ya. Brave of you guys to go camping together this early in your relationship. I guess it's a good litmus test to see if it could work or not. The ranger proceeded to show them both how to put the tent together. This really is pretty easy, Therese said when the tent was raised. The instructions make a lot more sense now. Thank you. Okay then. I think you guys are all set. Next time, you may want to try out your gear before heading out. Have fun, you too. He tipped his hat and walked back to his car. Chapter 15 That was awkward, Rob said when the ranger drove off. He was nice. And the tent is set up. Do you mind starting the fire while I get the rest of the stuff out of the car? Therese put the bundle of firewood down and handed him a pair of matches before she got busy digging the rest of their gear out of the car and depositing it in the tent. That was quick. Therese was surprised to see a roaring fire by the time she'd arranged the pads and sleeping bags in the tent. Years of experience. Rob had a huge grin on his face, his voice dripping with pride. When you're out on your wingsitting trips, she asked. No. We had fireplaces in most of the rooms at our estate. I bugged the housekeeper to let me help light them every chance I got. She finally relented and taught me how to lay and start a good fire. I'm grateful to her. Last time I tried to start one, it took me a good hour to get it going. Therese heaved the cooler out of the car and returned with more bottled water, a pack of brats, and the French bread they'd picked up at the store on their way down. She expertly speared one of the sausages on each of the expandable roasting forks he'd ordered as part of their new camping kit and handed it to him. We brought the marshmallows, right? Rob asked while cooking his dinner over the fire. Yes, they are in a bag in the car. I'll grab them in a bit. Got to make sure you eat your supper first, she teased. He had such a sweet tooth. This is good. Rob sounded surprised. Don't tell me, you've never done this. She couldn't believe someone as outdoorsy and adventurous as Rob hadn't grilled brats over an open fire. I haven't. He finished the last bite and washed it down with some water. I've roasted plenty of marshmallows though. In that case, I'd better put you to work while I finish my own dinner. Therese jumped up, set down her plate of food and ran up to the car. She was back a moment later and set a box of graham crackers, a bar of milk chocolate, and a huge bag of marshmallows in front of him. 
The look on his face was priceless. When did you get all this? I didn't see it in the cart when we were grocery shopping. I had this stuff hidden in the pantry in case we made a beach fire this week. I hid it with our sleeping bag stuff. Thought it would make for a nice surprise. And here, I was secretly resenting you for limiting me to one small bag of marshmallows. He leaned forward and surprised her with a quick kiss on the lips. Sit, enjoy your dinner. I'll work on dessert. Therese returned to her chair, fighting the urge to put her hand to her lips. The kiss had been sweet. He'd done it without thinking. A natural gesture of affection that made her ache for more. She looked at Rob with his face lit up by the fire as darkness fell around them. He confused her, this handsome man who could be kind and caring one moment and lose his temper the next. Life with him would never be boring, and a part of her was attracted to that idea. She sighed softly, feeling torn about wanting to see if they could make it work and being reluctant to give up the plans she'd made for the foreseeable future for herself. Sure, eventually she wanted to fall deeply in love, get married, and start a family. But not until she'd had a chance to make a difference and do some good. Here you go. Rob handed her a sticky s'more with chocolate already working its way out of the cracker sandwich. It was sweet, hard to eat with a hint of bitterness from the burnt pieces of marshmallow, and almost impossible to resist. A lot like Rob. That's the last of it. Ready to leave? Therese shut the trunk of the Prius and turned around to look at him. Rob took a moment to look over the now-empty campsite and out across the dunes. He could barely make out the ocean through the thick bushes and trees that covered the small strip of land that separated them from the beach. Laying next to Therese in the tent, each of them wrapped in their sleeping bag was something he wouldn't soon forget. He'd spend hours listening to her breathe, feeling her close. Sometime during the early morning hours, when the birds had started to chirp and the first few beams of sunlight lit up the inside of the tent, he decided that this was the woman he wanted to spend the rest of his life with and he would do whatever it took to win her over. Rob? Yes, sorry. I'm ready to go. He put his crutches in the back seat and hobbled to the passenger side, taking one last look around before sitting down and shutting the door. They'd made it back to the main highway leading up to Palmer Island when his phone rang. Sorry, I have to take this, he said when he recognized the number. Mr. Covington, what's going on? Rob, there's something we need to talk about. I'm afraid I have some bad news. Peter Steiner, our CFO. Yes, what about him? Rob had never liked the man and hadn't been afraid to tell the board so. Not that they'd listened. There was something shady about the man. Rob didn't trust him, even though he'd led the company to a record high return on investments in the short time he'd been in charge. He's gone. Took off with company funds. How could this have happened, Rob grit out, trying to keep his temper in check. We were seeing such great returns, when he asked for a little more control over the accounts to be able to move quickly, I didn't see any reason to keep the safeguards we put in place when he took over. I can see that was a mistake. At least Covington sounded somewhat contrite. How bad? Rob held his breath. Not good. How bad is it, Mr. Covington? Therese shot him a glance at the rise in volume. He took a steadying breath to calm down. Just tell me. We lost half of our operating capital. Say that again? Marshall Mutual is worth half of what it was last week. I'm sorry, Rob. We're taking legal actions, I assume? Of course. Our entire legal department is on it, and we have hired counsel to help file additional charges. A forensic accounting team is in place to determine how the funds were transferred. He covered his tracks and is somewhere with the money where we can't get to him? Rob guessed. With little chance of recovering any of it anytime soon. Yes. What's the plan? We're determining what's left in accounts under our control and are reaching out to customers and investors. Good. What's next? We're working on it. You're telling me you all but bankrupted my company and you don't have the slightest idea of how to fix this? 
The company my father and grandfather worked for decades to build into what it is today, what it was until you became reckless and greedy and drove it into the ground. He knew he was yelling, but there was nothing he could do about it. Avoiding Teresa's glances, he stared out at the highway ahead of them. I have teams working on creative solutions around the clock, Mr. Covington assured him. I want proposals in my inbox by the end of the week. Rob disconnected the call and tossed the phone into the back seat behind him. He could hear the screen clank against his crutches and couldn't care less. Everything okay? Therese asked softly, risking a quick glance in his direction. No, not even remotely. My CFO took off with half my company, and my CEO is trying his hardest to run what remains into the ground, he grit out. Is there anything you can do? No, that's the problem. I saw this coming. I told them that guy was shady, but they wouldn't listen. He hit his fist against the side of the door. Can I ask you something? Therese sounded hesitant. Of course. He was angry, but not at her. He turned to look at her, forcing out a smile. How come you're not more involved in the day-to-day -day operations of your company? That's thanks to my father. He never had a very high opinion of me. Out of college, he stuck me in the mailroom and was surprised when I got bored. I guess it only confirmed his suspicion that I wasn't the type of person capable of running Marshall Mutual. He picked his successor from within his management team. While I technically own the company, I have no control or influence. It's all up to the board of directors. That's horrible. Therese sped up, racing to Palmer Island, going close to 80 miles per hour. It is what it is. Rob shrugged, before reminding her to slow down to the speed limit. Chapter 16 More coffee? Therese asked when she poked her head into his bedroom. Before he could respond, she walked in holding a steaming cup of coffee out to him. Thank you. He picked it up gratefully and took a big sip that burned his tongue. Careful. It's hot. I just made it. She took the cup from his hands and set it on the desk before stepping behind his chair to massage his neck and shoulders. That feels amazing. Rob hadn't realized how tense he'd become. It explained the small headache he'd developed over the past few hours. Did you get any sleep, she asked. Concerned tinged her sweet voice. He shook his head. No, I've been going over the financials to come up with a plan to turn this ship around. I have a meeting scheduled with the board for nine. If they hear me out, I might fly back to New York this afternoon. Why don't you get in the shower while I make you some eggs? It was a good idea. Rob was sure he looked like he'd pulled an all-nighter. The shower would wake him up, and if he wanted even a chance for his board of directors to take him seriously, he needed to dress the part. By the time he was ready to get on the conference call, he felt more alert and confident than he had in a while. I'll be out on the sun porch. Come find me when you're done, Therese said before setting a fresh cup of coffee on his desk and pulling the door closed behind her. Rob moved the coffee cup and flipped his laptop open. After a deep breath, he logged into the virtual conference room. Rob, I'm glad you could join us. How's the beach? Mr. Covington pulled a leather portfolio into view of the camera. He opened it and got out a pen, ready to take notes. He seemed nervous and Rob noticed only about half of the board of directors were in the room. The beach is fine. Where is everyone? He didn't have the patience for chit-chat. Mr. Covington cleared his throat. This is everyone, Rob. We've had a few sudden departures. Great. The rats were fleeing the sinking ship. Rob, John Stafford here, interim CFO. Rob remembered the young man. He had been on Peter Steiner's team. Sharp guy, a few years younger than him. This may not be a bad thing. We can run for a few months with a leaner crew and fill the vacant positions when things start to improve. Rob liked the way the guy thought. It was along the same lines of what he had in mind as well. Run a lean ship, work on a few short-term investment deals with a decent return and get some capital on the books that they could use to rebuild their investment portfolio. 
This was his chance to get a foot in the door, to take on a more active role. And John may be just the guy he needed on his side. I'm glad you mentioned that, John. I have a few ideas about how we can put these savings and what's left of Marshall Mutual's liquid assets to good use. There are a couple of interesting investment opportunities out there in clean energy that could yield us a quick return. Rob, let me stop you right there. Mr. Covington said. I appreciate your enthusiasm, but bringing you in at this stage is a bad idea. Our clients are jumpy, and to be blunt, you don't have the most reliable reputation. Rob snarled in disgust. His father had made sure of that, pointing out his shortcomings in front of the board and their biggest clients any chance he got. It was why the board had agreed to tie Rob's hands when the time came for him to take over from his father. It had been six years and nothing had changed. I'm afraid he's right. We can't afford to lose a single client right now. Our research suggests staying the course and investing in the areas we've always invested in, working on slow, steady returns is the best way to rebuild their competence. In a few months, we can revisit the idea, but right now, it's suicide. So much for John being on his side. All I'm asking is that you let me help. Take an active role in saving the company my father and grandfather built. Rob rubbed his head in frustration. I'm sorry, son but frankly, there's nothing you can do. We'll figure this out. We've been here before and we'll get back out of this mess. Rebuild from the ground up if we have to. Covington closed the leather portfolio and capped his pen. The meeting was over. That was it. He'd blown his chance to make a difference at Marshall Mutual, to finally get a seat at the table. You can't do that. Therese had her hands on her hips as she stood between him and the front door. Get out of my way. He had no patience for her this morning. After wallowing in self-pity all day yesterday, he had to do something. He had to go out there and get his adrenaline pumping or he'd crumble and fold. Why didn't she understand? He needed that rush. Needed to feel alive and prove to himself that there was something he was good at. You can't race a car with your boot. She still didn't budge. It's an automatic, and I'm not racing. I'm taking Tony's car around the track a couple of times. They are fine-tuning the electric motor, and he wants some feedback. The call had come early in the morning and was exactly what he'd needed to shake this, this. He wasn't sure what to call it. This feeling of worthlessness and helplessness. It was that or drink himself into a stupor. Racing sounded much better for his health. You're going to do this no matter what I say or do, aren't you? Her shoulders slumped and she stepped to the side. Rob picked up his phone and wallet, sticking both in the back pockets of his jeans, and grabbed the cane she'd handed him this morning. He knew it was supposed to make him feel better, give him the illusion that he was making progress. But it wasn't enough. I'll be back in a couple of hours, he said as he made his way to the door. And how do you plan on getting there? You don't have a car here. Triumph shone in Teresa's eyes. If she thought that was enough to stop him, she was sorely mistaken. Already ordered a car. It should be here any minute. He couldn't keep the smirk off his face if he tried. Not that he did. Cancel it. If I can't stop you from doing this, I'm going with you. Someone is going to need to take you to the hospital when you re-injure your leg. He didn't do any harm to it on the racetrack or while playing high-stakes poker with some buddies in a dive bar that made Therese obviously uncomfortable. But then he'd had the brilliant idea to sneak out into the marsh to go on a solo kayaking trip a few days later. Where are you? Therese's voice sounded frantic when he was finally able to get a signal to call her. I'm at the dock of a little tackle shop near the marsh walk in Mulls Inlet. Do you think you could come get me? He hated sounding weak, but he was tired, hungry, and his leg was killing him. I'll be there in twenty minutes. Stay put. She made it there in under fifteen. Rob didn't ask how. He was grateful to have her at his side. We can leave the kayak here until Jason can get it. I called him. He'll drop it off at the house. You're in pain. 
It wasn't a question. Therese had taken one look at him and shaken her head. What exactly did you do? And how bad is it? I woke up around sunrise and thought it would be fun to head out into the marsh for a bit. Didn't want to wake you. He tried a small smile to charm her into a better mood. You dragged the kayak to the other side of the island? By yourself? Her eyes were wide, her jaw about to drop. It's not that big of a deal. There's a landing a couple of roads over. It wasn't far. Dragging the plastic boat while hanging onto his cane hadn't been easy, but no Herculean feat either. And his leg had held up fine. How did you make it all the way up here? I may have gotten a little lost. Finally ran across a guy fishing who pointed me this way. Rob turned and looked at the small tackle shop. How's your leg? Not great, he admitted sheepishly. Let's get you to Dr. Clark's office and have him take a look. You'll be lucky if you didn't break it. He's not going to be happy with you. She shook her head as she walked to her car, opening the passenger door. Rob hobbled over and fell into the seat. Can we stop at the house first so I can take a shower? He was sweaty and gross. Absolutely not. If the fracture is compromised, you do even more damage. When they arrived at the doctor's office, Therese made him stay put while she went inside to grab a wheelchair. By the time she rolled in him Dr. Clark's office, he was fuming. He was humiliated. There's no need for this thing. I could have walked just fine, he bit out as the door opened. Thirty minutes later, Dr. Clark walked into the exam room, holding an x-ray of his leg. Would you please tell her I don't need to be rolled around in a wheelchair, he asked as soon as the doctor entered. I can walk just fine. That would have been a bad idea. You did quite a number on your leg. This is going to set you back weeks if not months. He put the black and white image on the same backlit display he'd used during one of their previous visits. Even Rob could see that the fracture had opened back up. It explained the dull ache he felt. It wasn't unlike what his leg had felt like a few weeks ago when he'd first gotten used to the cast. We're going to have to put you back into a full cast, Dr. Clark said. You're going to stay in it for another month. I want this fully healed before I even think about putting you back into a boot. You're lucky you didn't completely open up the break or I'd consider surgery. Rob only half listened when the doctor went on to berate him for undoing all the healing that had taken place and forbid him any form of exercise or strain for the next few weeks. Even his physical therapy was cancelled until further notice. Is all this really necessary? Rob asked during a lull in the conversation. Couldn't I get back in the boot if I promised to take it easy? No. And that was that. An hour later, he was back in a full cast and on his way to the beach house, a very irritated Therese at the steering wheel. Chapter 17 Therese was at her wit's end with Rob. What happened to the kind and funny guy that took her on the skywheel and rode out a hurricane with her? This new, unimproved version was grumpy, agitated, refused to shower, and spent all day lying on the couch, ordering her around. Why don't we go out on the back deck? You could use some fresh air and sunshine, she suggested on a Friday morning, a week after the doctor had put his leg back into a cast. I'm good here. He was binge-watching some reality TV show about Alaska and eating the Doritos he insisted she buy. Suit yourself. Therese stepped out on the back deck and took a deep breath. The breeze off the ocean had started to cool. It wouldn't be long before fall came in earnest. She hoped she'd be done caring for Rob by the time Thanksgiving rolled around. Therese. Would you like to join me for a cup of coffee? I made a fresh pot and there's fresh apple pie, Miss Doris called from across the small pathway that ran between the two beachfront houses. I'll be right there, Therese said before turning her head to look into the house. Rob hadn't moved an inch and didn't seem to have overheard the conversation. Shrugging, she jogged down the steps to the beach and over to her neighbor's yard. Let's go sit in the kitchen, Miss Doris suggested. It's getting a bit chilly out here. Therese followed the older woman into the cozy, sun-filled room and took a seat at the large wooden table. 
How are you and Rob doing? I haven't seen you out and about much. Miss Doris set a large cup of coffee and a generous slice of apple pie in front of Therese. It was a double crust pie topped with homemade whipped cream. The apple and raisin filling oozed out the side and the whole thing smelled divine. It took self-control to reply before she took her first bite. Rob is back in his cast. He overdid it. Went kayaking by himself. She wasn't sure how much to share. Rob was her patient after all. Miss Doris nodded and didn't look surprised. I remember my son doing the same thing. Not kayaking, but going out to play tag football while wearing his cast and cracking the entire cast open. I was furious. He needed a new set of x-rays and a fresh cast. It added weeks to his recovery time. How old was your son? Therese took a small bite of the pie. It tasted even better than it smelled. Twelve, Miss Doris laughed, her steel-gray eyes twinkling with mirth. I should have known better than to expect him to stay put and let his leg heal. It was over summer break, too, and the air conditioning gave out right after he'd gotten his cast on. Poor little guy was miserable. Rob's quite a bit older, but it was a challenge getting him to sit still too. Now, he won't move from the couch. Therese sighed at the thought of Rob next door, sprawled out on the couch with a bag of chips and a soda, his cell phone in his hand, probably spending a small fortune on that game he loved so much. He's not taking it well? Miss Doris served herself a generous slice of pie. No, not really. He was doing well and getting around great until. Therese trailed off again, unsure how much to share. Until? He got some bad news about his company. There isn't anything he can do about it, and it's driving him up the wall. The older woman nodded, then raised her coffee cup to take a drink. I think the way he deals with feeling helpless, unwanted, and useless is to go do something reckless. I think he's done it since he was a young boy, Therese said. Saying it out loud made her realize how much of an influence it must have over Rob, and she felt like she'd finally begun to understand his behavior the past few weeks. And you don't know what to do for him. Other than doing what you can to keep him put so his leg can heal. It wasn't a question. Yes. It made her feel helpless and useless in turn. No wonder the nightmares had returned. Therese wasn't sure what to do to help Rob get out of the funk he was in since she'd put her foot down. Sounds to me like he's getting depressed sitting in that house all day. Guy like him needs to get out, see something new, do something, even when he's stuck in a cast. Both of my sons are like that. Miss Doris looked up at the kitchen wall where the pictures of two middle-aged men with what Therese assumed were their families. That's what I've been trying to do. But ever since he re-injured his leg, he won't even come out on the back deck. Don't give him a choice. March him out to the car and go for a drive. See if that helps. Actually, what you need is to get out of that house yourself for a bit. I'm leaving for a meeting at church in half an hour. Why don't you come with me? We're planning our annual bake sale and are deciding what charity we want to support this year. Why don't you come with me and tell the women about the work being done in Africa? I could do that. Rob is going to spend the rest of the day watching TV anyway. And Miss Doris was right. Therese needed to get out and clear her head. Maybe it would put her into a frame of mind where she could help Rob get out of his own funk. Couldn't hurt to talk to Reverend Peters about it either. He's done a lot of work in the community, including the hospital he might have some insights. It wasn't a bad idea. Therese felt better knowing there was someone she could talk to. The two women chatted a little while longer before Therese made her way back to the house. Rob hadn't moved an inch while she was gone. She said a slice of the pine Miss Doris had insisted she take back to him on the coffee table. From Miss Doris. Would you like a cup of coffee to go with that? He shook his head and went back to his game, mumbling something about invading troops under his breath. I'm heading out for a bit with Miss Doris, helping out at the church. I'll put you a sandwich in the fridge. A nod was her only confirmation that he'd heard her. 
Therese sat back, watching the women crowded around the small living room table in the preacher's house. They were perched on chairs, couches, and stools. Anything that remotely resembled a seat had been dragged into the room, and the women chatted excitedly about what they were planning on making for a bake sale that was still months out. They get a little excited when it comes to baked goods, Reverend Peter said, taking the empty seat next to Therese. That they do. If everyone is as good as Miss Doris, it's for a good reason. Most of the women had brought something to the potluck dinner and everything Therese tasted had been excellent. No one is as good as Miss Doris. I enjoyed your talk about the work you did in Gambia, quite a bit. I can see us supporting a few projects over there in the coming years. As a matter of fact, Reverend Shepard is coming for a visit next Saturday. He stateside to spend time with family and has agreed to come to dinner on his way back. I'd love it if you could join us. The chatter around them increased as the ladies became more and more excited. I'd love to. It would be nice to talk to someone who's been there recently. Therese cleared her throat. And there's something else I would like your advice on. It's about Rob. Reverend Peters rose and held his hand out for her. Why don't we step into my study? It's a little quieter there. Therese appreciated his discretion and followed him to the office down the hall. It was a comfortable spot with a large oak desk, two leather chairs, and a low side table between them. One wall of the room was covered in a large bookshelf that held tome after tome, old leather bindings, most of them religious texts, but to Therese's surprise, quite a few travel guides and journals. What can I do for you? Everything okay with Rob? Miss Doris mentioned his leg is worse and he's back in a cast. Reverend Peters crossed his leg and leaned back in the chair, ready to listen. He's not great. He's struggling, and I'm not sure how to help him. Therese caught the preacher up on everything that had happened the past week. Poor guy. That's a lot of stuff crashing down on him all at once. It is, but to be honest, I think one caused the other. Looking for the next thrill or adrenaline rush is his way of coping with stress. At least that's the impression I've been getting. And he's still looking for that next rush? The preacher asked, looking concerned. Not really. It's like he's given up. He's planted on the couch, watching TV and playing a game on his phone. That's honestly the most active thing he's done. He plays a war strategy game online. She didn't mention that it was also something he continued to spend a small fortune on daily. Sounds like depression and addiction to me. Does he have a history of either to your knowledge? I don't know about depression, but he's a recovering addict. That's why he's not taking anything stronger than Tylenol for pain. Reverend Peters sat quietly for a moment. Here's what I think is happening. He took pills? Therese nodded. From what I understand, and you probably know more about this than I do, those pills would release dopamine, as does a lot of the other stuff he'd told me about. The racing and paragliding, and what was that other thing he's so passionate about? Jumping off cliffs and flying, wearing nothing more than a special suit, with some sort of wings? Wingsuiting. Yes, guess that's what that was called. I think he uses it as a replacement for the pills, to still get that fix. Without it, his brain is on at least a mild dopamine withdrawal that's causing him to slip into depression. How do I help him get through that? From a spiritual and supportive point of view, Therese asked. What the pastor shared made a lot of sense. She should have realized sooner that the game was another way to soothe his brain's craving for that dopamine rush. As was his daredevil behavior. He was still an addict. He was simply looking for that next thrill or the rush of beating someone in his game to give him a taste of what the opioids used to do. The medical stuff she could handle. There were a few supplements that would help him start to feel more like himself. I would start with a conversation. Make sure he realizes he's slipping into a mild depression. Encourage him to get out and do something, while being supportive and understanding if he can't. Sunshine and good nutrition can go a long way, as does some social interaction if you can coax him out of the house. All things she'd done before, but much of it she'd let slip as her frustration with him grew after the solo kayaking trip. 
since then, she'd let him get away with eating mostly junk food and staying in the house. It was time to do her part to help him break out of the vicious cycle of not taking care of himself and his health. She was still his nurse, this was her job. Thank you, Reverend. I will. And what about the dinner? Can I count on you to join us? Yes. I'll be there. I'd love to finally meet Reverend Shepherd. A soft knock on the door made both of them raise their heads. Reverend Peters rose and opened the door. I'm sorry to interrupt. The meeting is finished and we're ready to head out whenever the two of you are done. Take your time. Miss Doris started to retreat. I think we're done here, unless there's something else you'd like to discuss, Therese? Reverend Peters looked at her questioningly. I'm good. This was very helpful. I'm glad. And remember not to take what he says and does too personally. It can be tricky, but he's not quite himself right now. Call me if there's anything I can do, and don't be afraid to take some time away if you need to. The next few days were a challenge. Rob was beyond stubborn and in a perpetual bad mood. Therese hated the fact that she had started to get used to his rude comments and unwillingness to leave the house. The dinner with Reverend Peters and Reverend Shepherd couldn't come soon enough. I'll be out for dinner tonight. I made a big pot of vegetable soup. It's simmering on the stove. Do you want me to get you a bowl of it before I leave? Therese asked late in the afternoon on Saturday. She'd done her best to limit the amount of chips and candy bars Rob consumed, making him smoothies, salads, and soups to snack on instead. She'd even baked a few whole grain treats and kept the fridge stocked with fresh cut fruits and vegetables. I'll get some when I'm hungry. Rob returned to tapping away on his phone. He'd made a little progress since they'd spoken about her concern that he'd slipped into a depression. Rob had insisted it was just a temporary funk and had promised to get out more and take better care of himself. Some days were better than others. Today hadn't been good so far, and Therese was ready to get away from it all for a few hours. Okay then. Call me if you need something and grab some fruit if you're feeling like dessert. She grabbed her purse and left. I'm glad you could join us, Reverend Peter said when Therese arrived at his doorstep 20 minutes later. She held out the peanut butter pie Miss Doris had insisted on making. I brought dessert. Courtesy of your favorite baker. A huge grin spread over Reverend Peters's face. Peanut butter? That woman knows me and my weakness too well. Come in and meet Reverend Shepherd. Therese followed the pastor into the cozy kitchen where a middle-aged man with blonde hair, blue eyes, and a dark tan sat. You must be Therese. I've heard a lot about you. He rose and held his hand out to her. She shook it. He had a nice firm handshake. Likewise. I'm glad to finally meet in person. I'd spoken to a few of your parishioners during my time in Gambia, and they had nothing but good things to say about you. And I've heard quite a lot about the golden-haired nurse, with a big heart. His huge smile was infectious. Therese couldn't help but like this man from the moment their eyes had met. It's nice to meet someone else who knows the area and the work we've been doing there, she said, returning the smile. Come sit, Reverend Peters encouraged. The ladies from church have made us dinner and we shouldn't let it go cold. Dig in. The food was delicious, the conversation engaging and fun. I hadn't realized how much I missed doing the work down there until now, Therese said. There's no reason you couldn't come back. My mission can always use an extra pair of capable hands. And thanks to Reverend Peter's efforts, and those of others, I can even offer you a salary. It was tempting. She could go back and make a difference now, with a solid team in place and financial backing. Was it worth giving up on the idea of forming her own charitable organization down the road? Were the two even mutually exclusive? The dinner conversation left Therese with a lot to think about, and she pondered it all the way home. Therese grabbed the plate of leftovers Reverend Peters insisted on sending back with her, along with two slices of the peanut butter pie, which had been delicious. Therese could see why the Reverend was such a fan. 
As soon as she opened the front door, the smell hit her. Had he really? He had. The coffee table was littered with not one but two pizza boxes, paper plates, and plenty of napkins. Two large bottles of soda sat there, the first almost empty, and to top it all off, he'd ordered a bag of some sort of cheese bites as well that he munched on. Therese made herself count to ten before stepping into the room. Want some pizza? Rob asked, glancing up from his phone briefly. What happened to the soup I made for dinner, she asked between gritted teeth, as she stalked into the kitchen to put the food away. He could forget about getting any of the peanut butter pie. Didn't feel like it. Saw an ad about this two-for-one pizza deal from a place down the road. It's pretty good. You should try it. He popped another cheese bite into his mouth. Therese put away the chicken bake and sweet potato casserole the pastor had sent home with her. Rob didn't need it tonight, and it would make for a good lunch for one of them tomorrow. Next, she stirred the soup that still gently bubbled away on the stove. He hadn't even bothered to turn it off. She removed it from the burner to cool before returning to the living room. Do you want to watch a movie? Rob asked, pushing himself up from the couch and moving some of the pillows and blankets to make room for her. At least he attempted to include her. That was an improvement from a few days ago when he barely acknowledged her presence unless he'd needed something. Getting comfortable on the couch, Therese grabbed a slice of mushroom and bacon pizza and settled in for the latest sci-fi flick he'd picked. Chapter 18 Drats, he hadn't gotten up early enough. Rob raised his head just in time to see Therese's angry face as she stepped out on the back deck where he'd hoped to get his workout in before she woke up. They'd talked a few nights ago about depression, and if he was honest with himself, she had a point. And the best way to beat depression was exercise. Not wanting to get into yet another argument with her, when had she turned into such a nag, he'd started doing push-ups, crunches, one-leg squats, and a few back dips each morning. So far, he'd been able to sneak back into his room before Therese woke up. Apparently, his luck had run out and by the look on her face, she was about to start in on another lecture about his health. He was in no mood for it. His leg hurt more than usual this morning, which made it more tedious to get out here and go through his new routine. Don't even start, he said, before reaching for the towel next to his chair to wipe the sweat off his brow. I know what you're going to say, and you're wrong. I'm not overdoing it, and exercise is better at treating depression than most pills out there. Exercise your doctor specifically told you not to do. At least not yet. Therese stood in front of him, hands on her hips, eyes blazing. Doctors can be wrong. And I wasn't overdoing it. I'm going to get cleaned up. He'd love a shower, but that required her help since he was back in a full cast. Rob felt her eyes follow him as he made his way back into the house. I can see how you didn't overdo it. You're in pain, aren't you? I'm fine, he bit out over his shoulder as he crossed the kitchen, grabbing a bottle of water from the fridge. I'll get you some Tylenol. And then we're going to talk. I don't need the pills, and we don't need to talk. Do I have to remind you that you work for me? Last time I checked, that means you don't get to boss me around and tell me what to do. His temper was getting away with him, but there was nothing he could do about it. You hired me to care for you and help you recover from this injury. It's my job to tell you when you're being stupid. Her tone was sharp, her voice rising with each word. He turned around and stared at her. You know what? You're right. I hired you. And now I'm firing you. Get out. Rob walked into his bedroom and slammed the door shut. He threw himself on the bed, put his earphones in, and started the music app on his phone. He ignored the knock that came a few minutes later. By the time he went back into the living room several hours later, she was gone. He checked her bedroom. The bed was neatly made and all her possessions were gone. There wasn't a single trace of her in the house aside from a note stuck to the fridge to remind him of his upcoming doctor's appointment. Great. Now what was he supposed to do? The ring of the doorbell followed by a knock on the front door woke him out of his stupor. He made his way to the door and pulled it open. 
What? Hi there, Rob. I thought I'd come check on you. Miss Doris pushed her way past him, a basket on her arm, and proceeded to walk into the kitchen. No need. I'm fine. He wasn't in the mood for company. Not until he got this figured out and Therese back here. He'd been angry, but hadn't expected her to actually leave. Sure, he'd threatened to fire her. Okay, he had actually fired her, but the woman didn't take anything else he said or did seriously, why would she listen to him now? Are you sure about that? How are you and Therese? I saw her leaving this morning. She didn't look too happy. And neither do you. Miss Doris looked at him over the top of her glasses as she pulled jar after jar of some sort of red concoction out of the basket along with a napkin-covered plate that smelled like cornbread. His stomach growled. Last night's pizza binge was long gone and out of his system. I'm fine on my own. Ah. That explains it. Explains what? Therese leaving, never mind. Not my place. Anyway, I thought you could use some food now that you're fending for yourself. I don't need any help, he growled. The pain in his leg, along with the sore muscles in his neck and shoulders from the morning's workout, was getting worse. Suit yourself. I'm going to leave this here and check in on you from time to time. I assume you're going to hire someone new? Until then, call me if you need anything. I'm happy to pick up groceries, drive you to your appointments, stuff like that. Stuff that Therese had done for him. Until he'd run her off. Something inside of Rob snapped. The rage he'd held down needed to escape. There was nothing he could do to stop the next words from coming out. Why don't you mind your own business, you old hag? I don't need anyone meddling in my life. If I need a lift, I'll call for a car. Get out and don't bother coming back. He grabbed one of the jars of homemade soup and hurtled it to the floor beside Miss Doris. And take this crap with you. Miss Doris didn't bother, she grabbed her basket and hustled to the front door, slamming it shut behind her. Rob stood in the kitchen in a pile of vegetable soup and glass shards. His chest heaved, sweat beaded on his forehead. When the shaking started, he reached for the old kitchen table to hold. It felt solid. Like an anchor in the storm that broiled around him. In him. How had his life gotten so out of control? The front door opened and Rob turned around, hoping it was Miss Doris so he could apologize. Instead, Brad Sutton, his friend and owner of the beach house waltzed in. Rob saw his wife, cat, and daughter, Hannah, waiting out on the front steps. What in the world is going on here, and what did you do to poor Miss Doris? Therese felt slightly better after sitting in Miss Doris's kitchen for an hour and talking to the older woman. It had helped her calm down and regain her composure enough to drive home to her parents' house in Myrtle Beach. As she pulled into the driveway of the house she'd grown up in, it hit her that she was in the car that Rob had bought for her. She'd have to figure out what to do with it. Give it back to Rob or keep it as a sort of severance package. He had fired her on the spot without reason. Therese shook her head. Somehow it didn't feel right to keep the car. Putting this particular decision off for another day, she grabbed her purse and duffel bag and headed inside. She'd called her mom from the road. At least that meant her reappearance wouldn't be a total surprise. Mom, I'm home. No reply. Therese walked through the empty house and into the bright kitchen with its linoleum floors and white formica countertops. Little had changed in this house since she'd been in high school aside from the fairly new fridge that held a magnetic message board. Gone to the store. Back in a few. Love, Mom. P.S. Welcome back. Tears sprang to Therese's eyes as she read the note. By the time she'd unpacked, she heard her mom pulling into the garage. Therese rushed out to help bring in the groceries. Hi honey, I'm glad you're back. I ran to the store to pick up a few things. Here take this. Her mom gave her a quick hug before handing her a large tote bag filled with canned goods. Whatcha making? Therese stacked the cans up on the counter. 
I thought I'd cook us up a batch of beef and vegetable soup. We can have it for lunch, with some grilled cheese. Pam smiled before pulling a large stock pot out of the cabinet and setting it on the stove. My favorite. Therese grinned, feeling better than she had all day. I thought you could use some comfort food. I'm glad it's finally cool enough to make a pot of soup. Would you hand me that pack of ground beef? Therese watched her mother bustle back and forth in the kitchen while she cooked a large pot of the soup. It would last them for days, not that Therese was complaining. Her father would be ecstatic. No one appreciated her mother's homemade soup more than Clive Bowman. I'm glad to have you home. I hope you'll stick around for a little while. Coffee? Pam made a fresh pot before Therese had a chance to respond. To be honest, I'm not sure what I'm going to do. I'm sorry to barge in on Dad and you like this. Honey, don't you dare worry about that. This is your home. You're welcome here any time for as long as you'd like. Take some time to think about what you want to do. There's no need to rush into anything. Your dad and I are here to support you. Therese swallowed hard. It meant the world to her to hear those words. Thanks, Mom. Anytime, honey. And if you want to talk about what happened with you and Rob, I'm here. He's such a nice young man. I don't know what could have gotten into him. I really thought the two of you had something special. Do you think it could be drugs? I don't think so. I'm still not sure what happened. I woke up this morning and found him out on the back deck working out. Against doctor's orders. When I called him out on it, he lost it. And then he'd fired her and told her to pack her things and get out. It wasn't like she could have stayed. And there was nothing leading up to this? There was. Therese filled her mother in on the kayaking incident, the cast, and Rob's behavior since then. Sounds to me like he's struggling and screaming for help. Maybe you're right, but he doesn't want mine. He's made that clear as day. Her mother nodded before getting up to stir the soup. Do you want to go stretch out on the bed until the soup is ready? I'll call you when I start making the grilled cheese. Therese took her mother up on the offer and retreated to her old bedroom to think. She didn't like this in limbo feeling. She needed a plan and something to do to keep her from thinking about Rob. She booted up her laptop to inventory her options and check on her bank account balance. Out of habit, the first thing she did was log into her email account. There was a new message from Reverend Shepard. She'd forgotten they'd exchanged email addresses over dinner. Curious about what her new friend had to say, she opened it up and started reading. Therese. It was nice meeting you a few days ago. I enjoyed our conversation. As I'm writing this, I'm sitting at the airport in Paris waiting for my connecting flight back to Gambia. I enjoyed hearing about your plans for the future and wish you the very best. If there is anything I can do to help you get started, don't hesitate to reach out to me. In the meantime, should you decide to put those plans on hold for a while, I would love to have you come work for my organization. We can always use an extra pair of hands and your expertise and compassion would be invaluable. Let's stay in touch. John Shepard An idea formed in Teresa's mind. There was a place where she was wanted and needed. She could go back to Gambia and work with the people she cared for, who needed her. It may not be a bad way to clear her head and figure out what she wanted to do next. And it would get her away from the beach where everything reminded her of Rob. Hitting reply, Therese composed a message of her own. Chapter 19 What's going on with you, man? Brad asked. He and his family had spent much of the afternoon unpacking before ordering dinner and spending the evening playing board games. Rob had done his best to stay out of the way, missing the feeling of having the place to himself and having Therese to talk to. Nothing's going on. Just hanging out, waiting for this bum leg to heal so I can get out of your hair. The two men sat out on the back deck while Kat put Hannah to bed. Brad had lit a small fire in the portable fireplace that sat in front of them. That's not what I'm talking about and you know it. 
What was that incident earlier about? With the soup? Cat had been kind enough to clean the mess the smashed jar of homemade soup had left behind. I lost my temper, that's all. You lost your temper because one of the kindest women I know brought you soup? What's wrong with that? Brad sounded agitated, and Rob couldn't blame him. He'd been a jerk to Miss Doris. Not because of the soup. I'm sure it's delicious. Everything else the woman made was. She was some sort of genius in the kitchen. I guarantee you it is. What set you off? Rob thought back on the past few days and how his life had fallen completely off the rails. I've been under a lot of stress. Between my leg and the trouble at Marshall Mutual. He shrugged. There was no good explanation why he'd driven people he'd cared for out of his life. It was what he did. Better you leave them than they leave you. Except that's not what happened. Therese had left because he'd been an unreasonable jerk. What happened with the company? Brad sat up and looked right at him. Our CFO disappeared with half our funds, and Kevington keeps doing everything he can to keep me out of the boardroom. You'd think something so serious would make him reconsider his position and tap into any available resource he had. Yet, he insists that bringing me on at this stage would send our customers into a panic. Like Steiner taking off to some Caribbean bolt hole, or wherever he vanished to, didn't already do that. He shook his head in disgust. That's tough man, but that's no excuse for the behavior I saw when we came in today. You have some apologizing to do. And not just to Miss Doris, though that would be a great start. Rob knocked on Miss Doris's door at noon the next day. It had taken longer than expected to get the flower delivery from the local shop on Main Street. They'd been busy, but the large bouquet of yellow roses had finally arrived. Getting next door on two crutches with the bouquet had been quite the task, but this was something he had to do, and he had to do it alone. Rob. How nice to see you. Would you like to come in? The kind older woman acted like nothing had happened the day before. Rob nodded and followed her into the kitchen, accepting the invitation for a cup of coffee. These are for you. He held the flowers out to her. It was a huge bouquet. Who knew that ordering two dozen of them would turn out quite so large? It was worth the trouble, though, when he saw the huge smile on Miss Doris's face. Thank you. It has been a long time since someone has given me flowers, and these are some of my favorites. My husband planted a bush of them right in front of the kitchen window. You really shouldn't have. Yes, I should. It's the least I could do to apologize for my behavior yesterday. I'm deeply sorry. I don't know what came over me. Or what's been causing my bad behavior the past few days. Miss Doris looked at him, then rose to pour them each a large cup of coffee. I'm sorry, I don't have anything freshly baked today, so this will have to do. She set the coffee in front of him and pushed the sugar and creamer his way before taking a sip of her own dark brew. I appreciate and accept the apology, but don't fool yourself. This has been going on for longer than a few days. Therese told me a little of what's been going on, and you have been in a foul mood for some time. He started to interrupt, to explain what had been going on with his company, but Miss Doris held up a hand to stop him. I'm sure you have your reasons. We all have times when our patience is tried. It's how we act during those times, particularly around the people we love and care for the most, that show our strength of character and our decency. And you, young man, have a lot to learn in that department. Rob swallowed hard as her words sank in. He had been a jerk to everyone around him. When he raised his cup to take a sip of coffee, his hand shook. You're right, he said. Of course I am. I've lived a long time, and trust me, I've messed things up a time or two. The important part is that we learn from our mistakes and we make things right. And that's one lesson you've already learned. She looked up and smiled at the ridiculously large bouquet of flowers that sat in a tin bucket on the kitchen table. It had been the largest vessel she could find, and it looked surprisingly good. More fitting than a crystal vase. I wish I knew how to stop it. And what to do about. 
He trailed off, unable to speak her name. At this table, across from the woman who had nursed them both through food poisoning and who knew them better than anyone else on the island, he realized how much he missed his pretty blonde companion. How much he cared for her and how much his words yesterday morning must have hurt her. Therese? Miss Doris asked in a gentle voice. He nodded. I think you start by asking yourself exactly what caused your behavior. Dig deep. I think you'll find that it's about more than just the worry about your company's finances. Because at the end of the day, no matter what happens, you will be okay. There may be a few less zeros, but I doubt you'll be going broke anytime soon. He let out a dry laugh. No, between the personal trust his grandfather had set aside for him, the real estate he'd inherited from his father, and the money he made from his own small ventures like the race team, he would be financially secure no matter what happened to Marshall Mutual. It could go under and he'd still be set to live comfortably for the rest of his life. Finish your coffee and go think about that. When you've figured out what's really been putting you in this bad of a mood lately and figure out a way to get past it, come back and we can talk about Therese. Until then, there's no point going after her. Going after her? The words echoed in his head as he walked back and went about the rest of his day. The idea of trying to reach her and beg her to come back hadn't occurred to Rob until now. The people in his life that he had loved always left sooner rather than later, and once they were gone, that was it. Rarely had he ever heard from one of his nannies or teachers. Brad had been one of the few exceptions, but then Rob had never done anything bad enough to cause his oldest friend to cut ties with him. The rest of the conversation with Miss Doris caused him to examine his life and his recent behavior. Dig deep, she'd suggested. After a few late-night talks with Brad, he'd begun to understand what the wise woman was talking about. It wasn't about the money, or even about keeping the family name and business alive. I think my anger and my depression stem from feeling helpless. From being shut out of what's always been the most important thing in my father's life. The business. As a boy, the only way to react, the only way to get any attention from him was to get angry and lash out. Brad sat across from him in the living room. It had gotten too cold to sit outside at night, even with a fire going. You may have a point there. I remember when you were in college, and you'd gotten it into your head that the two of us would go to see Hootie and the Blowfish when they came out. I couldn't get away, and you kind of lost it. I never got why it was such a big deal. Rob hadn't thought about that incident in a long time. In hindsight, it hadn't been a big deal. He'd gone with some college buddies instead, and he was pretty sure they had a good time. He did remember yelling at Brad and calling him names. He'd accused his friend of not caring about him, among other things. It hadn't been pretty. I'm surprised you even talked to me after that. It wasn't that big of a deal. I figured you needed a little time to cool off. The next time we met, everything seemed fine. And it didn't happen again. Not until Brad had walked into him in a rage a little over a week ago. Since then, Rob had learned a lot about himself and realized just how much he missed Therese. Miss Doris had been right. He needed to figure this out and more importantly, find a way to get a handle on his temper before he sought her out. She deserved better. It hadn't been an easy process, but talking helped. The one bright light in all, this had been his doctor visit. His leg had healed well enough that he was back in the boot that allowed him to get around a little easier. It had taken some convincing on Brad's part for Dr. Clark to remove the cast and change back to the boot, and Rob was grateful for his friend's support. There was no way he'd put his recovery in jeopardy again. Thanks for sticking with me and remaining my friend after that. He looked up at Brad. It's not going to happen again. I know I have some work to do, but I'm realizing that it's my default reaction when I think someone's going to leave. I have to trust that people like me for who I am and stick around. Through the good and the bad. And Therese had done that. She'd meet him when he was grumpy and in pain. She'd helped him recover and they'd grown closer until he'd gone on that stupid kayak ride. She'd stuck around when he was puking his guts out and when he turned into a blob that wouldn't leave the couch. She'd stayed until he'd forced her out. Thinking about Therese? 
Brad asked as Kat walked into the living room and took a seat next to her husband. He pulled her close, and she snuggled into his side. Yeah, I think I'm going to call it a night. Rob faked a yawn. He missed Therese and watching the deep love between Brad and Kat was more than he could take right now. He was happy for his friend, but couldn't help wishing for the same with Therese. There's a Prius out here for you, Brad called from down the hall, the next morning. Rob had spent his morning going over his personal finances and assets. After his conversation with Miss Doris, he wanted to know exactly what he had in his name, should Marshall Mutual fold. He turned out to be worth even more than he'd realized. While he would no longer be a billionaire without the company, he wasn't that far off from it either, and with a few wise investments, he'd be back on top in no time. Not mine, he called back. Paperwork says otherwise. Brad pushed the door open, waving some papers in his direction. You should come talk to this guy. Rob recognized the car the moment he stepped on the front porch. It was the brand new light blue Prius he'd bought for Therese. Mr. Marshall, the young man standing next to the car asked. Yes, but this is a mistake. The car belongs to Miss Therese Bowman. I bought it for her. She signed the title over to you and insisted I return it to you personally. She left specific instructions with my boss not to take no for an answer. The man looked embarrassed and Rob almost felt sorry for him. All right. If she insists. What do you need me to sign? All Rob wanted to do was send this guy on his way so he could go back inside and wallow in sorrow. She rejected his gift. The message was loud and clear, she didn't want something around that reminded her of him. Maybe he'd been wrong to hang on to the hope that they would work this out. She hadn't called, hadn't texted, and now this. It took every ounce of his strength, and the support from Brad, Kat, and even little Hannah, to keep him from slipping back into depression. Instead, he focused on the things he could control. He stuck to a healthy diet. Kat made it easy by stocking the fridge with fresh, whole foods and cooking dinner for everyone each night. Hannah made him laugh with her antics and wasn't shy about calling him out when he retreated into himself. Rob, don't look sad. Let's play tea party and you can hold my dolphin. The stuffed toy was her most prized possession and Brad had filled him in on what a high honor it was to hold on to it while he sat in a tiny chair, at a tiny table, in a bright pink room complete with princess bed, sipping water from a cup so small you just about needed tweezers to pick it up. The interesting part was that it worked. The more time he spent with Brad's family, the happier he felt. And his leg was healing right on schedule. Ready to go? Brad asked a week later. Rob stepped out of his room, freshly showered and dressed in a pair of loose jogging pants that stretched over his boot and a hoodie. The temperature had continued to drop over the past few weeks, and it definitely felt like fall. He was looking forward to wearing regular pants and warm socks once this boot came off. Dr. Clark took a final set of x-rays and proclaimed him healed. Rob was relieved, but not as happy as he thought he'd be. Brad picked up on his mood in the car on the drive back to Palmer Island. We should celebrate. Wanna pick up a cake and ice cream? We can have a recovery party at the house. Brad glanced at him before looking back at the highway. I don't really feel like it. Let's skip the party. Rob wasn't in the mood to celebrate. I figured you'd be more excited. Your leg is healed and the doc cleared you for light exercise. Brad sounded concerned. I still miss her. No need to mention who she was. Then go after her. Chapter 20 I need your help, Rob held out another large bouquet of yellow roses out to Miss Doris. Let me guess. You want me to help you find Therese. She took the flowers and motioned for him to take a seat in one of the rocking chairs. Yes. I've tried calling and emailing with no response. I got a hold of her mother, but she refused to tell me anything. I don't know where to turn. I thought about hiring a private investigator. This had been Brad's suggestion and he'd recommended someone he'd used in the past, but somehow it felt wrong to pay someone to snoop around in Teresa's life. 
if she truly didn't want to be found, he'd find a way to live with that decision. But not until he'd exhausted all other resources. Why come to me now? She's been gone for weeks, Miss Doris asked, putting the flowers in her lap. Because of what you said before. That I shouldn't go after her until I was in a better frame of mind. You were right. She deserved better than how I acted those last few weeks we were together. It took me a while to dig deep, but I think I figured it out. I can't promise I won't mess up again, but I'm working on being patient and keeping my temper in check. Good. And your leg is healed too. She pointed at his denim-covered leg. It felt good to be back in his favorite pair of jeans. Good as new, he said and wiggled his foot back and forth. There was no more pain and while it would take a while to get his full strength back, he was able to walk without the help of a cane or crutch. I'm happy for you. I'm afraid I won't be much help when it comes to Therese. We haven't been in touch since she left that day. Rob's face fell. He'd been sure Miss Doris was still in contact with Therese and that he'd be able to get a message through to her. Maybe even find out where she was. Her mother had made it clear during their phone conversations that Therese no longer lived at home. Without anything more to go on, he wasn't sure where else to turn. Oh, don't look so distraught. If the two of you are meant to be together, you'll find her. Miss Doris put a finger to her lips, thinking for a moment. I think you should go see Reverend Peters. I'd better get these flowers in some water. They are lovely. She rose and walked into the house without another glance at Rob. He sat in the rocking chair for a while, trying hard to fight off the wave of disappointment that washed over him. Finally, he rose to go grab the keys to the Prius that wasn't his. It was time to go see a preacher about a girl. Still nothing? Therese tried to not let her disappointment show when the civil engineer stopped into the little makeshift office with the bad news. We have one more site we can try, but it will take a day to shift the equipment over there. That's our last shot though. If we don't reach groundwater there. He trailed off, looking just as disappointed as she felt. It's going to work. I have faith. Reverend Shepherd rose and walked out with the engineer. Hey, Therese. You may want to come out here, he called a moment later. Therese wondered what else could go wrong today as she stepped out of the small cinder block building that served as the local headquarters and stopped in her tracks when she spotted Rob leaning up against the hood of a jeep. He was wearing a wide-brimmed canvas hat, long sleeve shirt, and cargo shorts. His leg was no longer in a cast, but significantly paler than its counterpart. The cast couldn't have been off for more than a week. Hi, Rob strode over, and she noticed how tired he looked and he was in serious need of a shower. What are you doing here? How did you find me, she asked, taking a step back. Rob stopped and the hand that had been reaching for her hung awkwardly in midair. He let it drop to his side and shrugged. I wanted to see you. Explain myself. When I went looking for you, I found out you were here. How? Mostly British Airways. I flew from Myrtle Beach to New York, then London. That's not what I'm asking. She was impatient, still trying to get over the shock of his sudden appearance. She'd spent the past three weeks working day and night in hopes of forgetting him, but there he was. Standing in front of her, making all her feelings for him return with a vengeance. What exactly are you asking? He cocked an eyebrow and dropped his backpack on the ground. How did you figure out where I was? My mom? Therese didn't want to believe her mother would betray her trust, but the woman was a hopeless romantic and wanted nothing more than grandchildren. No, Pam wouldn't even drop a hint. I talked to Miss Doris. She suggested I have a chat with Reverend Peters. He mentioned you'd been in touch with Reverend Shepard and last he'd heard, you were on your way down here. So I booked the next flight to come see for myself. Why? Because I miss you. Because I wanted to apologize for my behavior in person. Because I'm not ready to let you go. He looked sincere and part of Therese wanted to believe him. It's not that easy. 
If there's anything I've learned these past few months, it's that it usually isn't. I'm not expecting you to jump back into my arms. Not that I'd mind. After I've had a shower. He grinned at her before turning more serious again. I know better than to think that's possible. All I'm asking is that you let me stay. Let me prove to you that I'm in this for the long haul. I've been doing a lot of thinking. Soul searching really. I've learned a lot about myself and what's caused my rash behavior. Therese snorted. Okay. More than a little rash. I was an idiot and a jerk. All I'm asking for is a chance to show you, to prove to you that I've changed. And to earn your forgiveness. Can you do that? Therese turned around to escape the pleading look on his face. If she wasn't careful, she'd let those beautiful brown eyes that shone with warmth and sincerity overwhelm her. And what would that get her? More heartbreak. And that was one thing she wasn't willing to risk. She should send him away. Tell him to go back home. Sending the Prius back obviously hadn't been a strong enough message. Taking a deep breath, she turned back around. And found she couldn't do it. What do you plan on doing here, she heard herself ask instead. Dig a well. Help out. Whatever you guys need. Who do I report to? Reverend Shepherd? Rob looked around and eyed the people gathered around. Reverend Shepherd walked up to him and introduced himself. We'd love to have you join us. We can always use an extra pair of strong hands. Isn't that right, Therese? All she could do was nod before watching the preacher escort Rob to the men's dormitory so he could clean up and rest before their afternoon meeting. Therese was early to the meeting and surprised to find she wasn't the only one in the small church that served as the foundation's gathering place. Rob sat on one of the rough-hewn benches and motioned for her to sit down. I would like a chance to stick around and help, but if this is a problem for you, I can leave. He looked better after his shower. She hoped someone had gotten him food as well. It wouldn't be fair for me to turn away help. These people need the well, and so far it isn't looking good. We haven't been able to find groundwater. What can I do? Hang around. We'll get an update from one of the engineers and come up with a plan for another dig. More people trickled into the small church, and it wasn't long before Reverend Shepherd called everyone to order. Looks like we have one more shot at this. Before we go into details, I would like to take a moment to pray that we hit groundwater and can finally establish a well. Rob had no idea digging a well was such backbreaking labor. The equipment people worked with here rarely went beyond pickaxes, shovels, and the like. When he questioned why the team didn't use more powerful equipment like an excavator and mechanical drill, he learned that the problem was twofold. There was no money to buy, maintain, and transport the equipment, and there wasn't an easy way to get the gas these machines required. The first problem he could fix easily enough, the second was a bit trickier. Do you have a minute, he asked before stepping into the small office that Therese and Reverend Shepherd shared. What's on your mind, the preacher asked. Rob had come to admire the older man of the cloth over the past few weeks. He worked as hard as anyone else around here and when the rest of the crew was resting, he was out there holding service, praying with people, and checking on the weakest and sickest members of the village. On Sundays, the Reverend traveled ten miles on foot to the church in one of the larger communities that served as headquarters for his mission. I've been putting out some feelers about a couple of pieces of equipment that may make your job here a little easier. There's a new electric excavator that could replace at least ten of your guys digging with shovels. If I got one down here, could you train someone and do you think the local power grid could handle charging it? Reverend Shepherd rubbed his chin. I've thought about that. Well, it's been more of a pipe dream until now. I'd have to look at the numbers, but the power grid could be an issue, even if we only tapped it during off-peak hours. He rose to grab a folder from the simple bookshelf across the room. There's something else we could do though. Here. Come look at this, and let me know what you think. Rob joined the preacher at his desk, and together they looked through the blueprints for a rudimentary solar farm to supplement the village's power grid. This could work. 
How much would you need to get it set up? I think we could get it done for as little as $5,000. But there's a problem. Rob saw Therese raise her head, looking interested in their conversation. What's that? he asked. The solar farm wouldn't be mobile. I'm sure we could find some central locations, but in the long run, we'd have to build a new farm every few months. I'm not sure our budget could handle that, even if we were able to step up contributions from churches in the U.S. Actually, there may be another solution. Therese rose and joined them. There are plenty of rivers and streams. We could tap into hydropower to charge them. With a small enough setup, it could travel around from project to project. And depending on funds, we could leave them along the way whenever possible. Maybe even coordinate efforts with a charity that's distributing them. Is there anything out there that can generate that kind of power? Reverend Shepard looked intrigued, and Rob couldn't help but feel curious as well. And surprised that this was something Therese had looked into. Let me reach out to my friend Sam. She's the one who told me about this option. I'll see if I can get some more information to figure out if that's a viable option. I didn't realize you were in touch with Sam. Rob was surprised. The two women had gotten along the few times they'd met, but he had no idea they'd spoken since. We exchanged emails after you hired me. She asked about the work I did down here and mentioned these two guys she knew who were into using water to generate clean energy. They started out harnessing ocean waves, but are testing something that could tap into small rivers and streams. He had changed. Rob was more mature and a lot more patient and content these days. Therese wasn't sure if it was because he was no longer in pain or if he was improving on a deeper level, dealing with past experiences that had shaded how he interacted with people. In either case, he was a lot of fun to be around and made huge daily contributions to the Well Project. He was often one of the first out there digging, and the last to leave when it was time to break for dinner. After the first few days, she'd gotten into the habit of sitting and chatting with him over their evening meal. It hadn't taken long before they'd returned to the easy, comfortable way their relationship had been in the beginning. Today's the day. Rob grinned at her as they left for the dig shortly after sunrise. His three-day beard gave him a rougher appearance that somehow suited him. His skin had darkened from being out in the sun all day every day. Even his face, that was usually shaded by the hat he continued to wear most of the day, had started to tan. Is that so, she teased, part of her hope he would hurry up and kiss her. So far, though, Rob had stayed strictly in the friend zone when it came to physical affection. If he insisted on keeping it that way, she'd be making the first move soon. Before one of the other female volunteers did. It hadn't escaped Therese that a few of them had developed serious crushes on her handsome billionaire. Yep. I can feel it. We'll hit water today and have that well up and running by tomorrow. She hoped he was right. It took nearly all day, but Rob was right. Later afternoon, they were finally able to tap into a steady source of groundwater. When the first few dark brown spurts came up through the temporary pipe, everyone held their breath. When the water turned clear and continued to flow freely, the whole crew cheered. The noise attracted some of the nearby villagers, and before long, everyone was singing, dancing, and splashing in the water and mud that was created as it mixed with the hard clay dirt. Therese watched as Rob stepped up to the pipe, using his hands to scoop big handfuls of water, which he let run over his head and face. His hair looked even darker, and small drops of water ran off his hair and onto the thin blue shirt he wore. Therese bit her lip at the sight of him as he stalked toward her. Yikes, she screamed when the cool water hit her. She'd been so focused on his face and hair, she hadn't noticed that he'd filled his hat with water until he threw it at her. The water, not the hat. His carefree attitude changed and his eyes went remorseful in an instant. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. He pulled his shirt off and used it to wipe the water off her face and neck. Don't worry about it. You surprised me, that's all. It took every ounce of Teresa's strength not to gawk at him standing bare-chested in front of her. Her mouth went dry from the quick glance she'd sneaked before turning and walking back toward the main part of the village and their accommodations. 
Mind if I walk with you? Rob asked, a cautious note in his voice. I'd like that, she said. You might want to put your shirt back on, though, unless you want to get burnt. Yep, that was the reason she suggested it. Wouldn't want him to risk skin cancer. Any word on the hydro generators? Rob asked as he shrugged back into his shirt. It was wet from a mixture of sweat and water, making it cling to his well-defined arms and shoulders. Therese groaned inwardly. It was worse than his bare upper body. Swallowing hard, she made herself focus on his question. Nothing yet. I'm sure it's not going to be cheap. Do you think we can find a way to raise the funds? A billionaire like you must know all sorts of people who are into giving for a good cause. About that. She glanced up. Rob rubbed his stubbly chin, looking uncomfortable. I've been meaning to talk to you about that. I kinda lost my billionaire status in the whole CFO debacle. And if Marshall Mutual goes down, my net worth drops even further. He sped up, making her almost run to catch up with him. Don't get me wrong, I'm not destitute or anything. But if you had your heart set on dating a billionaire, you might have to look elsewhere. Therese grabbed his arm and pulled him to a stop. You don't really think I care about that, do you? He turned and looked at her, his eyes open and vulnerable. When it comes to you, I'm not sure about anything anymore. Aside from what I feel for you. They were not far from the village now, and the rest of the group was coming up behind them. Therese took his hand and pulled him into the shade of a large baobab tree. What do you feel for me, she asked, her voice going husky. I miss you. I miss what we had before I went out with the kayak. I miss watching movies with you. I miss having you snuggled up against me on the couch. And most of all, I miss this. Rob slowly lowered his head, stopping just before his lips brushed hers. His hand went up to caress her damp hair. His warm breath washed over her face. He looked at her, giving her every chance to pull back and stop this kiss before it started. Therese had no intention of doing that. She'd been waiting for this. Dreaming about it. She let her eyes drift close and rose just enough to close the tiny bit of distance between them. It was all the encouragement Rob needed. His lips pressed against hers. His kiss was firm and demanding, his lips strong and no match for her own. She melted in his arms, reveling in the feel of his strong arms around her. They kept her up as her knees went weak from the intensity of the sensations and feelings that flowed through her. It was like a dam broke loose and every longing, every bit of hope, and every dream she'd had about him coming after her, begging her forgiveness, and vowing to do better, washed over her. It was almost too much. Except the kiss was amazing. Better than what she remembered. Better than anything else she'd experienced. Because this kiss meant something. I love you, Therese, Rob said a little breathless himself when they finally broke apart. I love you too. Epilogue New York City, three months later. Look at this. Therese barged into his office, pushing her phone into his face, a huge grin lighting up hers. What's this, he asked, looking up from the file of potential investment opportunities for what he liked to call Marshall Mutual 2.0. After much back and forth with the board and the involvement of a good legal team, Rob had finally taken control of his company and things were starting to look up. An email from Sam. She's arranged for a meeting with Rick and Tom. They offered to demonstrate their small water turbine. Do you think you could get away from this for a few days? Take a trip down to Palmer Island? She perched on the corner of her desk, looking adorable in her sweater dress and leggings. Winter in New York City had been a bit of a challenge for his girl. Therese wasn't used to the biting wind and piles of dark gray snow everywhere. Her excitement during their first real snowstorm since their arrival in the Big Apple had been adorable though. She'd spent hours watching the big flakes come down from the comfort of his penthouse apartment, right in the middle of Manhattan. It was prime real estate, and he'd toyed with the idea of liquidating it to use the money to help Marshall Mutual. In the end, that hadn't been necessary. 
Instead, he used it as the base of operations for reinventing the family finance empire, while working with Therese to establish a non-profit that would bring green energy to impoverished communities. Their initial plan was to work closely with Reverend Shepard, ensuring he had the power he needed to build wells faster and more efficiently, while establishing a local power network that would serve the residents for decades to come. I think I can get away for a bit. How about you? Can you take a few days off from the hospital? Therese had quickly found work at one of the biggest hospitals in the city and had rented a tiny studio apartment close to work. Thankfully, she'd agreed to spend her days off at his place where they had space to spread out and work on their projects. He'd converted one of the bedrooms into an office for her, and on nights when they worked too late or Therese was too exhausted from a long shift before meeting him here for dinner, he'd been able to talk her into sleeping over in the remaining guest room. His eye went to the third desk drawer and the small box it held. A plan formed in his mind, and he knew just the person to ask for help. Therese hadn't realized how much she'd missed this place until they pulled up in the Prius Rob had insisted she keep. It had been parked at her parents' house since their move to New York. She sighed. Did you say something? Rob put the car into park and looked over at her. It was nice of Brad to let us stay here, she said in an effort to keep him from realizing how much she'd missed South Carolina and the beach. His life was in New York, and his business needed his leadership if he had any hopes of rebuilding. They weren't using it, and he appreciated having someone look in on the place. Therese was sure that wasn't the full story. She'd heard snippets of phone conversations that made her suspect Rob had traded a small fortune in baseball cards and the promise to introduce Brad and his family to a friend of his who was one of the leading marine biologists on the East Coast. But if he wanted to pretend Brad had offered them the house out of the goodness of his heart, who was she to judge? I'll go get the key from Miss Doris. Why don't you stretch your legs and go look at the ocean? I know you've been itching to get your toes in the sand. Rob was out of the car and halfway to the neighbor's house before she could protest. Shaking her head at his odd behavior, she pulled on her windbreaker and walked between the two houses to get a good look at the Atlantic Ocean. She'd missed the sound of the rolling waves, the fresh, slightly salty air. Even the sound of screeching seagulls brought back fond memories. Too bad it was too cold to kick off her shoes and dip her toes in the water. By the time she walked back to the house, Rob had already carried their luggage in, turned on the heat, and was in the process of laying a fire in the living room fireplace. You realize that we're meeting Sam and Jason down at the park by the causeway in a little over an hour, Therese said. It's the quickest way to heat up the place. Miss Doris offered to come over and watch the fire. Rob's eyes didn't meet hers. He pretended to poke the fire. Something was definitely off. A look at her bags convinced her to drop the topic for now and spend the little time left unpacking instead. She made a mental note to stop by the grocery store on the way back from their meeting, to stock up on the basics to get them through the next few days. They were having dinner with their friends and the inventors of the hydro turbine tonight, but it would be nice to have a few things for the morning. This is exactly what we are looking for. Therese couldn't keep the excitement out of her voice when Rick and Tom demonstrated the surprisingly small turbine in the swift waters of a creek running into the intercoastal waterway. She listened intently as Tom answered Rob's question about power output and the ability to deploy several turbines in sequence to generate the power necessary to charge the huge batteries for the electric excavator he planned on purchasing as soon as possible. How are things with you and Rob? Sam strode next to Therese and linking arms with her, pulling her just out of earshot of the guys and their tech talk. It's going great. We're making a lot of progress on the foundation. That's not what I'm asking about and you know it. Stop stalling, Therese. When are the two of you getting serious about each other? Has he popped the question yet? Sam was a hopeless romantic, despite the fact that she'd married her husband to gain access to her trust fund. They'd barely known each other when they'd tied the knot right here on the island. It had all worked out in the end, and now Sam was eager for her to experience wedded bliss as well. Hold your horses. We've only known each other for a few months. We're dating. Therese felt the heat creeping into her cheeks at the thought of Rob's kisses and the fact that she'd stayed over at his place more often than she could count. In her own bedroom, but still. 
she'd started to pull Sam back towards the guys and their negotiations in an effort to keep her from probing any further. How fast could we get a set of these? And what's your production schedule going forward? Rob was all business, and Therese kind of liked this side of him. Very different from the daredevil on crutches she'd first fallen in love with. But her Rob, all the same. So far, it's only a prototype, but with a $100,000 investment up front and a guaranteed order of at least six turbines per year, we can go to production next week. We'd have the first set ready for you in about a month, provided there are no issues or bottlenecks. Tom was just as serious as Rob. Done. Rob wrote the check on the spot and handed it to Rick. How about we celebrate over dinner? Anyone in the mood for burgers? Jason looked as cold as Therese felt. Good idea. Sam's smile was huge. I love their Carolina burger. She turned to Tom and Rick. It's covered in chili and coleslaw. You have got to try it. Mary's are the best, and I've tried them all over the place. Mary's burgers held up to Sam's high praise, as did the sweet potato fries. It was a huge plate of food, and even after taking a good portion home, she'd eaten enough to feel sleepy by the time everybody went on their way. It was all she could do to keep her eyes open during the short drive back to the beach house. When they pulled into the drive, she thought she glimpsed Sam's car parked a block away. That couldn't be right though. She and Jason were heading back to their Myrtle Beach apartment. The house lit up and after the brief walk through the cold night air, Therese was thankful for Rob's foresight in getting the fire going and having Miss Doris watch it. She couldn't wait to curl up on the couch to warm up. Surprise! Therese's heart stopped at the small crowd in the living room. In addition to Miss Doris, her parents were there, as were her sister and brother-in-law. Paul and Corinne ran up to hug Rob. Miriam sat in the living room along with Reverend Peters and a few of the ladies from church she'd gotten to know during her stay here. Behind them, Sam and Jason walked in. Brad and Kat stepped out of the kitchen into the living room and Hannah came running out from the direction of the bedrooms. Confused, Therese turned to look at Rob. What's going on? He pulled her into the middle of the living room and went down on one knee. That's when Therese stopped breathing. This couldn't be real, could it? They'd talked about marriage, but always in general, futuristic terms. One of these days, they'd get hitched and have a couple of kids. But there had been nothing that had given her any indication that Rob was ready to propose. She looked down at the man she loved with all her heart and watched him open a small dark velvet box. Inside was the most stunning diamond ring. It was large and looked a bit old-fashioned. Therese loved it from the moment she laid eyes on it. Therese, you are the best part of my life. The most important part. You helped me heal in more ways than one, and you make me strive to be a better person on a daily basis. I can't imagine a life that doesn't have you in it. Would you do me the great honor of agreeing to become my wife? He held the box with the ring out to her and waited. Therese had to stop for a moment and remind herself to breathe. Once the room stopped spinning, she put her hand on his handsome face. Yes. I'll marry you. She lowered her hand and held it out for him to slip the ring on. It was a little loose, but that didn't matter. Rob kissed the hand that now held his ring and rose, pulling her into a tight hug. It's my mother's ring. I thought you might like it. If not, we can go get you something else. Therese took a step back so she could see his face. I love it. It's perfect, she said before putting both hands on his face and pulling him in for a kiss. The End This has been Billionaire on Crutches. Written by Suzanne Ash. Copyright 2020 by Suzanne Ash. Production Copyright 2022 by Suzanne Ash. Thanks for listening. Please like and subscribe if you want me to put more of my books on YouTube. Visit my website at www.suzanneash.com for more of my books or find me on Amazon.